responsible little lad and only drink soda today, but I'm going to be spiking it with rum. Well, as I said before, I am both uh, British in, on a technicality and French in actuality. Also, it is five o'clock in the afternoon after a long, long week of bullshit, and I don't have to work tomorrow. So I'm just going to get wasted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's I don't even. I don't even know why I'm making excuses. I don't need excuses. I'm just gonna get wasted. Fuck it. Yeah, hey, you just. You told me earlier you're French. You don't need an excuse to drink. <laughs> yeah, it's like, are you drinking at work? It's like, well, this is what I do. Fuck you. <laughs> <coughs> oh also, my goodness. Crosshair has commented, "Rest in peace to these episodes." Once this slaughter of a live stream is over, I've been hyping it up on Twitter. I don't know how much of that you've seen. I have been like, listen, guys, tomorrow. Be there, be square. We're gonna, we're gonna fucking destroy these episodes. They're awful. Uh, I did see. Did you see? Um, when you were commenting with um, Joker last night, I put uh, an under Twitter where he's like, "Oh, I really like this thing," and uh, you're like, "I'm gonna make a video," and he's like, "Oh no!" And I put that meme of like Gus Fring being like, "I will slaughter <laughs> your sacred cow. I will yeah, slaughter its reputation. <laughs> I will kill your infantile investment in this thing." Oh, speaking uh, of the devil, it's here in chat. Oh. Hello. Hi, princess. Hey. Feel feel bad being wrong, but that's okay. Stan R5 and Stan X Wolves. Oh, so, Joe, wow. about, about, about R5, um, so other than Grogu, about R5. <laughs> yeah, other than Grogu, I don't think I've ever wanted a character dead as much as I want R5 dead now, now that I've Fuck seen the R5. series. All my homies <laughs> R5 hate is... R5. R5 needs to be destroyed. It's not, it's not my opinion. It's not my personal feeling. Sometimes... It's just, it's, it's just... what's needed. Just for therapeutic purposes, sometimes I, I I play the scene in A New Hope where he explodes on loop just to <laughs> feel anything. Look, all I'm saying is it was clearly the will of the Force that R5 died, and his resurrection is an abomination that the Force will not brook, and so to restore balance to the universe, we, we are going to pray for his untimely death. We're going to send in the two worms to sabotage his circuits. Well, they can use some of that wonderful nano gel from episode six. <laughs> oh no! Please, no! <laughs> <laughs> I hate that episode so much, dude. I can't even tell you. <laughs> episode six, I think. Like episode six is the worst episode. I think I'm comfortable calling it. Episode six is the worst episode, and not okay, just this I'm... series, but maybe the whole season. Not sorry, not just the season, but maybe the whole series. I think it's yeah, in the whole series, it's the worst. I'm glad you and I agree on that because I. I thought we were going to have to have a very awkward conversation where I explained to you exactly what, because I, because here's the thing, I was expecting you to take a hard stance that episode five of this season was the worst, simply because oh, no. of how it squandered the Pirate Republic uh, in terms of just concept. Oh, I'm saving that for the end, right? I have a whole, once we got, I got all my episode notes, and then I have my like overarching series notes where I'm going to talk about everything they wasted. Like, Beskar has its own section. Mandalorian culture has its own section. The Purge has its own section. I am going to go to fucking town on this travesty, this, this nightmare, this aborted fetus of a fucking series that I have grown to hate at levels that scare me. <laughs> uh, hey, Southpaw has asked if he can join. Would you like him to join? Yeah, fuck it, Southpaw, if you've seen, if you've seen the show, come on in. Uh, I will send him a link, and I'll let him jump right in, if he should so desire. Um, but yeah, and I, I don't know. I hadn't even thought about putting it in sections like that, which I might do for my actual video. But like, there is so much to say about Bo-Katan as a character and about uh, Mandalore as a culture and like, and, and like what they were trying to do versus what they actually accomplished and, you know, versus what they actually fucking should have done, given like where things were set up to go and like just what well, it's, made it's, them it's also, possible. um, the unanticipated world building consequences of their decisions that they just apparently haven't even thought of. Like when you get around to making your video, I genuinely, you know, the, the, the Darth Vader, where is so-and-so are they okay? Are they safe meme? <laughs> like, probably you, just, that to death. Yeah. Like reuse that every five minutes. We are like, Oh, so this thing happened and hang on, what happened to Corky Kreese? Where's Corky? Is he safe? <laughs> is he all right? I was unironically asking that about Rada back in the book of Boba Fett times. Yeah. Like, where the fuck is he? What's he doing? <laughs> what? Where, where is, where is Ursa and Ren? Is she safe? Is she all right? It's, so uh, the thing I was thinking about, because and we're going to talk more about this when we actually get into it, but like, but like, so many characters that are significant to Bo-Katan's story are just not mentioned in this episode or in these episodes. Like, you know, even Satine doesn't even get a name oh, yes. drop. Satine's um, absence is fucking glaring. 
But it's weird because you know how Disney Star Wars is with member berries, right? Like you would think, oh, we have popular characters that we can reference and uh, milk to death. Like, why wouldn't you? Obi-Wan and Darth Maul are like significant characters uh, in this person's story. Why would you like pass up the opportunity to even mention them? You'd have to know. See, the thing with Satine is I know why they left out Satine, and that's because they wanted to reset Bo's story, uh, basically ignore everything that happened in Rebels. Because obviously, we'll talk about this when we get to it, right? But like Rebels, the way it concluded Bo, well, not concluded, but the way it carried on Bo's story, she signs off in that show with the kind of like, oh, you know, maybe Satine was right about some things and maybe Mandalore needs to move to a kind of a new way that's between what I, th- you know, between the warrior way and her way, if we're going to make it through all this. And there was like a, you know, the scene where she's holding the Darksaber and all the clans are bowing and like she's won back the the pride of Mandalore and the allegiance of all this. Like, basically what the show wanted to redo. And so like mm. the only way to redo it was just completely ignore everything that was mentioned about Satine. Also, the, the world building for like Sabine Wren's armor melting weapon given what the show has done with Beskar. Because, <sighs> holy shit. <laughs> um, right, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to that when we get to it. You know that we'll feeling get there when people, we get there. That, that feeling people often uh, describe when they're talking about like the watching the sequels and like what that's done to their investment in the OT. Like, I can't watch the OT now without thinking Luke, you know, fucks off and dies, this, this, and this. Uh, the Jedi Order is never properly re- rebuilt. You know, shit like that. Um... I unironically felt that while wa- like rewatching the Mandalorian episodes in Rebels um, the other day, just seeing like uh, Bo Katan get, get, get given the dark saber and finally start like trying to lead and, and reunite her people and fight against the Empire. All of that, she, just for just for what happens in this show to to just completely fuck all like all that over, and it's like really annoying. Also, hi South. Oh, hi South. Hi South Paul. Right. South Pole, <laughs> do, do you live? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. hi, yeah, okay. There yeah. we go. I, I didn't have hi. my, uh, <laughs> I didn't have the mic selected. Whoops. Uh, for, for, a, thought... for a second, for a second, I thought you banged your head on a door in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. South it, it, allowed to be goofy. It, it, <laughs> I got I got here a lot sooner than I expected. You see, uh, I was I was making my way through the border, and uh, thank God nobody checked the car. <laughs> you were making mm. your way downtown, walking fast. Well, Absolutely. actually, they were going to check the car because, as we all know, it is uh, customary to check every car at the border. Every but single the two car cars came in clutch, and they actually they distracted the security guards while you got through. Yep, I gave them one of those uh, those those um, continental coins from the John Wick series. <laughs> we're, 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 a, we're a part of that that secret uh, assassin world basically nice I'd actually love to see the, the, the two worms in the John Wick <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, he, he goes John goes into the restaurant to the Continental and like looks around the bar and like at a table are just the two worms and they just like nod to him briefly and then go back to their drinks no he, he, <laughs> he, he goes uh, he goes to look for the uh, for the new high elder right and it's it's actually the two worms there's now two high elders and both of them are the two worms. <laughs> <laughs> well they share also, one brain of course so before we uh, before we start there's a there's a message I sent to Yushi which I want to read out because it, it summarizes how I feel about this 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 series yeah, please do uh, Mando Season 3 locked me in a small windowless room and played the Barney theme song on a loop until I drowned myself in my own vomit to escape the agony. <laughs> that, is, that is how I feel. This, this I think, is the closest equivalent a, a television series has ever come to being a war crime. Yeah. Um, dude, I sent you that, a screenshot of that tweet, right? The one that was like... Um, that was like... I'm of the opinion that Book of Boba Fett is like really good, like peak Star Wars, and even I recognize that this this season was bad. And I'm like, I mean, good, but like, they're so similar in terms of just everything. Like, I don't know how you consider one peak and the other bad. So yeah, how did you conclude? Dust are gone, South Pole. Oh well, I just wanted to admit. So uh, my my perspective here, I'm I'm coming in with a slightly different perspective from you two. Now, don't panic. I'm not saying that this show is good. Um, I. I, I watched this kind of like in the background as I was working on something else um, because uh, fuck paying attention to this show. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not worth my my attention, right? Um, so I'm not going to have grasped onto like nearly as many issues as you guys have. Um, 
I'm kind of going to be coming in, uh, approaching this from the perspective of someone who watched it very, very casually. Um, uh, I, I definitely don't think it's good. Um, and I've seen, like, there's definitely issues that I spotted while watching it, but I might need you two to jog my memory, and then that's probably oh, where I'll, I'll, I'll come oh. in. But, Oh, don't, don't worry, you worry so we'll, we'll we'll your memory. <laughs> yeah, you, you will. You will absolutely like just just take the lead, um, and I'll I'll try to. Um, I, I'm not playing devil's advocate here because uh, I am not qualified for that, <laughs> and I <laughs> I really don't think that this show deserves one. <laughs> well, by, by the end, you'll be begging bad. for the neuralizer. Oh God! With all that being said, I suppose we should jump right in because we only have what five. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, by the Whoa. way, I um. <laughs> I actually, I, I watched all four of the, the, well, I watched the entire latter half of the season uh, for the first time Sorry. last night. I, I, I stopped, um, I stopped watching it after the foundling. I took a, like just a four week break. It was just so bad. Dude, that was, that one's <laughs> when, really bad. Yeah. When, I, uh... when the pterodactyl just spits out the kid whole, just like hasn't, <laughs> hasn't even started digesting him. I just about lost my mind. I'm like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, Joe, uh, jo can Joe join, or do we want to wait for? Mm, here's the thing: I I'd like to talk to Joe. I think Joe would be really interesting to get his perspective on this. However, I don't want to turn this into a debate. Yeah, I, I we're want kind to... of pressed for time. Uh, Joe, uh, maybe, maybe we can do another stream at some point, which is just us talking to Joe, because totally I think that might be interesting. That, yeah, because we, we, I mean, different perspectives and everything. It's just we we already have a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of time to do it. So. Well, also, uh, this is the thing that I, I just want to point out, like debates, uh, like, I, I don't have a problem with debates in general, but like in terms of maybe trying to mount a defense, like uh, Joe might be better off if he has a chance to listen to what you guys have to say and prepare a defense. Yeah, yep, that's also a good point. Absolutely. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing that actually I'm going over my script of just like this issue of people seem to think that if someone loses a debate, that that therefore means that their position is wrong completely. It's like, no, it proves that they weren't good at defending their position. Uh, they, mm -hmm. they might still have the correct uh, position. So, yeah. Unless you're defending Terry, in which case you are just objectively wrong. Wait, yeah, yeah, match. yeah, you know, <laughs> they, 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 well, that's another thing is like pointing out like if this is criticism, if these arguments are just representative of how they normally criticize things, then they aren't critics, they're hecklers. Um, mm -hmm. Because these are some genuinely, again, Got into this whole thing because I really wanted to rip into Ren's reviews for a bad uh, Mission Impossible review, and then I tripped into the mother load of just bad faith, disingenuous arguments. Fuck me. Speaking <laughs> of uh, speaking of bad faith and disingenuous, let's start on Mando episode six. <laughs> uh, episode five, rather. Episode five. Yeah, we gotta. We yeah, gotta, episode gotta five. Back. This is the pirate. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no. Pizza the Hut. Do, do do Jolly? Do you want you're you're very good at recapping, or do you want me to? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll I'll do the recap of this one, and then you you do the next one, and we we'll just stop it at various points, right? So, um, I'll stop you the second that I have a problem with what you say. So in the first millisecond. Yeah. <laughs> so we open up with a shot of Grief Karga, uh in his little office on Navarro, and he's talking to some some advisors about town planning issues um you know he's like oh we need to maybe move this district move the, the trade district, district closer to the trade center yeah yeah close to the spaceport that'll that'll make things more easy and then oh no pirate king gorian shard turns up in in his giant <laughs> corsair cruiser um he flies over the city uh everyone's panicking grief doesn't really know what the fuck is going on uh sees that it's the pirates his droid runs in and is like oh we we have your your skate pod is ready you could do that and he's like no no i'll i'll stay with my people they need me batman yeah um, it's like um, what are you like what are you going to do yeah i guess you, you think question. going for help would be <clears throat> go for help yeah if you're, if you're um, it's it's, it's kind of like in episode one where queen amidala like had to leave naboo even though she didn't want to she wanted to stay behind with her people but qui-gon was like no you need to come with us and and her advice was like yeah they will kill you now bob what's uh, what are you doing What's happening? Southport. Oh no, the worms. The worms are gone. No. What? You your, were... your mic is uh, your mic is crackling like all hell. It sounded like you were like deep throating your microphone. Uh, it's happening I, again. I I uh, it's happening again. Hold on. Let me. Yeah. Let me uh, let me leave. 
All right, then. Oh, well, there's worms. They're effective. Anyway, so, yeah. So, well, um, yeah. The, ship, ship, the ship is flying overhead. And the immediate question I have before we even start with the dialogue <laughs> is, so it's been at least a couple of weeks, right? Because the, Mando spent some time with the coverts. So it's been a few weeks since Mando was here. Right. Question number one. So what what Gore, took Gore, so long? Yeah, where the hell was Gorian Shaw? Because they were in his system. They were by the, the mining people and the asteroid belt that he mentioned in the same system. That was all the way back in episode one. Have mm-hmm. they just been like hanging out on the edge of the solar system, doing nothing for, for weeks? I guess. Why? I, guess. I, don't, I don't know. <clears throat> Is that better? It, well, it's still, still a here. little bit of crackling. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Are you, uh, by chance, sitting next to a microwave? I am not, no. Um, hold on, what, what happens if I, if I move it over here? You sound That's distant, little... but like it's not doing it now, so... Yeah, okay. distant but not crackling. That's weird. Okay. But like, if, it, All if, right. if, if, I, if I move it in like oh, this, no. is it crack? it's crackling? Yeah, it crack, crackles when you move it. It's, it's... You, you, you are giving off static electricity. Uh, you are electro. No, I'm no, I'm obviously Shazam. Oh, uh, well, no. Oh, well, right now. No. There's an omnipotent pen, Jolly. I'm gonna I'm gonna oh. I'm gonna do a no. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a watch party of it with, with Jolly and then we'll 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 all do a, a little live stream together talking about Shazam. <laughs> I don't wanna talk about Shazam too. <laughs> all right. But yeah, so, so the pirates yeah. show up. Um and we, the question was like, what took them so long? Yeah, so uh, what, took them, what took them so long is question number one. Like, what have they been doing? Question number two is, given that they were destroying and fighting and dogfighting with Mando in the Astro Belt of this very system, and they, you know, Grief has been aware for some time now that he's pissed these people off and they're on their way, why has he done nothing to secure security in that intervening few weeks? Well, like, so, there's just uh, nothing here. It's just going to raise a larger question. We kind of already touched on this when talking about just world building. Um, does Grief not know people like mercenaries for hire, uh, private armies for hire? He he has connections. He was like the leader of the Bounty Hunters Guild. Why he needs one Mandalorian to try to protect his entire planet is beyond me because he should have... I mean, where's Axe Woves? <laughs> What's he doing? Yeah, why couldn't we... Uh, yeah, bid for him. I, I, surely there are private armies, especially in this at this point in time, right, when... Uh, the galaxy's under like new leadership. A lot of people aren't allowed to have their own armies per New Republic Accords, and they have to they have to go out of pocket in order to pay for a defense force. Like you would expect a lot of like Golden Company type people, right? You'd expect a lot of these kinds of people to be popping up. Yeah, I'll talk Where about are they? You know, partic- particularly given that Goran Shard has been like, oh, the pirate threat is all everywhere in the galaxy right now, which would you'd think would mean there's a huge market for these kind of private protectors. Mm-hmm. I would have sprung up, particularly again, in the instability like, left grief, behind by the grief. collapse of the empire. And again, like I just refuse to believe grief wouldn't have these contacts. He was the leader of the bounty hunters guild. Yeah, and he definitely has the means to pay for them as well. Like Navarro, from what we see, is very prosperous. Like he's got a mm-hmm. fucking mint office. He's wearing gold chains. Like they can just like hand off lovely spars to people on a whim. They've got mining guilds setting up shop in the asteroid belts. Mm-hmm. They, they've got cash. They're flush. So the question we had at the end of the last episode when Mando encountered Pirate King Gorian Shard and then just fucked off and he, like didn't uh, notify Grief that the pirates were in their system, that that's up, that's coming up again. Why does uh, why does Grief apparently not know that they were in a system? What took them so long to attack? And why is there like why in the in the intervening weeks have we not seen any kind of defense force built up by private mercenaries? Who knows? Um, you- your guess is as good as mine. I mean, the next bit is the dialogue, which is even funnier, because <laughs> the next thing we get is the, uh, you know, the, the droids, like, maybe, you know, we're being hailed. Maybe we should negotiate. Also, mark this. So we are being hailed. Gorian Shard is hailing us. Mm-hmm. What do we do? Maybe we should pay them off. And Grief's like, oh, no, if we pay them off, that sets a bad precedent. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but Grief, you know what sets yeah, a worse precedent? Being no, killed. I- <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so again, we, we come back to, like, all right, so what do you do? Um, you you don't want to be extorted, obviously, because then the pirates know that you are defenseless and weak and that they can take whatever they want. Uh, but you also don't want to be destroyed and you don't have any kind of defense built up. You don't you don't have any relationship with the New Republic yet, so they can't come to help you. His plan is to not run, to, to not die. try to negotiate and then 
and then call the New Republic and like hope and pray that they decide to send some help. Um, I mean, this the is thing not is, a good right, plan. Like, if 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 because the thing is, like, the horse has bolted on the whole. It sets a bad precedent thing because they're already here. Like they they're here. They yeah, are robbing you. Know you know what sets the worst precedent is uh, apparently you've been running this place for a nebulous amount of time and haven't built any kind of security force. Yeah, These and also look at it. Just show up on your doorstep and we're fucked. Look at it from the pirate's perspective. This is kind of what I touched on when we were talking about like real world piracy in, in episode one, right? But like, if a pirate goes, surrender without a fight and we'll take your gold, but we'll leave you alive. And you're like, no, that sets a bad precedent. They're like, okay, but if we don't then kill you for resisting, that sets a bad precedent for our <laughs> reputation. So you can see the dilemma we're in. Just imagine also, like, Han, like you... Han, Han and Chewie are flying with the rebellion, and Han's like, "Listen, I gotta go. I gotta pay off Jabba the Hutt." And uh, and Leia's just like, "No, Han, that sets a bad precedent. You can't do that." <laughs> and Jabba's like, "Yeah, well, yeah, it sets a bad precedent <laughs> if I let you go, motherfucker." So, I mean, the other thing here is like, you can lie. Like, you can pay them off. Like, you can buy yourself time effectively because we're like, "Oh, if we pay them off." Yeah, that's that, what that, I'm advocating that, for. Yeah, you pay I guess them, them off. to piss off. And, um, and like continue, you know, you set up a relationship where you're like, okay, I guess I have to pay you. And then, they, and then they'll leave you alone. They'll stay like over your city uh, to extort you. Then, you know, maybe send yeah, out help. a communication, go like, Hey, please, like we will join your new Republic. Just please help us. And then they'll come and, and they'll, they'll stop the pirates. And then, you know, no, you no longer have to pay the pirates. The pirates are no hey. longer a problem. You know, you know a movie that did this exact plot and did it way better because they actually have a character realize this and go get help? Bugs Life. <laughs> Fucking Bugs Life did a better job of this. Ah, uh, yeah, even the Bugs Life did it. Jesus. Did it. Flick from Bugs Life is smarter than Grief Cargo. Well, again, like, I, I go back to Queen Amidala from episode <laughs> one. It's like... You're not really in a good situation. You had no army to speak of, really. You had like a security force and barely one at that. The Trade Federation has invaded your planet. They've cut off communications. The Jedi are here to help you. You need to leave. You need to plead your case. You need to do whatever the Republic tells you to do if you want. If you have any chance of fending off the Trade Federation. Yeah, um, I'm just going to address um, <laughs> Joe's like this. Joe, this is the last time I'm going to address one of your comments directly, right? Because, like I said, I don't want to turn this into a debate. But mm -hmm. I will just, I will just address this because it's nonsense. <laughs> I, I pointed this out in the last stream. Like, there's a reason real-world pirates uh, honored their word as far as the whole surrender and we won't kill you thing. And that's because if people surrender to them and you kill them anyway, then the next time around, they're not going to surrender. They're going to fight to the death. And that's bad for you. Because even if you win, you're going to have to like pay off injured crew, repair your ship. It costs a lot of money. And that's if you win. You could lose. So that's a bad a, precedent to set. This is an actual problem with uh, the extended edition of Return of the King when Aragorn kills the Mouth of Sauron. Is that's technically a war crime. Um, it would actually be very, very bad for him because of the whole like killing killing a uh, a messenger who was not a combatant um, is it was obviously prohibited because then nobody would send messages anywhere. Nobody would be willing to deliver the messages. Yeah, true. It's, Although it's, to, it's defend, actually... to defend Aragorn. To defend Aragorn, right? Because the salient difference, and, and I, I think this is what Joe's going to get at, right? When I make this defense, it's like, oh, but the pirates are evil, and you can't trust them, so it doesn't matter, right? And I'm like, no, 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 it it does, right? Because these pirates are pirates; they're not Sauron, right? Sauron <laughs> is the literal embodiment of all evil, and everyone and everyone is well aware of this. Like, he's yeah. famously not just untrustworthy, but like famously evil. Like, he is they're the incarnation evil. of evil. They're, these pirates yeah. are just business. Like, these pirates are essentially just running a business. Well, like, it's well, an illegal business, but it's a business. Well, jolly chap. So, by your logic, shouldn't you then be willing to uh, to blow up the the other fairy because the Joker is oh, threatening no. him? Oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, so for a second, I thought it was for a second. I thought he said fairy, and I was like, blow up the other fairy, like the other gay person. Like, wow, wow, South Pole, you homophobe, Jesus. <laughs> Not where my mind goes when I hear fairy. I was obviously talking about the little uh, that like Tinkerbell. That's yeah, really what yeah, I was yeah. Talking about. We're, we're talking about I'm, Tinkerbell becoming a jihadist. Um, I'm normal. That's what we're whenever about. I hear fairy, I think of Tinkerbell. You fucking weirdos. Well, I heard fairy as an F A. It's, it's the accent, man. And in to me, it sounded like he said fairy, not fairy. Like <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. So to, to to address, yeah, to to round off the addressing of Joe's point, right? Like the whole like, oh yeah, if you deal with him, he's still going to take the base over. Like you can't trust him. It's like okay, so. First of all, there's good reasons why pirates aren't going to behave that way. Uh, and the second one is, even if Gorian Shard is going to do that, by negotiating with him, even if it's just for the length of the negotiations, you can buy time for, to evacuate the city, to get people out. So, mm. Or even like you can negotiate the surrender of your town in a way where like they're not going to get killed. In fact, 
Gorian Shard is literally asking him to do that because Gorian Shard's into- the, the dialogue which I was about to touch on is that Gorian Shard is like, you know, because Grief tries to hold, oh, we got the New Republic backing us, and Gorian's like, well, that's bullshit, and we all know it's bullshit, so you, you can't you can't bluff your way out of this. Um, don't don't talk to me unless you're willing to surrender, and you know that's the only negotiation I want. By the way, I hold all the cards. Not not a writing flaw, but like God, the puppet in this scene. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, the puppet is um, it's not good. The, yeah. the, it's very. Oh. It kind of reminds me of you know like old Sesame Street, like where they just yeah. like have the mouth moving and there's no actual coordination between what it's this saying and what the mouth movements are. This character already reminded me of Oscar the Grouch, but now like watching this episode, I was like, <laughs> oh my fucking god! It's I thought, mouth- yeah. I, I, man, I, some of the funniest puppet work I think I've ever seen was easily the Babu Fricks in the season, oh. where it's like, oh, oh, yeah, that. It's so so mediocre. I mean, like, I, I, I'm not an expert puppeteer, right? I don't. I I, I didn't watch a lot of uh, puppet procedurals. I didn't go to university to learn <laughs> how to how to operate one of these. Uh, but I mean, I've got I've got a working set of eyes, and I can tell when it's quite clear uh and, that they're I, like they're sliding to the side as they're walking um, I, I think uh i think the most egregious uh example of puppet of puppetry in this in this season has got to be grogu uh from when he's jumping around <laughs> oh yeah basically <laughs> sliding across the floor Especially it just the looks so bad guards, the praetorian oh, guards as well oh, that God. was so oh. funny we'll get we'll, we'll get that we'll don't worry we'll get that anyway <laughs> so <laughs> There's two minor points in this dialogue, which is just really funny because it's like clearly no one was paying attention when they wrote the script. Like they weren't even reading their own sentences back. So the f- one of the things that happens is um, Goran Shard closes off the conversation by being like, don't hail me again unless you're going to surrender. And I'm it's like, funny, but he yeah. didn't hail you. He didn't hail you. You hailed him. You hailed him. It's, it's <laughs> literally the same thing from Kenobi again, where uh, yeah. Vader's like, have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? It's like, no, you, you came here. You followed you me. Fucking, you followed me. You're the one oh getting off the ship. Uh, the other thing is the um, the resurrection of the whole who sh- you know the he shot first meme. Uh, yeah, where where grief is like, oh, he shot. You know, like, Goran Shard is like, you attacked my man. You attacked my messenger when I sent him. What the fuck? And grief's like, well, he shot first. It's like, well, first of all, no, he fucking didn't. No. Um, he doesn't even get a shot off. None of his mates do. They all get shot down when they reach for their guns, but they don't actually get a shot off. So no. Grief shot first. Verifiably false, yeah. But also, then yeah. Gorian Shard is like, well, now it's my turn to shoot first. Oh, that dialogue is excellent. What world like, class. You're just kind of sitting there, like, wondering what happened to shame. Yeah, I just, I, just, I want to die. Yeah. Um, all right, so, yeah, they close off communication. Grief uh, is, like, getting the fuck out of Dodge, trying to rally people out of the town, and uh, Gorian Shard, because he's not fucking around, because, of course, he's not, because, for once, there are consequences for actions. <laughs> he opens fire. He opens fire on the city. And, like, I, I can't stress this enough, right? There are, there are so many dead people. Mm-hmm. Like, he obliterates this town. There are going to be so many dead people, like, dead children, dead civilians. Well, And so, like, one thing you're going to sort of get a sense of throughout this episode is time. Uh, a lot of time passes. A lot of things are, you know, there's a lot of moving parts that are going around. This character has to go to this planet to talk to these people about doing this thing, moving these resources around, this, this, and this, in order to come help these these people. Meanwhile, the fucking pirate attack is the opening scene, and, like, they're already bombarding the city, destroying countless uh, buildings. So many people are dying. Um, time is just not a resource that's on our side here, and yet, there's a lot of meandering in this episode. Yeah, there is, and and the thing is, I don't know if the meandering uh, is is it you know because if you if you set up your opening scene as they have already attacked, I don't know how much the meandering is going to make you know like this is a galaxy you're going to have to meander a little bit to get around the place, particularly given who they're going to go talk to. But the, it's just the kind of like funny aspect of it, right? I'm like, yeah, the meandering doesn't necessarily make no sense, right? It, it's it's potentially what would have to happen, but it is just kind of funny that like we spend a whole episode screwing around trying to find people, and meanwhile everyone's already dead because they were killed, because Grief didn't bother preparing for the inevitable pirate attack that he did, he definitively knew was coming. He didn't even have, like, an escape... Because conti- because that's the thing. There was apparently an escape plan put in place for the High Magistrate. Like, an escape pod is ready uh, and is prepped. Yeah. Soon. But, like, if he's so adamant about not leaving his people behind, why wouldn't there be an escape uh, contingency for, like, everyone? Like, all the uh, citizens well, just, can evacuate in, like, a ship somewhere. 
There's also a thing here where like, there's a really missed, this happens again later in the in episode, but there's a missed opportunity here to show people being smart with tactical thinking, right? Because this is a universe where um, you can detect if people are coming out of hyperspace, right? That was the big issue for Vader in episode five, right? When he ambushes Hoth, mm-hmm. was that um, his captain that came out of light too speed close. too close. And that means that they could detect him, whereas he wants to come out further away and then approach them from the reversed side of the planet so that they wouldn't be able to detect him via radar or anything like that. And therefore he could just surprise them. Mm-hmm. But instead, Gorin Shah just turns up, and maybe that's what he did, but no one ever remarks upon it. And apparently, Grief didn't notice people coming out of hyperspace, mm-hmm. which is weird. And this happens later as well when they surprise Gorin Shah. Like, no one is paying attention to anything and or has any sensors or shields, or it just it all just disappears on a whim. Mm-hmm. We got a guy in chat named Cash asking, Do you think Kathleen Kennedy is the reason for the downfall of Mando season three? No, um, no, I think Dave Filoni and John Favreau are to blame yeah. for that because you, John Favreau and Dave Filoni fucking made the show. My, I think my, Kathleen... only, my only response to that sorry, would be, uh, sorry. Well, my response to that would be, well, like, well, do you, do you think that Kathleen Kennedy is the reason for Andor being good? It's like, yeah, no. it's the thing. <laughs> I will, the, the only thing I'm going to lay at the doorstep of Kathleen Kennedy, right? Because I, I, without trying to get sidetracked, Kathleen Kennedy is it, her part to play in the, in the, fucking catastrophe that has been disney star wars is one she fundamentally doesn't understand the franchise and doesn't really have much of an interest in it it's to her it's just a job which is in a sense fair but also this is a creative industry you should care Mm. but the second part is is it's the culture she's fostered she's fostered this culture where like the standards to which everyone's independent canon or whichever directors of personal ambitions are being held to like this, this kind of central core drive that makes everyone toe a certain line to keep things consistent just is being left to go by the wayside. She kind of just seems to view Star Wars as a kind of factory that occasionally shits out things that make money. Um, so I, I will lay the culture, the, the blame for the culture of this rot at Kathleen Kennedy's doorstep. But this specific instance of the rot, this specific spread of mold is very much Filoni and Favreau's. All know? right, like I, I, I blame Michael Waldron for the multiverse of madness. I don't really, I don't really put that at Kevin Feige's feet, even if he did make certain executive decisions that allowed this abysmal film to come to exist. You know? Yeah. I mean, let, let's use Grief Cargo as an example. I don't blame Grief Cargo for Gore and Shard's attack. I do blame Grief Cargo for fostering the culture <laughs> of apathy that led to absolutely nothing being put in place to prevent an attack like this. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, to get back to what we were saying, I, what I wanted to say about just the, the the meandering is that while you are correct that it does technically make sense in most instances, just given how like you know space travel works, uh, the one thing that I wasn't happy about. So like he he contacts Carson Tava, who you you're, you're probably sitting in there like who? Um, he's, it's the bald guy from the New Republic. He's the X wing pilot. He's in Oh Tava. Uh, Tava Tava. I call him Tava. The point is, that's who Karga contacts instead of Mando for some reason, even though they're friends and like, he, whatever, we'll, we'll get to that. And then Tava's like, I need to get Coruscant to like know that this is happening and and and, uh, and put a stop to it. And then, you know, the cameo of the week, Zeb is like, hey, they're, you know, they're, they're so backlogged. They're never going to, they're never going to uh, deal with it in time. He's like, oh, I'll just go there myself then. Um, so like my suggestion is just like go ahead and submit like a like a request anyway. Just put it into the system, and then if you're gonna go to Coruscant anyway after that, then do that. But at least then it's like in the system. Maybe there's a chance well, it'll have been seen. May, may I point out something that he, he could actually have done, and the ending of the season confirms that he's willing to do this. So I don't understand why he doesn't do it here. He could literally have just gotten his squadron of X wings and just gone, and explained mm-hmm. it later. Like he, he didn't have to sign off, get signed off from the New Republic. He could have just done it on his own bat and then like yes, taken the consequences. I mean, given Zeb, he apparently believes that that's an option. Zeb literally said, "I was rooting for these people." Like I imagine he's probably told all of these uh, these fighters um, about Navarro and like what they're trying to do, and that he supports what they are, and like he's friends with some of them. And you know, I'm sure if he was like, "Hey, these people need need our help," and like this guy's my friend, like who's with me? I'm sure every single one of them want to follow him. Well, even especially because Tiva. Especially because this episode is clear that Tava doesn't just believe this is helping a friend, right? He believes that Navarro is the center of a grand conspiracy to reunify the Empire. So, Which like, you think whole... he would be really, yeah. Which is a whole. You think other he'd be super thing, invested right? in going there? That's like not. That's <laughs> just. I can't wait to get into. But yeah. But yeah, I don't know how he. I don't know how he got to that conclusion. But seeing yeah. as that is the conclusion, the episode is telling me that he's come to the idea that he wouldn't like. 
disobey orders from a bureaucratic far-off republic he doesn't necessarily agree with and just like round up his old idealistic rebellion mm. buddies from his squadron and just go. Like, yeah, also, totally Mando go. has been... Mando seasons have been clear about this, I mean, and Book of Boba Fett when he turned up in that as well. Like he is willing to fudge reports and lie. That's already been established. Mm -hmm. Like he let Mando go several times from being arrested, and like he literally had that scene where Mando like subspace boosts away from him and his colleague, and they're like, "We need to take you in." And mm -hmm. the colleague's like, "What do we do?" And he's like, "Well, we could go back and file paperwork, or we could just pretend this didn't happen." What do you want to do? <laughs> So he's like clearly he's willing to bend the rules when he thinks there's a greater good, except now because the plot demands that he can't. <laughs> um, um, which, but yeah, so, so yeah. the grief contacted uh, Carson Teva for help instead of, well, again instead of Mando, which would have made the most sense since they're already friends. Because this episode does this really roundabout thing that we're going to get into in order to get the Mandalorians into this plot, and it's so weird considering that you could have just had grief call him. Um, yeah, I guess I suppose also, the thing they're going for is that the covert is secret, right? And so that you can't contact him directly while he's there. I guess that's on. what they're going I, for. I, I yeah, I know. That. I refuse I, that. I, that's so that's stupid. It, 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 that's going to be the excuse. Like establish that. I don't know. But also yeah. the the other point I was going to make, they couldn't do this because of Gina Carano. But like, why would you not call Cara Dune if you need the New Republic's help? Why would you go to Carson Tiva and not Cara fucking Dune? <laughs> Well, Chief, it's because uh, currently her body has been incorporated into a statue in Navarro, <laughs> as with all of its heroes. <laughs> it's like, um, like do a, like a throwaway line. He's like, I can't call Cara Dune. and she's like on an undercover mission. I haven't heard from her in six months. Something. Pain. <laughs> just right. just sheer agony. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, we, we've kind of already gone over it, but like they go to the Bondi Beach base. Uh -huh. We come to Bondi Beach base. And, uh, you know, uh, Teva gets his message from Grief, and he's like, well, i gotta got to go do something about this. I'll go talk to the higher-ups on Coruscant, um, because this isn't pressing at all. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not like people way, are dying right now. There is a line when he talks to the to his boss on Coruscant, where he's like, where are you, where are you stationed at? And he's like, Adelphi base. And he's like, oh, you're a long way from home, which implies that there must have been, what, several weeks of space travel to get here? Because that's yeah, like several days at the very least. Air. You know, like it's not just instant teleportation, right? You're supposed like if you're in a faraway system, like on the outer rim, and you're trying to go to Coruscant, like that's going to take days, if not weeks, and it's going to depend probably on a lot of different factors. Um, time is of the essence here because he's traveling sublight, isn't he? No, he's yeah. traveling light speed, but light speed yeah, is not instantaneous. Mm. If he was traveling sublight, he would have never gotten anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> yeah, he would. He would have died of old age long before he got that. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> We got our Zeb cameo, and you know what? Yeah. I, I'm going to give them this. I think Zeb looks good. It was nice to see him. <laughs> Zeb um, looks really good. I liked it. I liked hi, hi Zeb. put in effort to make him look good. Um, yeah, um, cameos. <laughs> Key jangling. All I can really say about Zeb, though, because he's not a character in this. Uh, he just sort of comes in and says some things to help the plot along, and then he's gone. So Me yeah, it's also I like can't the, wait um, for them to ruin him in Ahsoka. It'll be great. It's the member Zeb. The kind of I do. <laughs> I yeah, remember it, Zeb. He's the big, funny, here's, purple dude. Here's the thing, right? There's a kind of meta level of convenience to this, right? Which, like, so, you know, I'm not necessarily saying it's convenient in, in universe for him to be on the space because he has to be somewhere, right? And this is as good, a, sure. even though he doesn't impact the plot, this is as good a place for him to be as any. However, from a meta level, it's like, of all the rebellion bases that Tabor <laughs> could have been assigned to, it just so happens to be the one with the guy that we, the fans, are going to recognize. Well, that's cool that's neat yeah mighty I, mighty I'm convenience fine. i'm fine with that i'm totally okay with that it's, it's fine uh jolly i mean we've kind of gone into why like that's convenient is kind of a silly thing to say like i i don't think that that that's that's an issue in this case uh i'm gonna need you to explain that sentence well, don't you remember like all the all the the, the bad faith criticisms we made for Lord of the Rings, just like just naming things off as uh, that's convenient? I mean, well, again, so this is why I was this is why I was very specific in my criticism, right? I said like it's not necessarily convenient in universe, but it is mm -hmm. on a meta level a convenience from the sense of like the writers have dumped him here because so the fans can go ooh ah, not because his position here necessarily makes any kind of coherent sense, and not because he's going to impact the plot, and 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 so. The reason sure. it annoys me is the reason that convenience generally annoys me, and that like I can see the hand of the writer at play and why they've done it. It takes me out of the universe because I know why well, he's here. It helps me. You can literally see Dave Filoni's silhouette in the foreground. Right. Yeah. There's and also like, that. 
yeah, they, they, they could have, yeah, <laughs> they could have had like any random other character be the one to like deliver Zeb's lines basically, but they chose to make it Zeb. So, that, you know, mm -hmm. you well, so that people could clap and cheer. Exactly. And that's what I mean, right? But like, it's it's a meta convenience, right? It's a con it's not a it's not a plot convenience. It's a it's a it's a convenience of the stars aligning to give the fans their moment to clap. And oh, okay, as well, a so as a critic, in, um, I know why they've done that, and it annoys me. In terms of in universe, like, because you know he's going to show up in Ahsoka, if he's not stationed on a Delphi base, um, yeah. when we when we meet him in the show, I'm going to be like, okay, why did you do so? Why was he there? in the Mando episode? Was it just so that we could get a, a Zeb appearance? You yeah, know? it was. I it was just so we could clap. I clapped. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah Southpaw, that's, again, because again, like, that's the summary, right? I'm not criticizing the plot writing here. I'm, I'm criticizing okay. the, the, the general culture that the writers are fostering or being fostered on the writers at the very least here. Well, because like... Um, fan service takes precedent over co coherent world building. Well, it, so this isn't an isolated incident of Star Wars doing this. Basically, of course. no, it isn't. Like that's 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 that happens a lot, yeah. Like if, if if this was maybe like the very first time they that they've done it in a, in like a very long time, then maybe. But they do this all the time. Well, it's like in yeah. Bad Batch. Um, it does. It's not. It doesn't not make sense that oh we need a bounty hunter to capture Omega. Oh, why not make it Cad Bane? He's a bounty hunter. He's somewhere in the galaxy. But mm -hmm. from a meta standpoint, it's like oh man, there's got to be like hundreds or thousands of bounty hunters out there. What a coincidence that we keep running into this guy. It's crazy. It's almost as if he's a fan favorite. Yeah. Anyway, so Tabor goes to Coruscant. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it takes him to get here. A while. He goes to requisitions, uh, and he's like, uh, I need to get some help for Navarro. They're under attack by pirates. And uh, requisitions man is like, well, uh, okay, I've never heard of Navarro. Like, is this a pressing issue? What's going on? And Tabor's like, well, yeah, I think uh, they're under attack. And while he's talking... Who should poke her head round the door? But uh, <laughs> Elias Kane, um, who is apparently working in the requisitions office, which uh, again, I'm convenient that she's working in this office that Tabor just happened to be. Anyway, fuck it, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll just go. <laughs> of all the places she could have been assigned as part of her amnesty program, she just happens to be in the in the requisitions office. And this specific, because I imagine there's a lot of them, right? This specific requisitions office. Because they didn't. Anyway, they didn't, mention, they didn't mention that she was uh, stationed at this office in in that episode, right? I don't think we no. ever saw her in any kind of office um, in that episode. Well, she no, was, she got. No. She got. She 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 was given uh, sole access to the uh, the control panel to. Oh God! Yeah. Brain. Yeah. Well, here's a comment that perfectly highlights that. How does she have so much authority? <laughs> Yeah, I've no idea. She's able, she's so, able because we're gonna see this a lot throughout these episodes, guys. Where like she's able to do a lot of things, move around to a lot of places, uh, completely un unimpeded by like security officers or anything of that nature. When she's an so ex-imperial who is in an amnesty program and is trying to redeem let's break, herself, quote unquote. Let's break this down as as coherent as possible, right? So like, it's already amazingly convenient that of all the officers she could have been assigned to, it's this one, and like. The best faith assumption I can give them is like she has found a way to worm herself into this office directly because it's got the you know Navarro is under its jurisdiction and that's where her concern is. Except that that doesn't make any sense as an explanation because first of all this office doesn't concern itself with Navarro because Navarro is not a member state, as she points out. But also her concern is now with Mandalore and this office uh, there's nothing to suggest that this office is responsible for Mandalore, which by the way is also not in the New Republic. So. Yeah, sure. She's she's here for reasons. Uh, um, she or Gideon has any interest in any of the systems under this person's jurisdiction is basically what we're getting at here. Yeah, so her presence here is weird. Uh, it's an yeah. oddity. Anyway, so she pokes her head around the door and she's like, do you want lunch? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then Tabor's carrying on his shtick and she's like, oh, Navarro, you know, that's not a member state. Just FYI. Mm -hmm. And a requisitions man is like, oh, it's not? Oh, well, I mean, you know, we've got loads of, you know, it shit's shit's busy right now. We've got loads of systems asking for our help, and members take priority because, like, obviously they take priority. So I like, have a few questions it. here. Um, so okay. we're establishing that uh, the New Republic is swarmed, basically, with with uh, with planets that are in need of aid, right? I'm assuming uh, by the nature of the Navarro attack, this type of aid that other planets are in need of that are actual member planets, you know, are like pirate attacks or some other conflict. You know, like you need to send in X wings, stuff like that. Um, yep. I'm assuming that's going to make up the majority of these member worlds conflicts that these that the requisitions officer is talking about. So, if the New Republic is backed up and is busy, 
why are they decommissioning their fleet? <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> we are apparently we're very low on resources to the point where we can't help anyone who's not a member world, and even then, it's going to take a while. Um, so stop decommissioning your fleet, you dumb fucks. Um, the second one is going to be uh, in the book of Boba Fett. There were two random X wings. Uh, we just talked about this scene because Tavo is one of these X wings stationed over Tatooine. Why? Yeah, Tatooine that's not a member world. Not a member world. It barely ever even had an imperial presence at the height of its power. Weren't they? Why uh, do we have two X wings stationed on Tatooine? Weren't they escorting like a shuttle or something? No. Why would they be? It's a commercial shuttle that you can't it's, just yeah. send two X wings to, to escort every commercial transit. Yeah, that's that's fair. I'm just not I'm, to mention like Tatooine is not a member state. Nor yeah, is it anywhere were, near one. It's, they it's were the end of a, nowhere. As a police force for this random bumfuck nowhere planet, and the and the you know the brightest center from the universe here on the planet that's farthest from, according to the OT. But in Disney Star Wars, it's basically a central hub. So what do I know? Yeah. Not to mention that, like, yeah, you have no jurisdiction there. So what are you even doing there? No um, jurisdiction. But... You have so many member worlds that take priority. What the fuck are you guys? I mean. I guess best case scenario, the best interpretation would be that Adelphi is super close to Tatooine. Maybe they were doing like a training run. Yeah. Anyway, so to do back to back to the scene, right? There's there's several things I want to point out. The first thing I want to point out is I am siding with Requisitions Man. <laughs> like mm. Requisitions Man is bloody right when he's like, okay, we have loads of people who need our help. So members mm. are obviously going to take priority because obviously, otherwise, what the hell is the point of this new republic? Um, so I'm totally on his side. The thing I will say, though, that is odd, and it's not just a him problem, it's a, it's a general problem, and that's the Kane authority problem of how is this um, ex-imperial... Oh, sorry, I, there's so many levels of shit to this that I need to break it down. So Tava <laughs> explicitly calls out that the reason he's interested in Navarro specifically is that like he thinks that there's a hub of imperial bullshit going on there, and Requisitions Man is like, well, hang on, that's a hell of a claim. Where's your evidence? A bit of a and Tava's like, yeah, Tava's like, I just have a feeling, basically. And Requisitions Man's like, well, that's not good enough. Tava and has Tava's the force. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, and then Tava's like, oh, the pirate attack is connected to Gideon, which, oh, which, by the way, he turns out to be right, but what? Wait, you had no reason to How that, and why? Like, that's such a leap in logic that, that like, there was yeah. no connective tissue there, and you turned out to be well, right. I'll go, I'll like, go, I'll go you one. Writing. I'll go you one further. When we actually get the confirmation on this, my immediate question is, what the fuck is Gideon doing? Like, why is this part of this plan at all? Why, why does he care? What's, what's the point? Anyway, just, yeah. Well, screw well it. also, what, like, what's worth pointing out is that in order to conclude that the pirates are involved with the Empire, uh, he cites the fact that there are apparently reports of TIE fighters flying overhead and stormtroopers in the streets of Navarro. Now, and I have questions about that. Is he saying, like, post season two, this is these reports have been happening, or is he. I is, think he's referring back to the fact to, that the um, Empire was pushed out of the system. Like a well, he's definitely not or... ignorant because he's definitely not ignorant because he came and saw Cara Dune and gave her the badge, right? So he he knows that they're gone. Yeah. However, he knows that they had an interest in Navarro, and so I'm guessing he's. I guess I'm trying to be as good faith as possible. I'm guessing the claim he's making is like there is a weird level of level of imperial interest in this very specific out of the way world. We should maybe pay attention to it. Now, one of the things he cites in support of his argument is Moff Gideon. I hear I hear Moff Gideon never made it to trial. Oh. Now, well, so here's two oh. things. One. We're going to address this when we get to the end scene of this episode, but that's some bullshit in and of itself. But even putting that aside to one second and just focusing on who's in the room, Elias Kane is in the room. She was Gideon's second in command. So the second Tabor's like, Moff Gideon was interested in this sector. Elias Kane's opinion on the sector should be not just worthless, but under suspicion. Mm -hmm. Like, Requisition Man should be like, actually, yeah, that's a good point, Kane. You were part of this weird, culty Gideon guy's crew that was interested in Navarro. Why, you know, maybe you should chime in with some more information, or I'm going to start questioning what the like, hell you're doing in this room right now. Like, yeah. why, why, why are we trusting Kane? How has she got this amount of authority? Like, I don't know. Especially I considering her no history. Idea. Like, she's it's... not some random imperial grunt. She was Moff Gideon's culty, deeply fanatic, hanging on captain imperial of remnant fleet. officer. Wasn't she? Yeah. She was like the captain of his fleet. Yeah. Well, like... She wasn't just a run-of-the-mill imperial officer that you could, uh, you know, slap on the wrist and send on her way. She was probably the most indoctrinated of all of them. Yeah, she's like the uber fascist. Uh, anyway, so the, the the new republic continues to be apathetic, even though they're correct, right? The way in which they talk about being correct is like demonstrates. It's meant to demonstrate the new republic is like apathetic and unconcerned and bureaucratic. 
So they continue to be bloody useless. Cain continues to be given free run of the Republic for reasons that are unknown to God or man. And Teva has conjured a QAnon level conspiracy theory around the planet Navarro out of sock puppets right and his about. ass. Yeah, that he just so happens to be correct about. So are we going to wait to the end of this episode to talk about Gideon not having yeah. a trial and like the let's, nature let's, of the state? Let's wait, let's wait okay. till the end because I think it's, I think that's the best place to talk about it. So we'll wait on that. But yes, okay. there's a lot to talk about there. There's so much to say. Listen, T Taven has that uh, that Zemo sixth sense, okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's just he's just a psychic. You know, he actually checks all the cars at the border. He's he's just different. Yeah. <laughs> Tava's built different. <laughs> oh, anyway, so Tava's uh, like, okay, I need to go somewhere else for help. I'll go to the Mandalorians, which are... Oh, my God. So, first things, before we get to how he knows they're here, <laughs> I, I, have a general, I have a general question. Was Tava even aware of the existence of the Covert uh, before this scene? Good question. Well, okay, so... And I guess I'm, I'm going to have to spoil how he found out uh, to basically answer this question. He finds the covert through R5, uh, the droid that, uh, if you'll remember, is with is with Mando um, as of episode two of this season, who apparently served in the rebellion. They were old war buddies and they're, I guess, in contact. I don't know. So maybe R5 told him about the covert. The story that was never in the original trilogy and the last. Actually, well, no, he's in the original. Oh, he, he is. No, he is no, in the no, OG. no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Let me finish. Okay, sorry. Jesus, sorry. He isn't shown in the original trilogy serving in the rebellion because the one time we see him, he breaks down at, at the sand <laughs> crawler. <laughs> you see, guys, the reason that that <laughs> happened is because he actually had a forced vision. You see. Where oh, R2, R2's importance was revealed to him in a dream. And so he was like, This guy, this droid needs to be sold to these people. I must also he's explode. A, also, he's a coward, though. Or the which, rebellion. Remem remember this. So, you know how he's been characterized as a coward, even though that makes no sense considering what kind of droid he is. But he is a coward, mm -hmm, yeah. um, apparently. I'm glad he's risking being destroyed by the Mandalorians, who presumably have no issue with kicking a droid to pieces um, by <laughs> revealing their base yeah. to random ex-members for reasons that don't make any sense. See, that was that was one of my points of criticism. Is like, all right, so you just revealed to these people, like you just you you just revealed to these people that like where you got the information and then left him behind after you left. Like, dude, <laughs> this is your yeah. Own so that droid is that droid is scrapped now because they're never trusting him again. Yeah, well, <laughs> especially not Mando. And Mando's under yeah. suspicion as well, probably. Like, oh, so yeah. Why is why is Mando so defensive of him? Because like Mando should be like, I hate droids. A and B, you just betrayed us. Screw you. Because remember, yeah. well, in in the next episode, oh, never that, trust a droid. Never trust a droid. Yeah, they're all suspicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not this one. I, I guess Lily Motto gave him to me, and I trust her with my are life. We, are we also addressing the second cosmic coincidence of uh, of all the people? Because. The rebellion was a large organization, right? There were millions of people in it. There were a lot of bases, yeah. yeah. Or, or at the very least, hundreds of thousands of people were in this rebellion, probably quite a lot more. Of all the people Tava could have met and remembered and been friendly enough to remember, this droid that just so happens to have ended up via being sold on Tatooine via Palimata to fucking Mando. I just, like, I, <laughs> well, convenience so, like, doesn't begin to describe this. My best faith assumption is that they kept in contact... I don't know. But no, no, if they, no, if no, they did, and it's like so, of all the ones he could have known. Well, yeah, that too. But like then, it's just, that's that's the coincidence I'm banging on about, right? It's like of all the droids who he he met in the rebellion or could have met in the rebellion, which I'm presuming was many, 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 many hundreds of thousands. This one that he's pally with just so happened to be the one that was sold to Din. Mm -hmm. What the hell? Well, and the, and the coincidence I'm latching onto is just that unless they kept in contact all these years, and I don't know why they did, like why they you would say that because if he, if they did, why would he not have gone to Tatooine to pick him up um, at any point? But even if they were in con unless they were in contact with each other, how did he know to just reach out, like you know, send out his feelers to like all the droids that he's apparently friends with from the Rebellion days uh, to find the Mandalorian? How much time yeah. has passed? Like, is Navarro even still around? 
I don't. I don't know. I mean, there's also like, how does the how does R five know Tabor's frequency, right? Because presumably, since the rebellion was officialized as a government, mm-hmm. there's a there's been a, some kind of systematic organization, right? Well, like they're probably not using the same channels. He's probably been reassigned, given control of his own units on a particular base. Like, why is the old rebellion com working and so, reaching uh, Tabor? All right. So, genuine question. This isn't exactly a criticism, but like, this is something that's just on my mind. I might have missed something. Sure. Um, so. Why is it that we have to have this overly convoluted way for uh, grief to uh, get in touch with Mando to to like call for good help question? Mando? Who Great the fuck question. knows? That is an excellent like, question you've just you've just asked, Southpaw. Okay, okay, because I was wondering, like, is there like is there some information that I'm just missing as to why nope. they can't just have grief just directly contact Mando? Because you think that uh, you yeah, will so... do that. So Southport, what you're failing to understand is that the dark side of the force is a pathway to many abilities that some <laughs> consider to be unnatural. People don't realize. So, uh, some, somehow yeah. our five returned. What I said earlier, there's like this really roundabout way that they've decided to make it so that the Mandalorians are part of this story. And it's super bizarre considering that Mando and Grief are friends. Well, like, it, why so would he not just call Mando? It just se- it just seems like it introduces like a hundred like contrivances, whereas yeah. like you could have just had it be a thing of grief knows Mando, grief is able to contact Mando, he just contacts Mando and be like, hey, we need help. And I mean, yeah. if you want if you want to get the New Republic involved, still like Din also knows Teva, or it, if, yep. it not directly like he could have he could call Kara and then maybe off screen she could direct him to Teva, whatever. Um, you know, like they, these are all characters that know each other. So, like, if you want all of them to be involved, they can be without all of this convoluted bullshit. You know what you could have done to to to, to get past all this bullshit is like grief could have escaped at the beginning, turned up, and then when Din's like, "How did you know to find me?" Grief can like look a little bit apologetic and be like, "Well, I kind of put a tracker on your ship the last time you were parked here." You know, just as an insurance measure, because I'm an ex bounty hunter and that's something I do. Mm-hmm. Like. And that just cuts out all this middleman bullshit and gets grief straight there. And grief can talk to him directly. Mm. And then grief can present his own side of the argument at the talking stick meeting. <laughs> the talking Which stick. Which we're going to get to the talking stick meeting <laughs> because what the hell? So I, I must have not been paying attention because I don't remember a talking stick meeting. So Well, the, the, when they're well, talking around the fire, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Yeah, um, we're, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. So. Yeah, Tava, Tava's motivations are laid out here where he's like, oh, I want I want you to go and save Navarro because he's your friend. But also, from my perspective, like I think there's an imperial conspiracy going on and that these pirates are a part of it. Which, again, Tava's right, although I don't know why he's right, given that these pirates do not factor into Gideon's plan at all. Mm-hmm. But apparently they are sent by Gideon. And well, so this might be the luckiest leap in logic I've ever seen. Well, see, I just, so, I just so, want to say is... that's really lame, by the way, because I re- I was like, oh, cool. We have like a pirate who's stolen some kind of Imperial craft. You know, he's modified it. He's painted it to be one of his own. Uh, like, that's really cool. And that's very pirate like. I like these guys. Oh, they're just they're just Imperial. Yeah. Well, we can't do anything to widen the universe. We have to shrink it down so that everyone knows each other. Well, so there's a reason why Teva just knows that that Gideon has something to do with this, because you see, Teva has patience and experience. Uh. And he can do anything <laughs> if he has those. He studied Gideon at university. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so we have the talk we now we have the talking stick scene. So what happens is Tava leaves. Well hang on. Before we get to that actually there's a really funny line where like pre Vizsla's a moron. So Tava's uh, like, oh I won't tell any I won't tell anyone that you guys are here. Um, you know, because Din's like, oh, now that you found us, we're going to have to leave because we're no longer a secret anymore. Wait, mm-hmm. Pre Vizsla, like, what do you mean Paz? You meant Paz. You meant Paz. Sorry, Paz. Yeah, sorry, Paz. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Tava, Tava is like... <laughs> Time travel, it exists. No, so Tava, Tava's like, oh, I promise I won't tell anyone, which, like, first of all, horseshit, because they have a, there's a droid here that apparently is just giving it out for free to people. Yeah. But, and I'll, but we're going to destroy him the second you leave. You might want to do something. Yeah, he's he's fucked. Thing. He's gone. Take him with you or watch him die. Anyway, um, Tava's like, I won't tell anyone. And then Paz Vizsla's like, or we could just kill you. And I'm like, Paz? So, first of all, even presuming that he hasn't told, like, presuming that his ship isn't logged and he hasn't told the New Republic where he was going, which is a hell of a risk to take, by the way. If you kill him and you're wrong and, he has, and he's told someone, you've just declared war on the New Republic. Yeah, great but, idea. Yeah, a New even Republic, if he, by the way, doesn't believe that the Empire exists, so they, they are more than willing to go to war with someone else right now. They don't have any yeah. other, any other fish to fry, apparently. 
well, other than their own member states, but like I'm pretty sure they'd make time for if you killed their captains. Yeah. Um, but like you know, because that whole you know, it's, it's a bad precedent thing we said earlier. <laughs> but, um, there's there's a reason why like when when you get pulled over, like you know, the cop is going to write down your license plate and everything, so that if something happens, if you know their car is then discovered uh by another officer like there's an idea as to like who might have possibly shot them or something right it's like yeah this is, this is just a standard precaution that these well, guys it's, would yeah. take. it's also like i'm pretty sure these ships are going to be tracked by the new republic right in the same way that police cars have trackers on them so we can find out where they went like let's, let's, just, let's just play this out right paz like kills Tabor and din apparently lets him and they just dump his body in the lake to be eaten by the crocodile um <laughs> The New Republic are going to be like, wow, one of our captains of our bases in a volatile area just went missing. Let's check and maybe see where his logs, you know, the ship logs were. Oh, it's on the Crocodilopolis. Oh, there's Mando's here. Well, they probably fucking killed him then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Paz, what are you doing, man? Just shut up. You, you, you're clearly not qualified to be making the plans, Paz. Just no, he's, be quiet. He's just making empty threats. It's okay. Oh, screw, pa- screw Paz. I felt <laughs> nothing when he died. Sky. Spoilers! <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet, Jollert. He died. I killed him, and I celebrated. <laughs> there, was so I many, okay, there was one and only only one moment in the season finale where I celebrated, and that was when the dark saber was destroyed. I I I bathed in Vizsla's blood, and I rejoiced. <laughs> oh, I did snow angels in his blood. <laughs> I, I I did skipping rope. I did skipping rope with his intestines, and and laughed with merriment. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, psychopathy aside, um, we have the talking stick scene. So all the Mandos then go inside, and they wait till nightfall to have this conversation. By the way, mm-hmm. they don't yeah. they happen immediately. Like hours pass, apparently, time yeah. is of the effort, like, guys. People are dying. <laughs> but anyway, so um, talking—it's actually a hammer. Just for clarification, uh, whoever is holding the armor's hammer uh, gets to talk, and they, they all just sit there and listen. And so that Din is holding the talking hammer. He gets to plead his case. It, yeah, so like the conch from um, uh, what the hell is that book called now? Um, oh my god, I'm going completely mad. The one that has like all the boys abandoned on an island and piggies. The one that have the conch shell oh, talk. Uh, Lord of the Flies. Thank you. God, my brain was not working there. Yeah, Lord of the Flies. We have a Lord of the Flies situation where like the conch gives you the right to talk, and except instead of the conch, it's the, the the hammer because sure. Anyway, they have this meeting hours later after many more civilians have died. And Din is like, look, I know grief killed a bunch of you. <laughs> and I know and I know the last time we were on Navarro, we got massacred by the Imperials. So it's a bad place for us. But, you know, since then, gosh, he's just gone become a swell guy. And he helped me save this foundling. Um, I mean, he, he obviously tried to kill us to get the foundling back originally. But he did later on help us to save the foundling. Um, not out of any sense of like altruism, but really just to save his own skin. You know what? Maybe I should just shut up about Grief Karga and just, you know, bank on you helping me because I'm nice. Anyway, come help Grief Karga. And the Mandalorian's like, uh, I don't know, man. This seems like a not, not, not you know, not our, not our circus, not our monkey situation. Um, yeah. But then Paz Vizsla grabs the, well, gets given by the armor, gets given the talking stick. So I just want to point this out. <laughs> She takes this, the talking hammer. She's like, does anyone else have anything to say? And she's like holding it out. It's so fucking funny. Like these are, these are not adults. These are not people. Yeah. This, <laughs> this cult is a cult of children. It's like little yeah. lamplight from fallout. I mean, their um, names are children of the watch. I just didn't think that was so literal. <laughs> no, literally we are like the lost boys from Peter Pan. Um, <laughs> Like oh, the armor what runs in and they're like, yay, Wendy's here to tell us a story. Um, <laughs> Anyway, they give Paz the talking stick, and Paz raises what should be the correct perspective for his his position, right, and the position of everyone in this covert, where he's like, look, yeah, we have no skin in this game. Grief's a dick who tried to kill us. Um, why should more... Ma- There's not many of us left. We've got bigger fish to fry. Uh, why should Mandalorians lay down their lives for those who tried to murder them and who got nothing but contempt for them and did nothing to help them? And I'm just like, going, yeah, no, absolutely. Paz is right. Yeah, uh, and and, like, because yeah. we are Mandalorians. And I just cringed. I cringed so hard. <laughs> well, here's seat. the thing. It's like, I saw it coming. I was like, he's going to say because this is the way and this is, you know, yeah. the warriors. Uh. Well, so the reason given, right, because I've seen the pushback to this, which is really funny, 
Um, never mention Little Lamplight ever again. Sorry, man. I have to do it. Trauma can never stay buried. Um, but yeah, so the reason this is all important, right? It's like people have defended this by going, like, well, you know, the way the powers defends this, right? It's like, oh, this man, I've come to respect him because he saved my son. And therefore, I, I have his back because Mandalorians look out for each other. So we need to look out for Din when he goes on this quest. I'm there being like, okay, but first of all, um, Din was not the only one who chose to help you. There were a bunch of bandos in this group who also came along, and they're not speaking in favor. So do their opinions not count? But secondly, mm. um, the requirements to save a foundling, as was described in the very last episode, is an obligation. It's not something you get brownie points for doing. It's something you, you, you have to do. It's like the keeping your helmet on rule. Uh, well, until the end of this episode, it's like the keeping your helmet on rule. It's not something you get. To, it's not something you get brownie points for carrying on doing. It's something where like you must do it, and if you don't, you get punished um, because this watch is, this cult is abusive as all hell. Um, so the fact that he saved Ragnar should factor should not factor at all into the decision about whether or not it's a good idea for Mandalorians to lay down their lives for people who aren't Mandalorians. But screw it we need the mandalorians to go there so everyone just has has this bizarre change of heart and everyone just agrees with him pretty yeah. good show it's i mean it's a masterpiece clearly we need a cw yeah, like, live action mandalorian. Yeah, I, you joke but i genuinely think a cw live action mandalorian it would be show better would be of the same quality if not better yeah because well, uh, here's the thing, right? With with give, Pat, give it to with the, uh, give it, sorry, I, I'm so sorry, Jolly. Give it to the writers of uh, Su uh, uh, Superman and Lois, and uh, you actually oh my have God. a fighting be, chance. I I could see that being actually like a decent show. Yeah. <laughs> um, Teddy, Teddy, uh, again, I was just about to come onto this, so thank you for your your comment. Um, the thing about this, right, is like this is not an intelligent, cautious, and well reasoned perspective from Paz. It's not even a perspective that's in line with his character. Even the renewed character of like, let, you know, because you're like, oh, I've got respect for Din now. I've come to respect Din as a fellow Mandalorian, where previously I kind of didn't really view him as one. And I'm like, okay, that's some character growth, I guess. That character growth does not cover him being okay with a mission to sacrifice Mandalorians' lives for non-Mandalorians, right? This, this, if, this, if anything, this yeah. is just like, oh, he'd, he'd now be happy to save, like he already grudgingly did it, but now he'd be happy to volunteer to, to, to fight for Din's life or for Grogu's life, or maybe for bo -Katan's life, but he has got no reason to give a shit about Navarro. Yeah, it was it was like one place that they lived one time, and they lived in the fucking sewers. Like, it's not a place that they have pleasant memories of, really. Um, but how... Well, well, and so if we're talking about, like, well-reasoned, um, you know, Din could have been like, hey, they also offered us attractive land if we if we were to do this, you know? Um, and we need a better place to live because fuck this place. Okay. Also, we need to move now because they know where we are now. Thanks, Tava. Like, that would be intelligent, cautious, and well-reasoned. We need to leave because Tava's found our location and this place sucks anyway. Um, and Navarro's, like, way better, guys. Trust me. Yeah, and Greek is offering us some pretty sweet and then, stuff. And then we're pretty, we're pretty much kosher, yeah. Th those are, like, yeah. well-reasoned decision-making. Um, not, oh, well, we're warriors, so... Yeah, but we don't get that reasoning, so you can't. You, I'm not. I'm not taking it in defense of the show, <laughs> because that's not the reasoning the Mandalorians themselves. So, oh fuck the way. The way needs to die in a hole. Fucking way. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> um, Where were they right, going so we, without ever knowing the way? I don't know. Well, the thing about the about that you know? uh, Mandalorians always know the way because they they've learned to read maps, so they never get lost. I was literally about to say that. <laughs> Do you know the way? <laughs> Oh, man. It just keeps on reminding me of like Catholic school. It's like this is the way, the truth, and the lights. Oh god, <laughs> yeah, no. That's well. So as a former Christian myself, I remember watching the, the first season with my grandpa, who's super Christian. Um, and they said this is the way, and he he kind of like clicked his tongue. He was like, "That's just sacrilegious." <laughs> goddamn blasphemy! Goddamn blasphemy! In this goddamn like, Star I mean, Wars show. <laughs> I feel like they're they're referring to a different way, but I guess this could also mean Jesus. Maybe these Mandalorians worship Jesus. That'd be amazing if Ma the Mandalorians pulled out little crucifixes and they're like the way of our Lord <laughs> and Savior, G Jesus Mandalore, who was died and resurrected. I'd absolutely love for it to like, yeah, yeah, for them to reveal that like Christianity, like actual Christianity, is a thing in the Star Wars universe. That'd be fucking hilarious. Find that explains. Gideon. Oh, the sheep. Uh, no, they find out about Gideon's clones. 
and um and gideon's like i'm gonna live forever and then Din's just Din's like strumming a guitar he's like you know who else had he had everlasting life <laughs> <laughs> so it's just we, we cross over mandalorian with bible man and din just travels around with bible man <laughs> oh fuck I, yes i, I just oh, love i just love the idea of like the people in this universe were like uh you know lightsabers are a thing the force is a thing they hear about jesus being able to walk on water and like holy shit this guy's the real deal well i'm just imagining like you know din is like confronting gideon and gideon's like i will rule the galaxy with my clones and then din's like well according to isaiah 1436 <laughs> <laughs> for, for it is written in yeah it is written in deuteronomy 12 23 Din pulls out the, the dark saber and starts quoting the 23rd psalm. <laughs> yeah. Just like the like all the, you know, they have that little ceremony for Ragnar at the end, and there's just like a choir of like people singing like at the Ave Maria from Batman. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, we cut back to Navarro, which is in I can't stress like this enough. It's not just in ruins. This thing looks like a like Hiroshima after the bomb fell. Yeah. Everything's gone. Everything's yeah. gone. There's no yeah. way you're repairing this anytime soon. This is well, what happens that when it takes so fucking long to get to get Mando's help. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to, to your point, Jolly, that depends on how long it's been since season two. Because apparently, you know, if it's, if it's only been like a couple months, apparently they build these things like the Amish, like they are fast. They build that city on rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> the city will be back up and running in no time. Trust me. <laughs> And yeah, anyway, so we, 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 you know, we get all these little scenes of the pirates being pirates and like, you know, they're shooting at monkeys and trees and they're drinking. Oh my god, Sheev, they're drinking in the school. Um, hell yeah, they got what they wanted. Yeah. They're drinking Fuck in the, the school. school. <laughs> oh, the nobody school. checked the school. Nobody checked the school at the, at the border. No one checked them at the border of the school. <laughs> we checked um, the alcohol at the school. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a, we, we see like a little scene of like there's, there's a couple of them hanging outside a restaurant and the guy comes out with their food and they kick the tray and like I'm just like guys, <sighs> he was serving you food. Well, so this is where I'm, you know, there's the joke, right? The joke like, oh, poor man with this tray, that's mean. But like, there is actually like a serious writing point that I want to bring up here, mm. and that is the lazy way in which you exposit these people are evil, evil. <laughs> They're bad people. They're bad man and <laughs> Yeah, just, we just cut to like Donald Trump's like, these are some bad hombres, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's weird because it's like, again, you talk about the fact that, that pirates were practical because they had uh, expenses. Of you have own. to be. Yeah. yeah. So like, that's perfectly good food that you've just knocked over for no reason. Yeah. Why, why would you do that? Like, surely, like, yeah, get, like, if they would... it, tells us, it tells us a lot about not just these characters, but about the the writing behind them and like what the people in the writing room were thinking. Yeah, it's just it's just like we need to show that the bad, the pirates are the bad guys. How can we do that as lazily as possible? You know, it's short of them like singing the song from Muppet Treasure Island, where they're all like um, the pirate life for me. Like this show, this show wouldn't have had the balls to have like one of the pirates maybe like. Maybe like grab a, a woman kicking and screaming into the into a building. Oh yeah, we don't, see, we don't see what happens. But like it's very clearly implied. Yeah, or even just like you know starting a bar brawl that like hits this guy in the face and they all just like start thumping on him because it's funny. Like you know just mm. something like that where it's like in, he's yeah. incidentally drawn in rather than we we targeted our waiter because we didn't want our canapes actually. That um, that that description that uh, she just gave, I just realized, like, oh man, even X Men Origins Wolverine had the balls to do something like that. <laughs> yeah. Also, now I, I now have that stuck in my head now. Where, like Long John Silver, like Tim Curry's Long John Silver is going to pop out next to like Pirate King Goran Shard, and they're just going <laughs> to sing that song from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Goran Shard would fit perfectly into Muppet Treasure Island. He, he looks exactly Literally, like the kind of person yeah. who belongs there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it almost, also, like, everyone it feels very out, um, out of place here, but he would fit right in in a Muppets movie. Yeah. Side note: Everyone, go watch Muppet Treasure Island because it's unironically a fucking fantastic movie, and you'll lo you'll love it. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, they're, they're kicking over Trey Man's tray, um, and then suddenly, oh my god, Mando attacks! He flies wow. over and he, he wow. yeah, with with a fucking sound effect. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> You know, you, you know what thing is, Sheev. You know what's going to happen, right? Is that like at the is it the Golden Globes that does TV, like or the Emmys? Uh, at the Emmys, geez. we're going to have the Mandalorian nominated for best sound editing, aren't we? <laughs> My God, I hope and not. I'm, 
and I'm going to slit my throat in a blind rage. Jolly, <laughs> Jolly, Jolly, just just imagine this, right? You're you're at a bar, you're hanging out after a long day of work, and then you know, just just a couple of seats down from you at the bar, you hear someone. They just got a text, and their text tone is. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know why. I thought for a second you were going to make like almost like a nine eleven joke. Or like, oh, it's like, oh, they hit the second MA. Like, <laughs> man, <laughs> no. Also, um, you, smoking and being at a bar, Southport. I don't need to be at a bar. Listen, <laughs> I'm already there. I have my booze ready and going. So, uh, do we want to talk about the action sequence of this episode? The big action sequence with the pirates. Well. I'd like to talk about the Mandalorian's combat plan overall first before we get to individual action sequences. Yes. Um, let us, let us so, do. let's talk about the scenario which the, so the Mandalorians have one drop ship and one fighter, and a, you know, a bunch of ground assault forces that they can drop from this, this drop ship. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the concern is that there is a giant cruiser or light cruiser hanging out, pointing its guns downwards at the civilian population. So your first priority, right, is rather than land a ground assault team directly underneath the guns of the giant cannon aimed at everyone's fucking head, <laughs> maybe assault maybe assault the drop ship directly, take over the ship. That way, also, by the way, you could capture a pretty nice ship, which you're going to need for, to retake Mandalore from the, the non-existent people who are there. Yeah, this um, Corsair is pretty, pretty... Well, I say that, that, and this is a problem that we have with um, this, this as well as a later episode, but, like, shields don't exist on big ships, apparently. Oh. Yeah, the shields just don't exist. No, there's hyperdrive detection, or hyperspace detection, mm. radar, it's all gone. Nothing exists. Um, so yeah, so the the real plan should have been you should have attacked the dropship, captured the dropship, and then suddenly you're the ones pointing a gun at the heads of all the pirates on the ground. That's pretty good leverage. And you now and you now have a ship, and you've captured their commander, and you haven't put yourself directly in the firing line of giant cannons. But screw it, uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to instead uh, Mando is going to draw out their dogfighters. Um, single-handedly fight off ten of them, and then Bo is going to attack the ship to distract the ship, whilst a bunch of Mandos ground assault the pirates in the town. Um, because reasons. Solid plan, uh, totally. So they just like sort of yeah, casually, yeah. They, they, they sort of just casually show that uh, this Mando is like what about as good of a pilot as Poe Dameron? Oh, he's better. Oh, Man, I mean, this point, well, Mando is one of the well, greatest pilots I've ever seen in fiction. I mean, you go back to Book of Boba Fett when he's like racing the N one through Beggar's Canyon. You know, he's he's that's the pod racing track, the the one that like no human other than Anakin could do, and only because Anakin was the fucking chosen one. Mm -hmm. But he's in a pod racing, or he's in a fucking N one starfighter that's way faster and bigger, and he's he's maneuvering through it no problem. So I have no problem believing he could just do anything in a ship. Well, this is the issue, right? Is that Mando is now the greatest pilot who's ever lived in the history of the galaxy, including Darth Vader, Hera mm -hmm. Syndulla, uh, Ahsoka Solo, Tano, Han Dameron. Solo, Poe Dameron, yeah, Kylo Wedge Ren, Dillies, fuck it. Yeah. Wedge, Luke, <laughs> none of these people come close to Mando. It's, it's like the it's, one, it's the one he, thing that he's actually good at. <laughs> this may be, uh, this may be a uh, hot, well, uh, you say that, but like, he pretty much wins every fight just because he's invincible. He has perfect armor. Yeah, he's got um, a literal plus. He's got literal plus armor, which we will talk I about would, later. I would. I hate to even use this term, uh, but would we maybe conclude that the Mandalorian is a Mary Sue? Yes, he is. Yes. <laughs> uh, I would happily. I would happily call Mando a Gary Stu at this point, or yeah. a Marty Stu, or however you want to call that. Um, he is definitively one of those now. Yeah. Um, he he manifests abilities on a dime. He, he's also a slightly weird example of that he manifests abilities on, on a dime to whatever level the writers need him to arbitrarily have. But then he'll mm -hmm. randomly lose those abilities as well, the whim of the writer, whenever they find it inconvenient. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I'll talk about that in the next episode because it's going to become relevant. But <laughs> <laughs> so for now, other than the bullshit plan, also, second note, um, why do none of these um, uh, fighters, the, the, the pirate fighters, how come none of them have uh, surface to air, uh, sorry, um, air to air missiles? Weren't those weren't those a thing in dogfighting before this? Wait, are you uh, saying yeah, air or sorry, no air to air. So like, why don't why don't their why don't their ship to ship fighters have lock on missiles? Also, we know for a fact that this Corsair ship has lock gun lock on, because Mando explicitly called it out in episode one. So where did that go? Uh, good question. For for another time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I uh, can say about that. So, yeah, I think 
the only other thing I will talk about rather because I think I'll let you do the specifics of the action scenes and I'll just chime in right but like just one thing I'd like to point out right or two things I'd like to point out the first is that the existence of the Beskar armor makes the stakes of this fight fucking meaningless because no one's in serious yeah. danger of getting hurt because they're wearing literal plot armor and then the second thing is the show keeps on trying to during this action sequence it, it tries to keep on having these things where like oh the Mandos get like penned in on all sides and like they're being cornered and I'm like they have jetpacks yeah no they're, they're like we're boxed in and I'm like fly just fly away, fly away. Fly away. Flank them from above. It's like, like, wait, like there's a gun. Wait. There's a gun turret holding them down, and rather than just fly up and disable it, they just hide behind a building. Wait a minute. They don't fly now. They, they don't, don't fly, fly now. now. Apparently. Well, and so this is here's the thing about Beskar. I'm so I wish we'd never introduced Beskar. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's literal. It's it's literal pro- plot armor. But the thing about it is that it works exactly like plot armor, which is that even when the enemy forces have it. They still get killed by bla- like regular blaster fire, lightsabers to yep. the chest. It's so fucking bizarre because they have the exact same armor that our heroes have. It's uh, but also it's variable now. But and so and we're gonna get to this in the finale and the the last two episodes specifically. We have a hero force and an enemy force, and they both have jetpacks and Beskar armor. So like, what am I supposed to make of that at this point? Who? How is any side supposed to win this? And for some reason, in a lot of instances, they keep like people keep getting like thrown off of the cliffs. Um, and I'm like, they oh, have jet, they have jetpacks. Yeah, just, just turn your <laughs> jetpack on and fly. But no, they just die. That's how they die. And it's like, uh, that's bizarre. But anyway, yeah. that's the finale. We're, we'll get to the finale. Uh, for, this for now, they're boxed in because they're being they're like surrounded. And it's like, well, yeah, but fly. Uh, but the one thing I will say is that the people uh, in the tower above that are shooting the cannon down at them, the cannon doesn't kill them because, again, Beskar is fucking Beskar. But it at least, like, if it hits a Mandalorian, it at least knocks them down, knocks them knocks them back, you know, disorients them a bit. Um, so a bit of strategy is necessary to get up there. Like, we're probably going to need to hide behind the buildings, go around to the other end, you know, um, you know why not, something. Why not, we can't why not, up there why not just... It'll- shoot us well why not you got multiple mandos right they can't shoot it all at you at once it's, it's not a it's not a rapid fire cannon so just like send five people at once and just duck, duck and weave true yeah well but so here's what the show decides to do with that uh the armorer, <laughs> uh... <laughs> the armorer walks in from from behind and she's got her stupid fucking hammer and a pair of tongs and she be- how did she get there <laughs> she I guess she just walked in from behind, which is but what like, they the should whole... have done, or just well, hang on. So that's hang on. That's possible because remember they're, they're trying to get to that central tower. That's like the the enemy HQ, right? Because that's Grief's office. Um, they've blockaded the pirates have blockaded the streets and set up ambushes. So where is she? How is she just walking in? Did she just walk past them and like morning, good morning, good morning, sir? Well, maybe she went on her way. <gasps> Sheev Southpaw. The pirates didn't check the armor at the border. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, so, these pirates, well, listen, listen. These pirates, unlike most pirates that you've seen, they never went to university for piracy. Right, of course. Yeah. They never studied piracy at university. They didn't study well, piracy at university. So here's a point that I want to make, and this is already negated by the whistling birds, but like, Beskar is not to be used as a weapon. She has Beskar hammer and, and, and uses it. And it's weird because that's a weapon. She uses it as a weapon. Yeah. But it's uh, also the the whistling birds, which will I will mention a lot in the last episode. Doesn't, the whistling doesn't she, birds. Doesn't mm-hmm. she use the the hammer and the um the tongs in the season one finale too as a weapon? Yeah, yeah. she does. Weapons. Yeah, she does. But the point is, I'm, I'm I'm highlighting a hypocrisy that better writers might have actually used uh, for character uh, writing. You know rules for thee and not for me sort of thing i'm telling you you can't use best as a weapon but i am perfectly willing to do it when the when the chips are down yeah but Even that's though never I gonna be birds. So I'm, I'm basically just saying that it happens and then moving on she takes also, out all the pirates, none of the... right? there's like five pirates in this in this tower yeah and... none of them uh none of them hear her yeah None of them hear her for some reason, even though she's like hitting them with a hammer. She pulls on one of them from the back with her tongs. She pulls on like the back of his shirt collar and <laughs> pulls him down. And the, and the hammer's oh, it's, just, it's, it's just so clown. It's just a clown universe. We live. We're living in the clown timeline. Oh, I'm so annoyed. Yeah, yeah. They, anyway, so the Mandos they they retake the, the town. Um, meanwhile. 
Goran Shard's men have all been killed in the air by by uh, Din and Bo, and his ship is now crippled because everyone is shit at their jobs. Mm, um, no shields, shields don't exist. Yeah, and there's, shields don't exist. Um, Vayne pisses off. Vayne is like, I'm out, mate. Which I'm like, how how are you leaving Vayne? Because you have a surface, you have a, you have a ship born surface fighter. That he thing doesn't, doesn't have hyperdrive. Have hyperdrive, yeah. I was like, I guess he's just gonna hide on the planet somewhere. I don't know. I guess on the rocks, and then wander into town looking shifty and whistling at some point <laughs> to, get, to get a ride. <laughs> like, he's like, hey guys, just walking like, in. Like, I, honestly, I hate working here. These guys are so weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Like yeah so he like he like settled down in the uh, in the the rock formation behind the town. Just to lay low, and then that, and then that's the place that the the Corsair was brought down and exploded. Yeah. Well, so so let's get to that bit. So some of the pirates are running away. Uh, Grief is rushing back in and surprises them, and with his one his one gun, mm -hmm. um, well, takes should, them all. We should mention because we we kind of skipped over this. Uh, Grief and a, like a handful, I would say probably like what three or four dozen citizens, I guess, who all of yeah. them are the only ones who survived. They like. Tr were able to leave the town. They just trekked out and hid in a cave while the, the like waiting for the new Republic to show up. Um, so they, they're not in the town. Now that the pirates are being driven out of the town, they're at the entrance and boom, it's grief and all the citizens standing there blocking them from leaving and they're pointing guns at them. Yep. Uh, at which point Gorian Shard is like, everything is lost. I'm going to uh, shoot, shoot down, which I didn't think to do earlier for some reason. I use my, my ship to, sh to shoot down at everyone on the ground I don't like. Um, at which point, Mando and Bo combine to take out Goran Shard's ship, um, which explodes and then, like, by sheer bloody luck, falls away from the town, even though it's hovering directly over the town, onto a, a nice piece of rock where it explodes, uh, thereby getting rid yeah, of Goran Shard. You would uh, you yeah. think that if Gorian Shard, if he's willing to, like, shoot at the, at the town's people from... Um, from his ship, right? And he realizes that he's kind of lost. You would mm -hmm. think that once his ship is taking that much damage, he would be steering his ship towards the town. Yeah, if I'm going down, you guys are going yeah. down with me. Fuck you guys. Also, you know. on a secondary note, why is Gorian Shaw the kind of person who's willing to go down and die? And you think a pirate, being a pirate captain, you have to be fairly pragmatic, right? I can't imagine Hondo just being like, I'm going down with my ship. He'd have been like, I surrender. Yeah, yeah I, I fuck it, I've lost, I'm, I'm surrendering. So I'm I would be okay with the concept of an honorable pirate captain, but like we haven't developed this character at all. We don't know anything. Well, that's the thing. There's, there's there's nothing about him for me to conclude that this is a reasonable thing for him to do. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I have to go on is that he's a pirate, and this is not how most pirates would act. It's not it's how any of the pirates to, uh, in his employee act. They just they fuck. They're dicks yeah. to people for no reason, actually. So, well, but like even even, even the pirates in his employee, because like if you're gonna play up to the stereotype of like, oh, these are cowardly evil pricks like well Vane is cowardly and pissed off right because he knew his life was in danger so surely gore and shard have been like i surrender so his yeah. i don't know every, everything that we've been supplied with which isn't much but what we have been supplied with all flies in the face of the idea that this is a character who'd be willing to go down fighting doesn't um i mean yeah doesn't um gory and shard get like pissed when like one of his pirates like just bails well okay i i, I know we no were no joe no <laughs> So no, he would have just been captured, you know, and probably put in like a New Republic prison or something. Well, not like even. He'd have been on to... go back to the Empire. Not the even. Empire... He'd have been stuck in a Navarro jail, right? Because they're not affiliated yeah. with the New Republic. The Empire is not in power right now. Yeah. Well, so they're they're, yes. they're hanging around in secret. They're, they're they're. I'm sure they've got some kind of mega weapon, super weapon that they're going to unleash at some point. Yeah, you know, it's, it's called Star Killer. It's called Star Killer Base. <laughs> no, no, no. Mando season four is going to reveal that there is a third Death Star that's not Star Killer. Star uh, Killer is the fourth Death Star. Oh, you fucking know that Dave Filoni movie they announced alongside the new Ray movie and the Dawn of the Jedi. It'll be the, yeah. Compared to the Empire, you fucking know it's going to be called that. Yeah, th we'll have the the, the Thrawn Death Star, the Thrawn Star. Oh God, the Chiss Star. Yeah. Anyway, uh, just to address Joe's point again, there, like, like, oh, it's in character for him. It's like, on what are, on it? what basis are you? Yeah, well, hang on. So, on what are, on what are you basing that assumption? Like, uh, what character? On you show character, me where the show is. What? Yeah, you show me where this show has characterized him at all as someone who is scared of the Empire. Because as far as we know, no, 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 he doesn't even know the off. Empire. Ex I'll cut you off. Uh, you you cite me a point where this show has characterized him. Yeah, that's, at it. All. that's all you had to say. <laughs> 
Well, but on top of that, because like the whole thing about like him being working for Gideon, right? I've already pointed out why that's clearly been shoehorned in and not, and and is bullshit. Because at no point does Gorin ever mention that he's working with the Empire. There's nothing that he does that hints that he's working with the Empire. And the fact that he is apparently working with the Empire doesn't actually make a lick of damn sense and doesn't no, factor into that. Gideon's plan at all. Yeah, it doesn't factor into Gideon's plan. It doesn't affect the overall story. It's just something that happened, I guess. Well, it's literally, they just dropped the line in to try and link the two events because they, they for some reason, felt they had to be connected to give Tabor's conspiracy theory credence. I'm so fucking tired of the Empire as a as an overarching, like, villain threat. Like, can we please? please yeah, there like, are other villains. A pirate organization? Like, a whole a whole syndicate of pirates, even, like, going after these independent worlds and trying to extort them and the Mandalorians having to deal with that. Like, that would be so much more interesting than anything they did this season. And he squandered yep, it. By, by a country mile. The anyway, so yeah. The, it. Goran, pirate, ex-Pirate King Goran Charles oh, is dead. He'll, he'll always be um, a Pirate King. <laughs> uh, thanks for introducing that character. He was totally worth it. Um, operative operative word being character. And... Yeah. Greek, so, uh, the man does laugh. To go Sorry, to go back to what that to what we were talking about at the beginning of this, someone who the, the person who said like, "Oh, she even jolly got what they wanted." The Mandalorian <laughs> and, the, and the pirates were like, um, "No, we did not get what we no. wanted." No, we did not. We um, so we did in the we did in the loosest possible sense in terms of like if you know, in the vaguest possible description of the pirates and the Mando plot got conjoined. I got what I wanted. Well, it's like I, I was of... watching. I was watching the original trilogy, and I was like, "Man, I can't wait for Luke and Vader to, you know, to meet up and fight." And then when they do finally, uh, Vader just starts raw dogging him from behind, and 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 everyone's it's... like, "Well, I mean, they got I, she got what he wanted," and I'm like, "Well, I get yeah. kind of, I guess." If you, you know, I went, I went into a bar. Term. You know, I went into a bar and I ordered a drink, and they just served me excrement in a glass, and I'm like, "Well, I guess it's technically kind of I got a drink." Yeah, it's like you got what you wanted, Jolly. <laughs> so, uh, right, there's several things about this. So the first thing is that this pirate plot went nowhere. The second thing is the Mando plot about them going to Navarro to, to, you know, as part of their search for a home world. I'm about to address why that's about to be undone in a split second. <laughs> um, so yeah, grief comes out and he's like, "Thanks, Mandos, for all the help. I, I cede to you this land. You will always be our friends. You will always be welcome on Navarro, not in hiding, but in the open. You get everything you wanted. You get to raise your foundlings here. Everything's kosher. We're all cool, and you know we're, we're all sunshine and rainbows now. The Mandos are all really happy because, like, yeah, we got a home now. It's great, cool. We don't have to hide, and like, it's all nice and jolly. Uh, no pun intended. And then it's very sheep. then it's very sheep, <laughs> and then." <laughs> Then, uh, you know, grief thanks Mando, everyone's having a good time, everyone's celebrating, and then the armor is like, uh, Bo, I want you to come talk to me down in, down in the old sewers where we had our old forge. Mm -hmm. So she goes down there, and there's a really funny bit where they're walking down the stairs where it's really clear the actors can't see where the hell they're going because of the helmets. <laughs> so, so they're walking super, super awkwardly, which is really funny. Anyway, they go to the forge, and we get one of the most stilted and drawn out and nonsensical bits of di metaphorical dialogue. It's, oh, it's right up there. It's right up there with the boat rock thing from Lord of the Rings: Rings of Power. No, where, like the, 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 the armor is like, ah, oh, this used to be our forge, and both like, cool story, bro. Town again with dragons and shit. And, <laughs> and the armor is like, yes, you know, there used to be a great forge on Mandalore. And both like, yeah, I know, I lady, I, I, I was the crown princess of Mandalore. I do remember. Mm. And like, then the other's like, so in there, like, fuck, I, I <laughs> yeah. fucking ruled there, Jesus. And then the armor is like, so that forge was ornate. This forge was simple. Forges are good. These were both, both forges. The same purpose. And I'm just like, yeah, oh wow, oh, this is like... stilted. <laughs> it's like um, it's, you know, quite obviously the point they're going for here is like the the armor is like, oh well. The Watch and the other Mandalorians, we may not all be the same, but we ultimately serve the same goal, which, fuck off, no you don't, no, and the no, show's attempt to convince me, yeah, oh, the show's attempt to convince me they do is nonsense. You need to, you need to, st like, define what the way is and what that entails, because it's been three seasons and I still don't know. Um, yeah, also, she concentrates herself, right, she's like, oh, we both serve the same purpose, and then she immediately says, oh, the other Mandalorians do not walk the way, that's wrong, we should all walk the way. <laughs> so you don't all serve the same purpose, you want them to serve your purpose. It's so bizarre. Well, this whole scene. Okay, so the big stuff. She tells Bo 
to take off her helmet. Nah. And she says, do you question my station? And so then Bo-Katan takes off her helmet. You know, she says, this is the way. Let's let's jot that down. Bo-Katan is fully into this cult. Uh, uh, um, and, and she's like, so we're going to, you, you've walked both ways. And you can be the person to you, unite both both sides of this of this Mandalorian culture. Uh, you can bring us together and we're going to retake Mandalore. Um, from from who? From who? Uh, well, from the who do you think is there? That is somewhat toxic. Because here's the thing, right? This this uh, this is like this, I think the writer has allowed their mess knowledge to bleed in, right? Because they keep on they keep on saying like we need to get all these guys back together to, to retake Mandalore, and I'm like, well, as far as you know, Mandalore's abandoned. Now yeah. we know, having watched the series, that there is an Imperial base there, which we'll get to how that got there and how it's amazing that Bo never noticed it before, <laughs> but like. They don't know that. So who do they think they're taking it from? Yeah. yeah, that's part one. And then part two, and this is the more egregious bit, is like, yeah, the removal of the helmet. So this rule, this uh, rule that has, that has defined how this character, uh, how Din was characterized, how Pedro Pascal could or could not be available, has by all accounts left Pedro Pascal extremely frustrated with his ability to act on the show because he can't ever show his bloody face. Yep. All of this decision-making the entire apostate storyline, the through line of that, meaningless. Absolute drivel. It turns out that the armorer could literally have just made an exception whenever she fucking wanted. Yeah, no, apparently she can. Um, I, I don't know what to make. I literally don't know what to make of this because it's kind of like with Gory and Shard. She isn't a character, uh, the armorer, I mean. So, like, I don't know if this goes... Like, I don't know what she's thinking, right? I don't know why she's come to this decision. I don't know you know, like what, to what end this is supposed to serve. Uh, she's just decided to go against this one rule, this, this one single rule that has defined this entire religion so far, uh, because I, I guess she's allowed to, she has that authority. Um, it, because Bo-Katan saw a mythosaur, I guess. I, she has yeah. no way of proving that she has not proven that she only said that it happened. And like we we I I don't know I feel like we need to confirm that before we we abandon our entire way of belief. Well, hang on. So there's two things here. So the first thing is that as a cult, the only concrete information we've ever gotten on them, other than the foundling importance, is like we've had two beliefs: the foundling importance and the helmet. That's it. That's all we've gotten from them. Um, and now one of them is bullshit. It's acknowledged, self-acknowledged to be bullshit. The second thing here is like if you're gonna go down the route of being like, oh well, maybe this is realistic cult behavior. And maybe they're trying to characterize the armor as someone who's a hypocrite and just out for her own ends. The problem I'm is, like, I already said they, this, like they didn't yeah. actually develop that at all. That's not that's not the characterization we've gotten. We've gotten no characterization for her. So at the moment, the cult and the, and the series will end on this note. The cult is presented as being completely in the rights. Yeah, my my uh, my brother who you know likes the Mandalorian, uh, you know, uh. liked liked Kenobi. Um, he was uh. he was. Really, uh, he was really <laughs> when, Sorry, when, when, we were, when we were talking when we were talking about this. <laughs> when we were talking about this and and Mando season three came up, you know, he was like, Oh yeah, they're totally going to I mean, they're obviously headed in the direction of saying that the cult is bad. Like, come what on. Do you think <laughs> we went into the season expecting that because that was the only thing that made sense. We were like, I don't know why yeah. it, took you, it took you to season three to do this, but at least you're finally doing it. Oh, you it's, didn't even do no, it. Okay. It, no, we're not. It's, it's standard uh, um, um, bait and switch, right? Mm. That's how it is in storytelling usually. Yeah, they couldn't even go for the switch. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> it's really... I mean, even things like the characterization of the other members of this cult, right? Because other than Paz Vizsla being like, oh, she's not a Mandalorian, she's removed her helmet. And then the was like, no, it's cool. And then Paz shuts up. Given, given Paz's characterization as like as as fanatic, if not more fanatic than the armorer, you'd think he'd have something to say about that, right? Like maybe he'd even start questioning the armorer's authority in a way that yeah. Axe started questioning Bose. And again, these aren't characters, but you'd think at least a few of the children of the watch would be like, what the fuck? Like we you you yeah. you, you, you could have allowed us to do this the whole time? What the hell? Yeah. Um, I wanna take a also, shower, goddammit. I wanna kiss my wife. Just... Let's just address the mythosaur thing as well. Someone's like, oh, it's because she saw a mythosaur, therefore she gets special privileges. Which is funny like, because she actually saw that while she was uh, redeemed, quote-unquote. She was in the water. 
Yeah. And the second thing, though, is like, also, that's never been established as a rule. That, like, the show doesn't say because she saw a Mythosaur, she has to break the rules. And then, by the way, if, if that was the rule, that rule would be complete horseshit. Um, mm-hmm. But that's not even a rule that has been established. So you're pulling that out of your ass. Like, not, like, this is not me offending you, Diego. This is me saying, like, to fans who are making the Mythosaur defense, you, I don't know where you're getting that from. Like, explain to me where you pulled that information from. Because it's not I in the know. show. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, fuck. Uh, so, yeah, but, like, Bo can unite both people because she walks both ways, which I really, I really hope is a metaphor that she's bisexual. <laughs> it turns out if you if you walk the way you're gay and if you walk both ways you're not just bisexual um so if you yeah, walk neither way you're straight this is the Bo, gay Bo, yeah <laughs> Bo sings with both choirs she she she's got a foot in both camps she pisses she off both ways yeah she swings so, both ways there's yeah. going to be so much to say about Bo Katan as a character, and I cannot wait to get into it. Oh that. my God, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll move on. Because now we get to talk about <laughs> Gideon. The worst. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. The Gideon. I keep forgetting that this is in this. Yeah, the Gideon scene. Shit. Yeah, that's the, they just tacked this on to the tail end of the episode. Um, Holy shit. Martin Siva finds. Uh, well, first of all, so how does he find this shuttle? Because he comes upon I a shuttle. I don't know. In the middle of space, just floating adrift. And so, he's like, hey, what's, so, what's this? Everyone, space. The thing, the thing you have to understand about space, right? Is space is big, it's really big. Huge. It's, it's you kind of big. You won't believe how unimaginably huge it is. Like, you may think it's a long way down to the road for peanuts, but that's just nothing to space. Like, <laughs> you, like, like, to put it another way, right? Like, if I picked a random, like, if I went out uh, outside of Earth's atmosphere and I just pointed in any random direction and, like, went that way, the chances of me ever hitting anything ever in the whole universe is almost nil. Yep. Like space is unfathomably large. Well, so like the best <laughs> face assumption I can make is that he was specifically looking for Gideon's ship and tracked its trajectory. But even then, at the at the at the speed he was going, like you never would have found it. I'm sorry. Wouldn't the ship well, that's also, a- well, also, also, um, so wouldn't the ship have like sort of drifted off in an entirely different direction from where it was initially headed after the attack? You'd think, yeah, it would be drifting yeah. through space, certainly. Yeah. Like, like, so because it's so, um, its thrusters uh, were are, are definitely disabled at, at some point, but those thrusters it's were still- directing that ship towards something before <laughs> they got abruptly. <laughs> destroyed well so well, Southport, this ties into a point that we've made before and i'm going to do again in the next episode and that is in this universe momentum does not exist <laughs> there is there is no momentum in the star wars universe also on top of that space doesn't move in no the star wars universe. no jolly, stars that, don't, that's, stars that, don't move no, planets no, don't jolly, move jolly that's bullshit there is momentum remember in the last jedi when that one ship loses fuel it actually starts falling backwards Oh yeah, the only thing that's what happened, right? Those bombs in the in the in the bombs and the bombers in the Last Jedi. The reason that those bombs fall is that they've stored up all the momentum in the in the universe. That's why no one else has any. It's a precious resource that only they have. <laughs> they were mining. They mined momentum in the minds of of, of you know Mandalore. This is this is not just any this is not just any momentum. This is Mandalorian Beskar the, momentum. The the defense for the bombs being able to fall through space, being momentum, time. which is like. That's actually a credible defense, right? Just the, the fact that those bombs would have momentum, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah so like, it, they'd have to be launched by like probably a projectile of some sort, or a rail, yeah, a rail system or a gun, so, yeah, some magnetized system, something like that. Right. So it's like a, a credible defense for that, like for that one bit in the last Jedi. Is like, well, that's being completely contradicted here now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah the, he, sorry, he someone's. On- Wait, hang on, sorry, someone's raised a thing. Someone's like, oh, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka also tracked, I uh, imagine that's meant to be tracked, not tracked, uh, tracked Mortis. And I'm like, did. no, they didn't. They tracked they were, a signal that was... found them. Well, yeah, they, yeah. They, there was like a signal that hasn't been used by the Jedi Order in 2,000 years that they that they, the Jedi picked up and sent them out to investigate. Yeah, and it was pinging continuous... T- <laughs> going, go, ah. So... Signals, digital signals, or like, you know, whatever the Star Wars equivalent of a digital signal is, right? But like computer signals, they are not like messages in a bottle. It's not like tying a note to an arrow. It's not like you fired it off once and it's done thing. Those things repeat on a loop. They cycle. So like, that allows you to 
to continuously pinpoint the location of the thing sending out the signal because it's continuously transmitting. So it's, even if it's moving, you can track its movement. Mm. Um, that is very different from there is a derelict ship that is not sending out any signals that is about six by seven meters across, if that, floating in the vastness of a space of a whole solar system. You know, that's got momentum that's carried it off course way away from where it used to be in ways you can't predict. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, but the point is he he happens upon this shuttle somehow. Um, Convenience! Yep. Yeah. And it, it's the it's the ship that was that was carrying Muff Gideon to trial. Now, before we go any further, just a quick question: Where was this trial supposed to be held? Because I'm assuming it'd be uh, you know, they, in the prequels. They mentioned the courts twice in uh, *Phantom Menace* and in *Revenge of the Sith*, but I don't know the, if they ever say that the courts are on Coruscant. I imagine they must be right. You'd assume so. Uh, I mean, regardless. Wherever the courts are, there's going to be New Republic representatives and delegates that are there uh, awaiting his re uh, arrival. And if he does not arrive, they're going to call the New Republic. They're going to call Mon Mothma. They're going to call Leia. They're going to call Admiral Akbar. They're going to be like, hey, well, they, what the fuck? They are the New Republic. Well, yeah, right? but like, they're, going to, they're going to notify Coruscant is my point. The New Republic would yeah. know that he escaped. It wouldn't be a fucking rumor. Uh, are we trying to say that they cover, they're they covering this up? That he well, so yeah, so... They, I think that is what they're going for, because in this scene, when Tabor's talking on the radio to the other pilot, the pilot's like, oh, um, the details are classified. And I'm like, so the New Republic is covering up that they've lost Moff Gideon. And I'm like, why? Oh, that's so much worse. What is, than that they just don't what is the reason? So like, there's, no, there's no good reason for this. It's so not, yeah, it's so nonsensical that, like, somehow the, the New Republic doesn't know that they lost Gideon. You would want, they know okay. that would that would send up so many red flags. You would want like all hands on deck trying to find him. Well, so yeah. like so this creates is kind of a similar issue to um the thing with I'm so sorry. Um the serum in in Civil War at the beginning, right? When uh uh Howard Stark um is transporting it, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so who has he told he is transporting the serum to at the Pentagon? Is it someone it like it, do only people who are affiliated with Hydra know about this? And if that's the case, why why send the, the Winter Soldier after him rather than just let him hand the serum straight to them? Um, if someone outside of Hydra um, knows that he's transporting serum, and then when his car is found, the serum isn't there because Bucky stole it, that's also going to be a huge red flag. It's like, there's no way around this. Um, it's incredibly stupid. Um, and yeah. for a similar reason... We have this now. It's like, how the fuck does the New Republic not know that Gideon never reached his location? His, his, his location. Again, so let's let's and try and draw a real world. Covering this up. Let's try and draw a real world example, right? So, like, obviously, because after World War II happened, we had the Nuremberg trials to try top-ranking Nazis for war crimes, which is presumably what Gideon was on his way to, right? The equivalent. Yeah. Right. So, you know, when we had you know, the, the head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, in custody, a man who's in Hitler's inner circle. And responsible for countless atrocities, right? Which we did. We had him in custody. If he had suddenly vanished, like if the GP was being transported and just vanished <laughs> on road, do you really think the Allies would have been like, "Oh, we're classifying that and not telling anyone"? Or do you think it would have been like one of the most well publicized and international manhunts of all time? Yeah, no. Uh, there would have been a like his face would have been on every single newspaper, every single wanted poster. He would be the Winter Soldier in Civil War. They they, they would have been like all hands on deck. We need to get this guy right now. Yeah. yeah, but hey, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's literally what happened when um, when Himmler disappeared, right? Because Himmler was captured trying to escape. But like, mm -hmm. we, every, every soldier between like London and Berlin had a picture, had his picture, had, you know, knew his name, was on the lookout for him. Everyone knew he'd escaped. Well, like, well apparently, that's why he got caught. Have, apparently, when you're sending your soldiers out to find people, and we know this from Kenobi, thank God, when you're sending your soldiers out to find people, you don't give them a name or a description or a picture of their face to go off of. You just say, hey, there's a Jedi uh -huh. on, this, on one of these planets uh, well, beyond the lookout. There's a, it's, there's a John Carlo Esposito. It's the same, <laughs> it's the same uh, strategy that uh, the CIA uses in Civil War. They, don't, they, don't, they make sure that you don't have a picture of the doctor that's coming to interview the Winter Soldier. Oh, no. I... The no, she doesn't. How on earth does she have that authority? How would she have this oh. much power? She's an expert. No, so, so, She's at, in the at this point, program. yeah. At this point, Kane isn't just like a person under watch, or even like a person who's been mildly accepted. At this point, you're you're giving Kane chancellor levels of power. Yeah, I was gonna say you may as well elect her chancellor at this point, guys. She's already. Got you what, all what are we doing?
she, if she has the power to classify missions, like remember, she's working as the assistant in the requisitions office. We yeah. know that's what she's doing. You know, it's crazy. She does not that, have the power to classify this. You know, it's crazy is that if they did put out an APB on on uh, Gideon, he probably still would have evaded detection. And you want to know why? Because he actually did something that Bucky. He shaved Didn't his mustache. Do. He shaved his mustache. He changed his appearance. <laughs> he changed his appearance. Oh, no, it's, it's so much. South it's so much. Bit. <laughs> South Forest is so much worse than that now because now that we have the introduction of the Gideon clones, we could just bring him back forever. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, uh, I mean, they could have just released a Gideon clone to be captured. Yeah. Oh, did you guys, honest, did you guys honestly, why see? didn't they? That would have been a smart idea. Yeah. But did you guys yeah. see the theory that because the Gideon clones were invented? Or were introduced in this episode. That actually, the one we were we were fighting in the in the finale was not the real Gideon. He's still out there somewhere. Well, then why didn't this one have the Force? Good question. Uh, well, did he did he say that he perfected it, or just that he was getting close to it? No, he said he, he said he perfected. That's it. actually going to factor. Force. That's gonna that's that's gonna factor into his decision making. We're we're step, we're confirming that that his clones do have the Force. Yeah, they do. They definitively okay. do. Um, cause it, the way he said it made me think that he hadn't quite, uh, cracked that yet. And that Pershing's research was gone so that he, he you know, made her setback, uh, which is why I found it weird that he kept trying to kill Grogu <clears throat> since, you know, you, you would assume he'd still need him. So, no, I think it's pretty, it's, it's pretty clear that the clones and the tanks have the force. Okay. So I just love that you immediately knew where I was going with with the bus stop. <laughs> well, because I was yeah. going to make that joke too. I was just waiting for the moment. <laughs> no, 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 joke, 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 jo jo no. You can't have this. And like, oh, like she did. She, cl she, what? Well, she classified a document through espionage, and what? No one noticed. Like, I'm sorry. How? Like, just, just think through what you're saying there, right? That's a bit like going like, oh, well, I just, you know, I, I walked into MI6 one day by wearing a false mustache. And I went into the records office and I classified the existence of, I don't know, Julian Assange. Um, and no one noticed. Guys, you don't you don't realize that in the show, uh, Gideon's character, he's very close friends with a guy uh, played by Rockman Dunbar, who's a higher up in the, in the, uh, in the New Republic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the blue wall of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <sighs> Oh, God. But so, okay, so getting back to the episode, Teva is, yeah. sends like a little drone into the shuttle and he's looking at uh, all the new Which, uh, copies are dead. I, I guess there's a question here as to is this a new capacity that these droids have or is this something they've always been able to do? Because I, I can think of a few occasions that. where that would have been. Well, yeah, because I can think of a few occasions where that would have been useful, right? Can you name some? Well, just any time you had to go around a corner where you thought Imperials might be hiding there. Um, so I guess the idea would be, uh, sneak, sneaking around the Death Star for, 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 as an example. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we've, we've always known that R2 had the little sensor thing, but just not that it can detach and fly into a ship and do like recon basically. Also, why anyway, does he need to do that when he can fly himself? I guess to get into the ship, get into the compartments. I don't know. Their mechanics, they can cut their way in. Well, so anyway, he finds the dead bodies and he <laughs> finds a piece of Beskar alloy like embedded into the walls. Oh, I have so many questions about this. Yeah, so it's like, oh, the Mandalorians broke him out. And that's like the big cliffhanger we end episode five on. Honestly, that would have been more interesting if that had been true. But like, but yeah, it would have also been more interesting if this was followed up and if maybe the Mandalorians were seen yeah. as a the Republic because of this. But yeah, no. particularly given the spies that never materialized. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, there's two things to mention about this. The first is, at no point does anyone consider the possibility that the Mandalorians might be being framed. That's never brought up as a potential possibility, which is something I would yeah. at least consider. Because the, the second the thing is... It's not like Mandalorians are the only ones that are physically capable of using Beskar. <laughs> well, yeah, we and also like the he, Empire was mining Beskar. Though they have, they have yeah. plenty of it somewhere. Also, if, even if it was the Mandalorians, the overwhelming likelihood is that it was a group of mercenary Mandalorians, right? But it's, anyway, putting that aside, this, there is a, there's a shard of Beskar on the wall. So I want to just lay this out. There is a shard, a broken off piece of the indestructible Beskar armor <laughs> embedded in the wall. What? How did that happen? Yeah, I'm sorry. Did, did one of the guards in this prison ship just have like the Fat Man nuclear launcher from, from Fallout? <laughs> What the that's hell? Actually, that's actually what killed most of the crew members, don't you know? Yeah. 
they, they, they were attacked by the two worms. Worm troopers, yeah. <laughs> the, two, yeah, yeah. The, two worms, yeah the two worms broke in with their weapons. And the one of the one of two worms literally just bit off the piece. Their their jaws are just that strong. Oh shit, Mavica's uh, here. Oh hey, hey Mavica. He is correct. She talks videos are awful. I whine about the show in, uh, or movie in, in less than ten minutes. Oh my <laughs> god. Steve, are, are you really sure that you don't want to like do a stream with me and Jolly Chap and Mavica talking about Shazam too? <laughs> I, I guess I would. I, I don't want to think about that movie ever. So, so, so for, I don't. Even, I don't even want to watch this damn movie, and I'm being dragged into it. <laughs> oh, you're not escaping this. I had to sit through it. So, so no, do you. guys. Just, just, no. just so you're aware. Just so you're aware. So, Mavica and Shiva and I go into a watch party, which Jolly was supposed to be there. We fucking chickened out. Um, I had work. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's not a valid excuse. You could have called out. You could have called in sick. Yeah. You can, no, you get to take paid sick days, right? You could have. You could I have do, yeah. You could have liked having a stroke, yeah, British man. Um, so we <laughs> we we, uh, we go into a watch party now. In this watch party, which Mavicate uh, he recorded and it should be up on YouTube in a couple months. Um, I am the only person in this watch party who has seen the movie, and I know what's coming. And I I told them I told them ahead of time. I was like, this is this is on par with Kenobi. This is worse than Quantumania. And they didn't believe me. They both saw Quantumania. They didn't believe me. Forty five minutes in. 45 minutes in, they change their minds. It th this movie, like I I I, I was bad. so I was so amused watching Sheev's brain just like shatter. Like <laughs> just like every single So so Sheev, did, did you enjoy the omniscient pen? Oh fuck, stop stop bringing up the pen, please. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that, that's the end of that's the end of the first episode of the four we're covering. <laughs> Yeah, Jolly, we did it again where it took us two hours to get through one episode. We did this in the last oh, week. Well. We, gotta, we gotta pick up the pace. Yeah, so... Now, just, you've, got, now you've got the worst episode to go for. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, so no. gen general general thoughts about the quality of, of episode five, everyone. Just oh, ten. <laughs> I, I'm mad over a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think oh, I'm going to comfortably put this as like... This, I think... This, in my opinion, this is the second worst episode in the entire season. Then the worst yeah. being the next one we're going to be hovering. Well, this is like a solid one point eight out of ten. There's like a block of episodes there, four through six, that are genuinely like a three way tie for me in terms of which is the worst. Yeah, they're all really horrendous. They're they're just so bad. <laughs> they're they're all they're also hovering around the one point five to one you know to, to two point yeah. one mark. It's, it's... Yeah. Um, oh, Jack Black presents the Mandalorian. Yes, that's what that's what we're. I have plenty to say about Jack Black and Lizzo being <laughs> in the next episode. It's so Let's, sad because I just saw the Super Mario Brothers movie where Jack Black is fabulous. Yeah. Well, one oh, thing yeah. I was gonna, well, one thing I was going to bring up was like uh, watching the unbearable weight of massive talent, like what, like during the Mandalorian as it was coming out. Uh, it took me so long to even remember that Pedro Pascal, like as I'm watching him in this movie. I was like, uh, I, uh, like halfway through the movie, I was like, oh, that's, I just remember that's like the Mandalorian. I forgot because he's actually acting. So here's the thing, right? It's funny that you both brought up those two examples because those are the two examples I want to make a comparison to when we get to Lizzo and Jack Black. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's something I want to say about the nature of celebrity cameos and how they're handled. Um, that is, those two examples are really, really relevant. Peaches, 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 <laughs> peaches. <laughs> <laughs> this is my also this will be my moment for uh even though i haven't seen the movie this will be my simping for anya taylor joy moment of the fact that she turned up to the premiere in a in a peach driving jumpsuit mm -hmm. what a fucking <laughs> legend <laughs> uh, oh man just just uh you know if she was uh if that was brie larson you know that the phantom menace would just be all over that shit hey joe thank you for the super chat let's hear what you well, have to say yeah thank you very um, much joe I don't know. I agree with you guys, but I do respect you guys a lot. Uh, but you're, but buy, buy yourself something fun like a Grand Inquisitor body pillow and split the money fairly. <laughs> uh, Will, uh, well, thank th you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, and like, like I said, hopefully we will have a chance to talk to you at some point because I am genuinely interested in hearing you. Like, I, I, we're ragging on you as a slight joke here, but like, yeah, honestly, well, honestly, I am, I am genuinely interested in, in getting pushed back to to our positions. I would be genuinely interested in seeing if anyone can muster a good defense. Mm. You know, one thing I've I've considered before in the past is like getting a bunch of different people who um, 
uh, who like argue like nag me constantly with like the worst arguments and getting them into a call and just because the thing is i'm so i i have so many people like script trooper and qui-gon's ponytail and dark thor who are like all mm -hmm. on polar opposite sides of one another and i want to get them into a call and have them argue with each other while i just sit back and watch so so basically she you essentially want to let a bunch of like mad dish, mad chickens loose in a ring and watch them kill each other yeah pretty and much like, i don't know she that sounds uncomfortably like a blood sport and whilst <laughs> i whilst i applaud the sentiment i feel like like legality might might come against us there i've been i've been thinking of like getting nine people who are like uh, fans of EFAP to get into a call with me and argue with me about Terriers after the video's up. Just so I just like, I just got the references. Just like, I'll just do a fucking 1v9. <sighs> uh, so, Sheev, she, yeah. do, do you want to do the walkthrough of the next episode? And I can cry at various points. <laughs> so... All right, let's do this. Let's fucking do it. Uh, let me pull. If it's, if it's me talking, yeah, because it's me talking about this, I'm just gonna start yelling into the bike like well, a demented so you person. Think I won't. Th I, I, I'm gonna preface <laughs> this, guys. This is the one episode that. So okay, so for every other episode, I was either laughing because it was hilarious, or I was just sitting in complete and utter dismissal and dismay. Uh, and just resigned to this show being complete shit. This is the one and only episode of this season that actively pissed me off while I was watching it. And I'm, we're going to get to why, but there are so many different reasons to attribute to that. Um, so let's just jump right the fuck in, shall we? Oh, God. We start off with the Mandalorian group that used to work for Bo-Katan having been hired to track down a Corrin pirate captain named Shuggath for running away with the son of a Mon Calamari viceroy. Um, just I guess general thoughts on this on this opening scene. It's fine. Um, I actually found the the whole idea interesting. Like, I want to see more about this this like star crossed lovers Romeo and Juliet with the with the Mon Calamari and Cor, and that would be so much more interesting than the episode we actually got. But also, uh, I'm gonna. It almost, it almost felt like it was played for laughs entirely. Like, oh, it's yeah. just so bizarre that there's like this. <laughs> Which I wasn't thing, happy right? about, but like conceptually, I liked it. Yeah, so I, I was like, conceptually, I agree with you, but I was very much because they were playing it very clearly for laughs, but, but very badly. I ended mm -hmm. up, and this will be the only time I ever say this, I ended up agreeing with Axe Woes. I was just, I was sitting there being like, God, this is cringe. Like, <laughs> please let this be uh, over. Jesus Christ. But yeah, so Axe Woes and the Mandalorians are back. If you guys don't remember, Beginning of season three, we found out that apparently she like they just abandoned Bo Katan and she allowed that to happen. They took off with her fleet and she she resigned herself to go sit in a castle and live out her days doing literally nothing. Um, this is what they've been doing. They've been doing mercenary work, um, you know, guns for hire, that sort of thing, uh, which is all fine and good. They they retake this this Mon Calamari um, because that's their job. They have a contract. Uh, one line specifically that's worth mentioning is when Axe Wove says that they're loyal. Like, like the, he describes them <laughs> as loyal. And it's just so funny to listen to when you realize what they did to Bo-Katan. <laughs> yeah, they are selectively loyal. Let's just say that. They're loyal well, uh, until they don't want to anymore, which is, you know, <laughs> is loyalty that's worth fuck all, but all well, right. Well, you see, this is the show clearly trying to do some character work of Axe Wove's being a hypocrite. That's that's yeah. definitely what they're going for. That would yeah, be, that'll definitely that would be the payoff, wouldn't it? Great setup for the payoff that happens. Yeah, you know, especially because like you know, everyone was everyone was convinced that Axe Woes was supposed to spy. Uh, you know, he's he's definitely a bit of a shady character. Maybe there's gonna be something there about you know how he's not entirely trustworthy and. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a nitpick that I had, but I wanted to bring up uh, in this scene as well as an earlier scene in a in uh, episode two, I think. Uh, this Mon Calamari character, who's the son of a viceroy, is referred to as Prince. And earlier in episode two, uh, Bogotan said that she used to be like the princess of Mandalore. Uh, and both of, I, 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 I guess I just want to understand like how that works. Like, because we know that Satine ended up being a duchess. So, like, she went from princess to duchess. Is that like a thing that actually happens? Or is well, it Star Wars? so there is. There is something for this, right? So, like, for example, there are countries in Europe, like Luxembourg is one, right, where the ruler is, the, is a, called a Grand Duke rather than a king, but his children are still called Prince and Princess. Okay. 
So that this is a thing that can happen. Well, it's just a genuine question I had because I noticed it in episode two and then I noticed it again in this in this scene. Yeah. Uh, it's a thing that can it's a thing that can happen. It's rare. Um, but it's it's definitely something that can happen. It's rare but possible. Okay. Yeah. It's rare but possible. Uh, I do I do have a genuine like overall question about the again as a writer to, uh, the, the choice to make the scene right the, to put the scene here which is that narratively what does this scene accomplish I guess it's, it's only here to establish mean, like what these guys have been up to they just want money but we already knew that because you yeah, you remember knew like that, but, yeah yeah so that, that's my point right so like we have a, you know because the thing is this all costs money to make this scene right like all these costumes all these sets all these you know actors and on set camera crew everything this costs us a cgi this costs a substantial amount of money to put this scene together and i'm mm -hmm. just saying that i've been like but why why were you allocating the resources in this way this does nothing to advance the story it does nothing to characterize axe woes it does nothing to characterize the mandalorians who split suppose, off from Poe. these guys aren't relevant ever again I think one thing you could say that this uh this scene accomplishes is it sort of establishes um, that there are still imperial warlords present in certain lawless areas of space that pirates have to pay tribute to in order for them to not uh, be killed by them. We already knew that, and, and not only do we already know that from Moff Gideon's very existence, but like we get another scene in you know later episode where there's a council of the buggers. Uh huh. So I, I don't, this this feels utterly superfluous. Well, I, I actually have an idea for like how you could have a scene like this, but it, it would actually like be uh, purposeful. Um, so uh, just entertain this, if you will, right? Let's say yeah. that the Book of Boba Fett doesn't happen, or at the very least in that show, that they don't have uh, Grogu and, and Mando just reunite, right? So this would actually be a really good uh, like first scene of the first episode of this season if Mando is just off doing his his thing being a bounty hunter, and they're showing him having to, like, he, he, in this in this scenario... He's got Axe Woves' role, right? Where okay. he's taking on a job like this. Um, and it's it, it just sort of like showing like what his, like, I guess what a downgrade his life has been since separating from Grogu, I guess. And they could do it in a sort of comedic yeah. sense. That's that's kind of how I think I would, I would do it. If it's like, if you're trying to play this for laughs, as they obviously are, um, and you want this to actually be part of a story, it seems like it would make the most sense if this is supposed to be, um, like, uh, like, like, like the joke here is just how, uh, shitty, like Mando's life has gotten. You as could, a um, of, you could, could have, 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 have a scene, uh, like in this hypothetical you've just created South by, you could have like a scene where he's talking to the Mon Calamari kid. Uh, as he's taking him back to Coruscant or whatever, the kid's like pleading for him to let him go. Um, mm -hmm. And it's mostly played for laughs, but then like maybe he says a line that reminds him of Grogu or like reminds him of what yeah. he used to have with Grogu. And it kind of, it kind of hits him in a way that he hadn't expected. And he, he just gets kind of angry and quiet. Well, and yeah. shock, shock horror. We could have just done that with Axe Woes and had some characterization for Axe Woes where he's like, Oh, I split off. Nope. You know, he, you know, he's, he he's split off. Character. He's not, he's not Bo-Katan. Well, I, oh God, yeah, because she's a character. But like, that's the thing, right? We could have had the scene uh, serve the purpose of, of being like, oh yeah, Axe led the you know revolt against Bo, but he's having second thoughts now because he's like, yeah, we're getting, we're making money, but I feel purposeless. Like I feel like uh, the grand yeah, plan, you know, going for us now. yeah, we're, we're just mercenaries now. There's no meaning to our lives. There's no driving core to what we're doing anymore. Which is kind of listless. Yeah. Uh, but no. So that's the no. that's the opening scene where we've established that the, that they're here and they're doing shit, I guess, which we already knew. But all right. So then, and then after the the title credits or whatever, Den and Bo uh, arrive on what is it called, Plazir Fifteen? Plazir Fifteen. Yeah, they arrive on this planet. Um, I remember from the <laughs> people theorized that it was that it was like a restored Mandalore because it's like a domed city. Uh, and like grasslands surrounding it. They've arrived on this planet because apparently they just knew where the Mandalorians were the whole time, the ones that left Bo-Katan, I guess. She just knew that they were there. She never went to them and tried to get her fleet back. Sorry, I just love the thing where you're like, what the hell is this place called? And it's like, it's called Plaza 15. You're like, yeah, the planet, fuck it. <laughs> 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 Thanks for input, yeah, Jolly. Now shut the fuck up. Who gives a shit? <laughs> shut up, Jolly. <laughs> I haven't listened to Nerd. Uh, 
Yeah, so yeah, they land on Plaza 15. It looks a bit like Mandalore because you know we had to mislead people in trailers somehow. Yeah, but but yeah, no. So they I, they just know where the Mandalorians are and like where where the fleet is, and like Bo never tried to get it back or challenge him at any point before this. I don't know why. I don't know why between seasons two and three she just lost her spine because she never challenged in. She ne- like her people left her and she apparently knew where to find them and she never did. So okay, yeah. there's. There's two bits of dialogue I'd like to draw attention to. So the first sure. is um, they point to the fleet and uh, Din's like, oh, that's quite the fleet. That could come in handy for taking back Bandalore. And I'm like, there it is again. From who? Taking it back. Taking back Everyone keeps again. Re- yeah. Keep repeating this. Who you are you know, talking in, about? In episode two, when they were, or episode three even, when they were on the planet, you could have had a moment where they realized, oh my God, there are like Imperials here and they have like a whole base set up and they're doing something. We don't know the extent of it. We don't know who's running this operation, but we need to get the fuck out of Dodge and like tell the New Republic. Maybe that's how you get Mando and and Carson Teva on like talking terms, like to where they can call each other whenever you want. And like then, oh, yeah. then, then this is how Teva knows that like the Empire is up to something, but like he can't prove it, and the New Republic doesn't believe him for some reason. See, the the best faith I can give them, right, is that like, they're like, oh, we're taking back the planet from those Imperials who turned up and destroyed Bo's castle. And at that point, I'm like, but. Presumably they were there for Bo, right? Like you've got no reason to think they're sticking around in that system. Yeah. Um, so it's still a weird sentence. Anyway, yeah, that's the first bit. The second bit of dialogue. Oh yeah. The second bit of dialogue is um, they're getting uh, you know they get the little like welcome flash message from the planet where the planet goes describes itself as like uh, it's an independent world. Out, it's not in the New Republic. Mm-hmm. It's very clear about this. They are not in the New Republic. And they say, we are the Outer Rim's only direct democracy. And I'm like, hmm. really? The only one? You're the, the only planet that. in the entirety okay. of the Outer Galaxy that tried this model of governance. I don't believe you. Yeah, I don't fucking believe that. That's stupid. They're also but, not a direct democracy, as we'll see. But yeah, well, <laughs> correct. I'm kind of just confused about like what this planet is and like what their, what their uh, governing system is. Because they call themselves a democracy, uh, but they don't seem to be. Uh, I don't well, know. it's not just that, right? Like, uh, they, they call themselves a direct democracy. So, like, this is a democracy that has no elected representatives because it's a direct democracy. But then they have elected representatives. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I literally, yeah. I, I have no fucking idea. But anyway, then uh, they break they break the canon again. You know, it's right. that, it's that time of the episode. So, the first thing I thought when I saw this scene, I'm about to describe it to you. But the first thing I thought was like, oh, tractor beam. That's fine. Um, it's not a tractor beam. It's very clearly not. So like the, the automated voice that just, that just said those bits of dialogue that Jolly was talking about is like, uh, taking over like automated guidance of the ship. Um, and then we see like the control panel, like the gears and the, and the joysticks and everything that, that Bo was using to steer get taken control of by the like Plazier 15's systems, I guess this Bluetooth system. I don't know. Um, and starts steering the ship into a like a landing zone. There it's not really... just a tractor beam. It's literally taking control of a ship and and bringing it to a, a, a yeah, desired remotely location. piloting it. There is now there is now literally technology in Star Wars that allows planets to just take control of mm-hmm. ships. From... So can we think what? of any specific yeah. uh, organizations that might have employed this uh, use of technology, and, and in what examples we can we can pull that from? <laughs> Where oh, no, literally. From? Literally anything, like the Death Star making Luke's X-wing fly into a wall or something. How about when the when the, the rebels are escaping Hoth? Why not just remotely control their ships and force them to ground? Yeah, I, I this 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 is one of two examples in this episode where they introduce a world-breaking piece of canon. Mm-hmm. And you're um, like, why did you? Not... Do... But this one's so frustrating because it's like, why didn't you just why make it a tractor beam? You yeah. get the same exact results. Just make it a tractor beam. You even get to maybe do something a bit of a funny moment where they, they assume the intentions are hostile. So Bo and Din like come out the front door wielding their guns, and they're just met and by like a welcome the two boss. Droids, yeah, they're like, "Hey!" Yeah. <laughs> like you could actually have a, a genuinely quite funny moment, but no, we we can't have this. We have to have rather than do that, we have to introduce a piece of technology that breaks everything again. Because yeah. again, it's that time of the episode. You might as well. <sighs> <laughs> so yeah, we've I've uh, lost my will to live. <laughs> so we've landed at a at a platform zone. We're greeted by imperial like like reprogrammed imperial droids, and then makes note of the fact that they're imperial, um, which is weird. 
right? Because mm-hmm. he's like, oh, it's it's unusual that they're Imperial droids. And Bo's like, I don't know, man, it's the Outer Rim, you know, which I, I'm on Bo's side here. Like, particularly after the fall of the Empire, there's going to be a lot of ex-Imperial droids rocking around. Yeah, you'd imagine like, there'd be a lot of Imperial resources that have fallen into pirate hands, like maybe a uh, a pirate a ship, ship run by <laughs> a, a certain seaweed man named Pirate King Gorian Shard. Uh, but no, he was just given that as a gift, I guess, by Gideon. So fuck it. Uh, because Gideon has that kind of resources to spare, which is why he doesn't make a phone call asking for more. Which is why when he's talking to the Shadow Council, he's like, listen, we're scrimping and scraving, scraving, scrimping and saving scraving. for, uh, for uh, resources while you guys hog all of it. But he just gave a Corsair cruiser to a pirate to go fuck with Novaro for some reason. She, yeah. why are you, she, honestly, it's just pathetic, man. Why are you so mad about a TV show? Because. They slaughtered because my favorite now, which was Star Wars. Can I just say yeah, that? This, I, this isn't just I, a TV show. Yeah, this, is yeah. a, this is a TV show that um, locked me in a small room, windowless room, and played me <laughs> Barney on a loop for three hours until I choked myself to death in my own vomit. Like, <laughs> this, this thing has harmed me, my children, my bloodline. I have a feud with this TV show. Can I just say that I, like, I adore the utter irony of like these people who built an entire... like uh, community around getting angry about people's takes on things be like ah you got mad over a tv show <laughs> yeah it's it's odd i i, I guess <laughs> just to address the, that kind of elephant right like she I, I imagine you're the same here right we're not we're not mad at the tv show right because mm-hmm. the tv show is a tv show we're mad at the state of the media landscape that has produced a show like this and apparently has no plans to change that behavior and continues to do so unapologetically what essentially we're angry at is no honest, obviously i'm just, not Obviously, I'm not mad at an inanimate object that is the TV show. I'm mad at the writers for making this TV well, show. <laughs> well, again, it's also like we're not we're not mad at the TV show because it's personally hurt our feeling. Like it, it, we find it personally annoying to watch our favorite, you know, our sacred cows be smacked because everyone does. <laughs> but that's, but yeah. like that's not why we're doing these streams, right? We're not doing these streams to vent about how upset we are that our feelings were hurt. We're doing these streams because our hurt feelings are a symptom or a side issue connected to the larger issue that we've noticed, which is the Mm. god awful manner in which large media corporations engage with creating arts and what that means for people's investment in stories. Yep. Um, It's intellectual anger. It's not, there is emotional anger. Don't don't get me wrong. I have an emotional investment in Star Wars. I am emotionally pissed off. That's Mm. not what we're doing here. No, I think we're intellectually angry. No, I think that you're just mad that people like the show. I think, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, think I think you can't handle. I, no, I think they can't handle uh, uh, people disagreeing with you. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, that's why we told uh, Joe disagree. to jump off a bridge and 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 you know told him that he should die along with all his children and his bloodline. That's that's why you tell people to kill themselves all the time, right? Kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kill I don't know. Kill yourself, kill yourself Poe. It's the only option. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so then they get into like an Incredibles, uh, like shuttle thing. You know, oh, yeah, the hyperloop. Up. Yeah, when he gets yeah. it, when he gets into the island and gets into the thing, and it takes him into the volcano, they get into one of those basically. Um, and again, momentum doesn't exist in this universe. They, <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't put have seatbelts or anything, but they just go at like they accelerate from zero speed. to like three hundred miles per hour in a split second, and rather than yeah. be splattered all over the windshield like anyone would actually be in that situation, they're just fine. <laughs> it's like okay, yeah, so fine, all right, and then they get taken to this place um it's like banquet hall and they're escorted in and there's a bunch of people dining at a table at the head of the table are jack black and lizzo whose names i refuse to learn i'm just gonna call them <laughs> jack black and lizzo throughout well, this I, I, mean, I remember i remember his name only because of the beer advert in the uk that shared the name i don't yeah. remember lizzo's character's name i i'd much rather just just call jack black bombardier uh, 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 sorry uh bombardier bombardier, bombardier. yes bombardier it's yeah, fine. yeah. Well, I, I know it's Bombardier, but I think it's funny to call him Bombardier. Bombardier. <laughs> Bombardier. <laughs> well, actually, Southwell, maybe. All, did you guys? Again, she, she had no idea what I was talking about. Wait, but wait, I was wait, like, wait, there wait, used wait, to be an wait, ad, wait. but. Does Lizzo's character literally not have a name? What? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm looking at that now. Lizzo's Star Wars. Mandalorian name. <laughs> What? No, she's just the Duchess. That's just her name. No way. Whoa! That could actually just be Li- that could actually just be Lizzo. That's, that's just Lizzo. Duchess Lizzo. <laughs> Lizzo. Oh my god! 
Literally, literally, not five seconds after I was like, our anger is directed at how they just don't give a shit. <laughs> we didn't even name the character. We hired Lizzo, and we couldn't be bothered to give her character a name. They do this with this show, though. They don't name characters. Like, you remember in season one, we didn't even know Din and Grogu's names. They were just the uh, Mandalorian and the no, child, respectively. Don't forget Werner Herzog. He yeah, the client. The client. Yeah, we, they didn't give names to characters for somebody, and they're still continu- continuing that for some reason. Well, I mean, uh. as, we all know, as we all know from things like Tenet, you know, things that don't give characters names, excellent, excellently written. That that's oh just, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's I mean, to, 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 be, to be fair, Southport, in keeping with Tenet's themes, it makes just as much sense if you watch it back to front. <laughs> uh, true. Fuck that movie. Uh, fuck. That movie needs to go to hell. Uh, do, we, do, we, do we need to do a tenant stream at some point? Just oh, about... no, 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 because that, that, that won't be that won't be fun, South Pole. That will just be wanting to die. I, uh. see, I, I think it'd be fun if 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 we recorded a tenant watch party. And what I did was <laughs> I didn't show it like in chronological order. I just like cut around, basically, like just just rearrange the various well, scenes. Bad face. <laughs> like you, like you, you cannot conceive, nor can God, Southport, of the level of drunk I would have to be to make it through that stream. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, so we're brought into this banquet hall where Jack Black and Lizzo are like, oh. "Welcome, Mandalorians!" Yes. No, no, Bombardier and Lizzo. Like, bom- yes. Bombardier, Bomb- Bombardier Bomb- beer, and Bombardier Bomb- beer and Lizzo. Bombardier beer. Bowser and Lizzo are like, "Hey guys." Uh, pull up a chair. Bowser, Bowser and Glass Flute Lady. Mr. Um, Mr. Schneebly and the Duchess. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gulliver. and Mrs. Incredible. Like, and then just... Gulliver is like, listen, sit down. We gotta we got we want to talk to you guys. Um uh, okay, can I go ahead? Can I have my um sorry, I have my little rant about celebrity cameos? Because like, the thing is, the doors I was watching this episode, I think I messed you at the time, Sheep. The door was opened, and I was just immediately thrown out of the episode. Yep. I was like, "That's." I wasn't like those are two characters. I was like, "That is Jack Black and Lizzo," and <laughs> nothing that they then, nothing that they then did, did anything to change that dynamic. Like it was just like Jack Black being Jack Black and Lizzo being Lizzo. And so, there's a there's a and this ties back into what we're saying about like Bowser and and the, the incredible weight of massive talent. Mm. Here's the thing about celebrity cameos, right? Unbearable. Is weight. that there are some celebrities who their persona, their public persona, has become a kind of character, right? Nick Cage is the obvious example, but Jack Black is another one. These are people who, when you see, Seth Rogen is one as well. You see them in movies, you don't see a character, you just go, that's Seth Rogen, that's Jack Black, that's Nick Cage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To the point where like Nick Cage's unbearable weight of massive talent is literally a movie. It's a bit like being John Malkovich, right? They, they, they're so famous as public personas that the movie's leaning into it mm-hmm. to, to yeah. market itself because people are so aware of this. And so when they're actually trying to do a serious bit of acting as a character other than being Nick Cage, you have to do a lot of work. Like the, you have to do even more work than a normal actor would have to, by I mean, quite a long way. Like a lot more work than a normal actor would have to do in order to convince me that the person I'm watching on a screen is the character and not the character of Nick Cage, right? Um, like Into the Spider Verse does this by like hiding him behind Spider Man Noir, and he's really good in that. Okay. But like you, you, you have to really the work. Character also helps. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? So the, my, the point I'm making here is like. The fact that Jack Black and Lizzo have turned up is already distracting. Like that's already immediately thrown me out. Mm-hmm. The fact that the episode then doesn't not just doesn't put in some legwork, it puts in no legwork to differentiate the characters I'm seeing on screen from the public persona of these actors means that the the effect on my immersion is a bit like if they'd opened the doors and Daffy Duck and Wallace and Cromit <laughs> had just been standing there and the show yeah. had unironically carried on. I think well, we like, said I think we said in like when we were talking about this episode a few weeks ago. Even Christopher Lloyd was brought into this episode, and he actually mm-hmm. like played a character, quote unquote, yeah. character. Like he well, wasn't just yeah, being Christopher Lloyd. Was good. Lloyd. Well, like the reason why, um, uh, uh, like Jim Carrey works so well in Sonic the Hedgehog too, is because they just allowed him to be like to to be himself, right? To just mm-hmm. do his thing. And it's like Jack Black is an actor where if you have him in your story, you need to let him just kind of like. You need to lean into 
what the public knows about Jack Black about, about his persona. And the problem is that just doesn't work in really Star, Star Wars. It doesn't fit. This is not the franchise to have Jack Black. Like this is just one of those things where you just have to be like Jack Black, love you, man. Stay in your lane. Like <laughs> just you have to sit this one out, dude. Well, it's, it's, it's to do with the, like, the, 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 like an office style Star Wars show with like like starring stormtroopers or something. Like I could see that. Yeah, sure. like a below, like a below decks thing. Like the the point I'm essentially making here is like it's a bit like when you mash two continents. Like if you mash Star Trek together with like I don't know Doctor Who or whatever, mm-hmm. or like Lord of the Rings and uh, I don't know what's another fan? like Game of Thrones. Like if, if Kit Harrington, if, if Jon Snow as Jon Snow turned up in in Lord of the Rings, how fucking like jarring that would be mentally for you. And the reason that it yeah. is jarring is because like you have built up these separate continuities that you are separately immersed in, and mm-hmm a lot of these actors a lot of these celebrities are such public personas that they've essentially built up a character that you are immersed in in a different continuity that is now being rammed into this continuity Mm -hmm. and they're just and they're doing it in a way where they're like wink wink nudge nudge and i'm like yeah but this isn't you can tell me star wars is a child's kid show for space wizards you know (laughs) until the cows come home but the reality is that this is a universe that has until recently taken itself at least seriously enough that it wasn't just a a vehicle for cameos. It was a. It was telling its own story. The and now I'm just. That, Star Wars is about to change. Yeah, Jesus Christ! It's just, and that's the thing. Like when you shove these people in and make no effort to to explain their consistency in the world I'm being presented with, then it's it's a convenience thing. I can see the hand of the writer. I know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And I, I've lost my investment in the story as a result. The the it would, been really, would have been really funny if like there was just a part where Din leans over to Jack Black and he's like, "Grogu's pretty young. We try not to sexualize him." that that, that entire scene where um uh that entire scene like towards the end like honestly just it made me think like this is just turned into fucking snl that's what this is now yeah yeah kind of yeah well it does have that vibe let's lay out the premise essentially so jack black and lizzo take uh and uh, uh, man, fuck, Amando and uh, Bo Katan aside, they're so interchangeable. I'm sorry. They're like, listen, <laughs> we have a droid problem. And you're thinking, okay, okay oh, okay, what, what, what droid problem? Essentially, their, their whole society is built on droid labor. Um, and um, they've like repurposed, uh, I think Bom- Bombardier was in charge of like reprogramming them to all be like peaceful. And mm-hmm. benevolent, just basically like bellhops, like they're they're glorified servants. Um, yeah, apparently, apparently Poe's able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. That's an actual Star Wars character. Oh shit, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact: Poe Dameron was actually named after Poe from uh, Kung Fu Panda, so it's all full circle. Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. No. Was it, wait, was he actually? No, seriously, yeah. J.J. Abrams said that he named Poe Dameron after the panda. Oh, <laughs> oh. No. Why? But, like, he's nothing like... Ugh, fuck it, whatever. Yeah, that's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, fuck, leave that alone. Leave it alone, you fucking asshole piece of shit. Didn't even spell what? it the same way. I, so I, just before, again, so before you get to the, the laying out of the premise, there's a couple of little things. I'm not going to do on them. I'm just going to ra- rattle them out as a series of questions because I think they're funny, right? So, like, okay. Grogu the soft toy reemerges of just being thrown to Lizzo. That's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, uh, Bombardier is, a, is an amnesty program ex-Imperial, which, like, given that this is explicitly not a New Republic world, what the fuck is he doing here? Yeah, how is he allowed to be here? That's a great question. What, why isn't it, why isn't he on a, a member world helping out? Okay. Apparently, yeah. every member of the amnesty program that's not Doctor Pershing is just allowed to just basically do anything. So, like, is the fact that, <sighs> that is the fact that 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 Lizzo married him is that is that supposed to like uh, is that kind of like 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 marrying a a U.S. citizen? Like, you don't need we'll a, green, you card like a green card. Yeah, you can. But, but why was he? But why was he posted there at all? Uh. Yeah, they, she only married him because he was there, I think. Okay. Yeah, oh. she, she's like, he, he came here to fix the planet Maybe. because of the amnesty program, and then well, she married him because she fell in love with him. Was he was he there as an Imperial at any point? Did they maybe fall in love before no. he left? Okay, no, no, no they're, they're very clear that he's there as a result no, of the amnesty no, program. All right, um, also, I don't, I don't we, have the, we have the little line where he's like, we're both royals and elected leaders, and I'm like, that's not how a direct democracy works, either way. Yeah, well, I don't... <laughs> you I don't get... This, so this episode genuinely doesn't understand what a uh, direct democracy is. 
no, uh, and I don't think it's not going to explore like the hierarchy of this world or what, like what it, you know, basically what I'm about to get at here is that like throughout this episode, we're going to find that this is almost like hunger games, capital levels of like the elite are crushing the, the working class and uh, they're the working class are kind of painted as the villains in this, in this uh, conflict. And it's yeah. really bizarre. It is really weird to watch, but anyway, so well, also just to, uh, for for people who don't understand, right? So, like uh, in a in a regular democracy like the United States, which is a, an elected a, a representative democracy, mm-hmm. you elect a representative who then goes to a a you know a, a, like a Congress or a Senate, a, a meeting room of some kind, and they debate topics on behalf of the people, and they stand on on particular issues that they're elected on, right? In a direct democracy, you cut out the middleman, so everything is voted on by the people directly in a in a plebiscite or a referendum. Mm-hmm. Um, there should be no elected representatives here. Yeah, also, well, what, what's what's uh, what is our take on the fact that like apparently all jobs are automated and, and nobody has to work? So, well, I'm gonna have things to say about that. Just let me let's well, get to that. Okay. Oh, yeah, wow. they, they they don't actually do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, you know, here's, here's the premise. Here's the premise. We have a droid problem. They're malfunctioning. We don't know why because we they're supposedly been reprogrammed to like be peaceful. Um, we can't do anything about it because we're not allowed to have like weapons here. Not even our own guard has weapons, uh, which is weird. Uh, for so many reasons, no, not they have bounty hunters. They have, they have like staffs, yeah. So those are weapons. Anyway, they're like, all right. So you have a bunch of Mandal- uh, Mandalorian privateers out there. Which, by the way, that they wanted to go speak to them, but they were remember their ship was commandeered by the auto remote system. So they're like, you can go see the Mandalorians once you've done this for us. Um, so they're like, you have those Mandalorian privateers out there. Um, why can't they do it? And so then. Jack Black and Lizzo are like, well, first of all, they're like, we're, they're like, we're not allowed to have an army, right? Because Jack Black used to be an imperial, which is why we've hired these people anyway. They're not an army, but they they officially, you know, they effectively serve the same purpose. But we're not allowed to have them in the city because we're not allowed to have an army in the city. It's like, well, they're not an army, so that's probably uh, yeah. solved. Great, yeah. Um, and then they're, they're like, well, you know. But regardless, you're not allowed to carry guns into the city. And then they're like, oh, okay, so how what? can Bowen, how can Bowen didn't help you? And they're like, well, Mandalorians culturally are allowed to carry weapons because we voted to be a pluralistic a society. Pluralistic society. So because it's part of your religion as Mandalorians to carry weapons, that's our loophole. You guys can basically go and take care of these droids and use weapons and whatever, you know, whatever means necessary. Um, and that's how we, this is the roundabout way that we've established that Din and Bo are going to take care of this droid problem. I mean, um, that reasoning applies to all the Mandalorians outside, but screw so, it. Yeah, again, they're not even an army, but even if we are classifying them as an army, um, which fucks with the fact that they're, they shouldn't be allowed to have one, but even if we are classifying them as an army, can like a few of them not just come in and use, like wave around their being Mandalorians as like they're allowed to keep their weapons? And nope. then take care of the droid problems. Why does it have to be Din and Bo? Or also, why can't your internals like if you're like a oh, security aren't allowed guns? I'm like, yeah, but these are droids you're dealing with. There are other ways of dealing with them, like EMP grenades that have no effect on organic people. Why aren't they allowed those? Yeah. Or, or stun batons. Yeah, like, I don't so get. I don't get there, this. There are a lot of droid incapacitating uh, weaponry that are pretty much useless against organics that are shown in the Clone Wars. You got droid poppers. Uh, which are very effective. They even take out like droidicas. Um, yeah, you know, droid poppers being the the thing from from the Phantom Menace, right? Uh, no, no, no. What they droid poppers are essentially these little mini grenades that disperse like electricity, and they're very effective against like large swaths of droids. I assume um, it's a Clone Wars thing. Yeah, they're they're showing yeah, a lot. Clone of Wars thing. They're actually okay. pretty op. Um, but yeah, um, use those. The other thing is, like, obviously, this is extremely convoluted. But as I, I think I said to Yushi, there is the really funny thing here. Of like, this is literally the meme of, uh, we'll, we'll give you milk, but you know, if you deal with the warlord <laughs> who stole all our Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's that meme about, about what the Mandalorian is as a show. About what, like, each episode of the Mandalorian is like, we gotta we gotta get more milk, so we gotta go to this new planet. And then they're like, we don't like Mandalorians, but we'll give you our milk if you kill the warlord monster bandit that's been stealing our Wi-Fi. And then it cuts to him just shooting a guy and then coming back. And he's like, okay, here's your, oh, what? And then Mando's like, oh, no, baby Yoda, drink all the milk. And then that's the end of the episode. 
<laughs> it is very much that meme. Yeah, That's literally what I this episode, yeah. Except I would actually say that that meme is better written. <laughs> yeah, actually, unironically, yes. It makes more sense. <laughs> it's a more cohesive <laughs> plot, unironically. <laughs> Uh, anyway. So yeah, so they get sent, they get sent to go and talk to the security man because he's the one who knows everything. Mm -hmm. So we meet Christopher Lloyd. He's like the head of security there, and um, that you know he's showing them like footage of like different droids malfunctioning um, to varying degrees of like uh, severity, like you know. And uh, so the natural question, Bo's just like, so why don't you just turn them all off? And uh, he's like, well, actually, we have this this big red button here next to me. Uh, that would do exactly that, but we're not allowed to because this is a society built on droid labor. The citizens don't have to work, and without the droids, they would be completely lost. Um, hey, Jolly, what the fuck? Sorry? You, there was something going on <laughs> on your end. Oh, okay, sorry. I have no idea what well, so, okay, so uh, we can't shut off the droids um, with this big red button that allows us to shut them all off because this is a society uh, built on droid labor. The citizens don't have to work and they wouldn't know what, like, the first thing to do without them. So, Southpaw already brought this up. Um, he says this is a society where the citizens don't have to work and yet we're literally in a place where a bunch of people are sitting at a desk, like, overlooking security like these are apparently citizens of this place and they're working. So that's weird. There are guards who are citizens yep. of this place. They're working. Uh, they're about to be sent below to like the droid repair station uh, run by a bunch of Ugnots who are presumably citizens. I guess they're, they have to work. It seems almost as if this is actually not a society built on droid labor, but this could be, you know, generously a commentary on, the working class and how they're they're being oppressed by like the more elite who can just kind of sit around on blankets all day and do nothing or well could it be that, that like maybe 95 percent of the labor in the city is is automated uh well that's not what they said but that would be an explanation it, it also runs counter to the, the stated goals when we get to the villain right like the, the villain's goals uh, that he states are like it, it are political explicitly political like we're being oppressed i'm sick of being oppressed um oh, right so if we're going to tie that back in, like it would make sense for it to yeah. be what Shiva just suggested, which is like we've been presented with all this evidence that the the idea of this is a utopian society is a lie, and that mm -hmm. this uh, you know supposedly direct democracy has a, a ruling class of royals who claim and they're elected, really clean and, and pristine on the yeah. outside, and like you, you go in and you're like this is neat, and then the second you start to kind of look closer, you're like oh my god, this is horrific, this is like Orwellian, yeah. Um, I, I might have like a controversial take, but I think like the idea of this, like this society uh, being supposedly like this automated, um, it seems like that sort of thing is subject to like pretty serious abuse for reasons that are outlined in this episode, like through this premise, basically, of like what happens if these droids like are malfunctioning, basically, what do you do then? Like these people are basically being made into being like very dependent on these things which could easily break down and once they break down it's like well what what do you do then right well, i guess we have the thing um, sorry sorry whoa, 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 whoa. sorry guys I'm, I'm sorry to cut it i'm sorry to cut in but this is important um liam and chat um i'm getting really tired of reading your messages particularly not liking the one about referring to lizzo as black jabba uh, so, no no so, uh, seven, eight, yeah. 18 minutes seven seven minutes so, sorry 18 minutes past 7 p.m in the chat uh, he's called a black jabba gone down and said minority hire doesn't give a name i put him in uh, the, yeah i'm i'm sorry if, if you're going to be racist in chat you can piss right off yeah if it, i have he, no time for it yeah I'm sorry, i'm out I, I was, in uh five minutes if he keps it up i'll just block him yeah i'm sorry i cool I, I wasn't i wasn't paying attention to that yeah neither was i no, so. no sorry i didn't mean to cut i didn't mean to cut you off south just i thought we should deal with it no i i no i think i think i think it's good it's just like i i'd rather i'd rather we not uh give off the impression that we're just going to no, no yeah, because I well, I tried to um, just be very careful. Like, we have nothing against uh, Lizzo or Jack Black or you know, mm -hmm. like anything like that. We're not gonna make fat jokes or black jokes or whatever. This, the whole fucking I saw someone's. It might have been Liam say like Jabba the Hut or whatever. Yeah, that that I, was Liam. Fuck that that's bullshit. You guys can shut the fuck up. You make us look bad. No, well, you, I don't, you I don't are what these. You are what these people think we are. 
he was like, I don't necessarily give a shit that you make us look bad. It's not my reputation I'm concerned about. It's just I have no time for racism. If you're a racist, right. you are in the wrong, and your arguments are nonsensical, and you are an abysmal person, and I have no time for it. Yeah. I don't give a shit. It's not about how I look or how she looks. It's about like you are a shitty person, and you should not treat your fellow human beings that way. Don't do it. Yeah. Exactly. The the issue with Lizzo in this episode is just that she is a celebrity and her presence sticks out like a sore thumb. It's very distracting. Yeah, I mean, she's not is. a character. She doesn't even have a fucking name. She's just there. <laughs> yeah. I'm never gonna get over that. That was great. I'm gonna that. <laughs> just me laughing hysterically because I've just yeah. lost my shit. <laughs> Legit hearing like a fucking balloon just like <laughs> losing all its air. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, that's that's the point where you can clearly see my mind has snapped. I'm <laughs> just like, no, I can't do this anymore. This is my Joker origin story. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so that aside, uh, I'm sorry, Southpaw, you were saying? Um, oh, yeah, no, no just like the idea of a city in which um, like essentially all work is automated or at least enough so that people don't uh, have to work. And and then, oh, well, if we shut down the droids, they won't know how to function. It's, it's just like this is one of those things where it's like it, it almost seems like, um, well, this is a, a thing that we're dealing with, uh, like 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 sort of a a potential problem of if the uh if if we start automating most jobs or all jobs um if people like if the wealthy are able to basically um avoid having to pay people to uh to work by getting these robots instead um it, it, it like one of the, the the key worries there of course is like well then what happens to the working class once most jobs are being automated here. I think, uh, to be charitable to the show, I, I don't think they're going down the road, because I think that's a genuine thing to worry about in real life, is like, um, mm. who owns the robots in a world where the robots do all the labor? Who get, who, get, who collects the value of their labor is a big issue. Spe speaking wow. of someone who works with AI <laughs> ethics. Um, <laughs> the thing I think this show is more going for is the kind of like uh, human purpose thing of like, um, the villain ran to the end ties into the whole idea of oppression, right? Where he's like, even if the robots do genuinely work for all the people, um, which they don't, but even if they did, um, that's taking away, you know, that's making us dependent on the machines to a level where we're essentially helpless children being minded by them. And we've, we've willingly given up all of our independence and our self mm -hmm. ability to be self-reliant for, for the sake of comfort and convenience. And he views that as a kind of oppression, um, right. which ties into his political views, um, which and get I briefly mentioned and then cut off. I mean, I just, I really hate having to take the the villain was right approach, but no, he's uh, right. The villain's right oh, the, here. I, mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't go as far as saying he's completely right. He's definitely got a lot of oh, very good points that the, the, the show then yard yard well, is away. Yeah. So as we're gonna get into cause the the scene where he's basically laying out his motivations and the reasons behind what he's doing is the most interesting scene, not just in this episode, but honestly for most of the season, aside from like anything. Yeah, they do other than the part, yeah. Other than and, the um, stuff, yeah. and it's really annoying the way that that scene is handled, um, like as a meta thing as well as just in universe. Yeah, it's like it's like well, so you know the the people complain about the politics in the prequels, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like this scene is is written to appease those people. It's like ah, who cares about politics? Yeah, yeah, no, it literally. Well, let's, let's, let's get let's get like, them when we get that right. Yeah. So we're back with uh, they're they're like, listen, we need to we need to figure out like what's going on with these droids. Um, and he's like, well, you're going to have to talk to the Ugnaughts about that. You guys got to go down to the sub levels, I guess. Um, so they go down to the Ugnaughts and Bo-Katan starts trying to talk to them and they're just completely ignoring her. <laughs> and then Din says, I am Din Djarin, friend of Ugnaught Quill. And they all like stop what they're doing and look over at him. The Ugnaughts know oh, who Quill was. Sorry, sorry. I just I just realized we I forgot to mention something, which is um the payment that uh Jack Black offers um Bo -Katan. Oh well, so yeah. he's like because yeah, he's like oh, if you do this job for us, we'll as a planet we'll recognize the sovereignty of Mandalore and we'll petition the New Republic to recognize it as well. And I was like, okay, but you're not a member state of the New Republic, so why the fuck would they listen to you? Yeah, it's weird. I don't I <laughs> Sorry, it was but a very it, minor yeah. thing, but just you know, just just yeah. to, I thought about mentioning, just to iron out the 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 premise. Yeah, we got to make sure it's all laid out. That's that's what that's why they're doing what they're doing, and it's very bizarre. I don't even think you really needed that because they already were like, we're gonna, we won't let you see the Mandalorians that you need to see, unless you do this job for us. Like that that was already incentive enough. I felt. Yeah, absolutely. 
You just, you well, just play oddball. So another thing I did actually want to bring up in, in terms of this, um, didn't it's not consistently applied, but Din doesn't like droids. Remember, you guys remember that? Oh yeah, he hates so, droids apparently sometimes. So when when they agree to this to this, he literally is just like, "You had me at battle droids," which is like okay, but this would be a great episode to actually develop the main character of the series. And that this is one of the few different reasons why this episode specifically pissed me off. They do nothing with Din's character in this episode. They do absolutely fucking nothing. Um, well, yeah, they, it's not like just, every it's not once just... in a while, they like allude, they vaguely gesture to like, Oh, he doesn't trust droids. Oh, oh they're all, they're all the same, blah, blah, blah. But like, they never do anything meaningful with it. They never do I mean, anything. The thing that is, you know, like he could have initially refused to do the job because, like, oh, I don't want to deal with droids. I don't want to. T- no, fuck this. And you know, and maybe this is a great uh, way to have like a, a character moment between him and Bo-Katan where she, she's like, why don't, why don't you want to do this job? And he's like, I just, just don't want to. And she's like, why? He, she kind of presses. He's just like, I don't want to. All right, that's it. That's all. That's all that matters. And like, then maybe he like opens up to her about what happened to his family and about like wh- like how he was found by the Death Watch, like. You know, there's something to, to work with there, and they just don't ever bring it up, and it's insane to me. Well, it's, it's, especially because, like, this is not just, like, any robots. It's specifically, it's the B2 battle droids, super battle droids. Mm-hmm. The, the ones that killed his parents. The killed his parents. Like, we see the shot of it looming over him, pointing a gun at him. Like, you could have easily done a visual parallel in this episode. And, in fact, there's a sequence where they chase down a super battle droid uh, through the city. It's a really terrible sequence. But like you could have done something at the end where maybe like he's backed against the wall, right? And he he could easily get out of it, but he just kind of freezes because like this super battle droid is looming over him with a gun pointed at him. He's getting memories of like what happened to his family. And e- even though he could easily like take care of this himself now that he's grown and capable or whatever, uh, he just he just locks up and uh, maybe starts hyperventilating. And then maybe Bo-Katan has to save him. Well, that's the thing, right? Because like, this is an opportunity as well to give Bo some agency, right? Because if 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 mm-hmm. Din is paralyzed by trauma or is acting irrationally because of trauma, that's a good way to showcase him. Like, yeah, Din is a great guy and a wonderful Mandalorian, but he's not a good leader. And like, you know, he he lacks the self awareness and the self control needed to, to be a leader. So all those people being like, well, he's got the dark saber, he should be the ruler of Mandalore. This could have been the episode to show like what Bo's worth actually is as a leader, as someone who's more collected, who's been mm-hmm. through wars herself. That you know, maybe she could like sit him down and give him the inspiring speech about how you carry on from trauma. You know, there's lots of things they could have done with both. Like maybe he goes off on his own because he doesn't want to do it her way, and he's like, "No, I can do it my way. Screw you if you're not going to listen to me." And then he mm-hmm. just ends up buggering everything, and she has to bail him out. Like there's just yeah. there's endless things we could have done here, and there's just nothing is done. Instead, she occasionally tells him off for being a bit aggressive, and then he's just proven right, so she looks like an idiot. <laughs> yep, pretty much. It's um yeah, but anyway, so we go to the Ugnots and we have some casual racism thrown in. Where he <laughs> meets Quill and they all just immediately jerk their heads over and look at him because I guess everyone, every Ugnot knows each other. I I don't know. Hey, I genuinely yeah. like I don't know if that's what I'm meant to make of that line. Hey Jolly and Sheev, do, do you think that maybe the reason why they didn't want to lean uh so hard into exploring Mando's traumatic past with the droids? <laughs> Is that uh, it? It, it might have gotten a little too close to what they did with Joel in The Last of Us because he's also played by Pedro Pascal. Well, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that. If anything, if they did more with, uh, if they if they if they likened Mando more to Joel in The Last of Us, I would be happier. Yeah, I, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that. Like seriously, do that. Take take a fucking page out of their book if you have to. I think that you. Uh, <laughs> You you you're you're overestimating um, the competence on display here. <laughs> oh no no I'm well aware that they have I'm well aware that like Neil Druckmann they lack any kind of ability to pay this off in any kind of coherent manner. Yeah, like they, they, would, least, they uh, would butcher it, but I would at least like to see yeah. them try. The problem is yeah, that I'd not rather, even trying. I'd rather watch them try and fail than just not try at all. Right to yeah. to call Yoda, do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but so no, yeah, so we're down with the Ugnots. Uh, they start listening to Din uh, because, as he explains later, they 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 only listen to you if you speak very like authoritatively. If you say "I have spoken," the whole, the whole thing, the iconic line from season one, blah blah blah. They talk. They sit down with them. The Ugnots are like, "Well, it wasn't our work. 
that that malfunction because we're good we're good at our jobs and and both like no i'm pretty sure your droids are malfunctioning that's what we're being told and uh then din has to listen to reason to them because also apparently it's like uncustomary to insult their work and they will uh they will stop talking to you if you if you insult their work ugnots are very uh what's the word i'm looking for proud proud yeah that's a good yeah. I, I will say i do I do like the detail that, like, because obviously I don't think Bo would have had any interaction with Ugnaughts, whereas, like, Din has a career that's led him through some, like, you know, the, the working class areas, basically. Yeah. I like the idea that Din knows more about the customs of the Ugnaught as a people than her. Um, you know, if you're doing that, if it, if it had been done well, is my caveat. But I like the detail of that. That's at least what they were going for. I will say as well, though, that, like, because the implication we get as well from the end of this episode is like the Ugnaughts know, like they're not just they're not just being proud and being like, oh, we couldn't have fucked up. They're going like, no, we know we didn't. We know this is not a, a malfunctioning issue, hmm. and they know it. They know it so well that they can actually predict where and when the droids are going to fail. Which, right. given why, the, yeah, which given why they're failing means the Ugnaughts know damn well what's happening and have chosen not to tell anyone. Yeah, so that's that was the next thing I was going to bring up is that they give them like a list of likely next ones to go to to malfunction. And for some reason, Bo and Din aren't incredibly sus of them whenever they're able to correctly predict which droid would do it next. Um, I'm not sure how they're able to predict that, even if they do know the methodology, considering what we learn later. Um, but they they accurately predict that, which means that they have to at least on some level be in on it. And they're never this is never brought up again. They're never punished for this. Um, so that's weird. But anyway, yeah, they're give, uh, Bo and Din are given a like the next likely droid to malfunction, and they're sent to the docks to, uh, I guess, talk to a battle droid um, that's that's uh, like working on a manifest, that, and all these B twos are are like lining up to load stuff onto a ship. I heard the Clone and, Wars uh, voice, and I clapped. Yeah, that was the <laughs> battle droid from the show that I liked. Woo! And also Revenge of the Sith. To be fair, it's also in Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> True. I think that I think that he he does a different voice in Revenge of the Sith because there's a very stark difference between Clone Wars and Revenge of the Sith battle droid voices. Uh I'm pretty sure Revenge of the Sith droids are at least like the same ballpark of this kind of voice. It's different from the Phantom Menace one by quite a long way. Oh, by a lot, yeah. And the Phantom Menace one is way better. The the Miley Cyrus voice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. So yeah. Um Din didn't plan here. <laughs> to figure out which droid is the is the next malfunction. It's he's just gonna go over to them as they're as they're each like carrying a bunch of heavy boxes in a line. Just start kicking them one by one. Yeah, just just one by one. <laughs> There's not like right. hundreds, if not thousands, of these fuckers running around doing their jobs. He's just gonna Again, kick I every single one of them. So I get to drop the word convenience again because it's really convenient that of all those thousands, it happened to be on the first like six or seven he kicked. Um, because, he kicked. Yeah, yeah, because like, there's an alternate universe, right, where it was like number eight hundred and eighty-three in the line. He for, like, eight hours. Spent, like, yeah, he spent like nine hours, like slowly breaking his own <laughs> leg bones. He kicked a droid over and over and over again. <laughs> well, Bo just chilled or something. But like, why would that work anyway? What was the actual idea behind this strategy? I, I guess he's thinking that like, if you can provoke it to act outside of its normal programming, it'll default to the malfunction. Like, honestly, like, I'm, that's me doing a heavy lot of writing for them though, because I have no idea what the mechanics of well, that is. So like, if you, I'm trying to think. Like, I know that there are droids that aren't combat programmed, but like, if you punched C-3PO in the face. And then gave him a chance to, to fight back. Would he just not? Is that what we're saying? Oh, actually, I just realized I they, they, dropped, they dropped a line that might unintentionally, because I don't believe this was essential by the writers, but they did drop a line that might explain this. So when Jack Black is talking about the things that have gone wrong, he explicitly talks about um, task prioritization, where it's like they're, they're, they're just you know not doing the tasks they were prioritized to do. Mm -hmm. Um Oh, I get to call. I, I get to tell a cool story now. Yay! Do you guys know about the procrastinating Mars rover? No. No. Okay, so I love this story. It's so so cute. Anyway, so one of the Mars rovers that NASA sent to Mars, um, obviously these things are like essentially like dri drivable labs. They're doing they're doing a bunch of different things. They got like tasks like you know charge up from the solar batteries and mm -hmm. take soil samples and all that kind of shit. And those tasks were differentiated into high priority, medium priority, and low priority. Um, 
Now, because of a because of a, a way that the, the system malfunctioned when it when it hit the surface, basically, it rather than do the high priority tasks, it never had enough energy to do the high priority task. So it would cycle down to a, a medium priority task it did have the energy to do. But of course, by doing that, it used up energy. So it had to do a low priority task while it recharged, and then it only had enough energy to do the medium priority. So it just kept on doing like the medium and low priority tasks and not the high priority ones because it never had the energy reserves to do that. Mm. Um, so essentially, it was procrastinating, <laughs> um, which <laughs> genuine thing is actually might be might be a real cause of pro uh, procrastination in humans. Might be task prioritization uh, failure. But to explain this droid right, like if it's if it's high priority tasks are to do it's the job it's been reprogrammed to do, and its task prioritization is screwed with, it might just def default to its factory programming. It might just default to the, like the next like the the most basic programming it has. So I guess Din's thing would be like, if I interrupt a type priority task, it might well just devolve back to being, you know, if it's, if this is one of the malfunctioning ones that's going to go back to its factory programming, it will just do that. But yeah. I'm doing a hell of a lot of heavy lifting for the writers there to, to, to get that to work. <laughs> one thing I also wanted to say, because someone in chat um, said that the battle droids look really good. No. <laughs> Sorry. No, You're like, wrong. Shut up. <laughs> while I was rewatching this episode, even this is a darkly lit scene for the most part, but even then, like these very clearly CGI droids look so fucking fake that I actually vomited. Unironically, like I vomited. Um it looks worse than they did in the fucking Phantom Menace. They, I don't even think they look bad in the Phantom Menace, to be fair, but the point being that the prequels which were movies that were still like figuring out concepts like CGI in 1999 through 2005 were able to better CG battle droids than this 2023 Disney production. That's insane. Yeah. It's, they it's look bizarre. like shit. They look like shit. But anyway, uh, we, I suppose we can talk about that when, uh, when the droid that does eventually malfunction uh, when Dent kicks it, like takes off and starts running, this chase is yet again a great example of some really bad CGI. Um, also, uh, um, I guess I, I'll, I'll ask the question. Bo Katan has her backpack. Yeah, her jetpack. Why don't they chase well, it with not, the jetpack? Not her backpack, her jetpack. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're chasing it on foot. Uh, and they can't catch up to it, which is already bizarre to me because I feel like you could outrun a battle droid. But I guess even if not, uh, jetpacks just fly. You can yeah. easily catch up to them. I refuse to believe that the droid can outrun them on jetpacks. Well, she, she even sort of uses it in the chase, right? She uses it to jump a little bit higher over an obstacle. I was like, just carry on. Just You've, you've taken off now. Keep going. Well, so like they, they did the last Jedi thing. Remember in The Last Jedi... When Finn is making a beeline toward the, the the miniature Death Star tech, he's gonna blow it up. Rose is like either behind him or like exactly in the same, uh, like the same distance away from the from the Death Star tech, right? That um, she can't pop like she's in the exact same vehicle craft, so mm -hmm. she can't possibly go faster than he's already going because he's running at this thing at max speed. But somehow she's able to get far enough ahead of him to then jerk left and intercept him and crash into him before he um uh, before he can hit the death star tech this uh this fight essentially this chasing essentially does that uh, as well where um i can't remember which one but one of them is continuing to chase the droid in a straight line where the other like while the other one goes into one of the uh the businesses and cuts around takes like a longer route and then jumps out the window and manages to catch up to this droid uh, and like intercept it and tackle it. Yeah. It's really weird. Um, also, I guess I don't know how like sturdy battle, like super battle droids are. Apparently, not very if you're able to knock one over just by kicking it. But you know, <laughs> tackling, I don't imagine tackling it is like is a, is a, is a thing you can really do. Yeah, it was just very, very strong. Them. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, but anyway, I don't know. Mando's just very strong. <laughs> yeah, and my, he must be. I don't. I don't fucking know. But anyway, that's how the droid chase scene ends. They knock it down, and it's just take. It's they completely knock it out in the process, um, I guess. And um, so then, like these police droids cordon off the area with this like really neat looking um, hollow police tape that I actually I liked. Um, and so then Din and Bo Katan start studying it. And Bo finds like a, like what's it called? A uh, 
Oh, the um, the charge pad. Yeah, a spark pad is what it's called. That's labeled the resistor, which then I guess deduces from that 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 sounds like the name of a droid bar. Oh wow! A, so I remember uh, a droid bar. A droid bar. Yeah. Those exist. So, also, the name the name the resistor is apparently just one that sounds like the name of a droid bar. I I, I guess droids, droids go to bars now. They yeah, they go they do. to, uh, to get refreshments. We serve their kind here. So so, so this this uh, I I don't want to save this discussion for when we talk about the the, the Nepanthi, right? Because that's really when it comes in as to why the bar <laughs> exists and what the Nepanthi does to break the world because uh-huh. it breaks everything. But I will say just like this again calls into question the sentience of the robots like in this universe like because this is not like they're going to a, a mech station to be repaired right they're not like just doing what they're programmed to do this yeah, is like a body they want to take a like yeah this is they want to take a load off and go socialize like bars aren't just for drinking they're for socializing so well so if, to you know the elephant brain members of uh, of the chat if you remember in a new hope when c3po dips himself in an oil bath um there are like spa like um things that exist that droids can like uh lounge at sort of in leisure. Uh we even see one of them in the Clone Wars, an actual droid spa. And that makes sense because oil baths are apparently a thing the droids can have. Um they can literally dip themselves in oil and like it'll uh presumably I guess help with like their rust or their uh you know anything like that. Lubricate but an actual parts. And I, yeah, lubricate their parts. Yeah, but an actual bar where they sit at tables and drink oil is a little different yeah, what, and a little weird. Where's that oil going? Because like I, I presume this now means that canonically they all have mouths with like esophaguses well, and when I was rewatching stomachs. it, it looked like they all had their uh, they had like these little tubes from like I guess that are serving as straws. They have them connected to like like ports in their in their chests. I think. It makes me wonder, like, so do these droids, do they actually have, like, homes? Do these droids have, like, houses? Like, get, what, uh, how, do, how do they decide to go to these bars? Or, like, do the owners o- order them to go to these bars? Do they request? Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the sentience yeah. problem. Like, yeah. they're developing, they're, like, these droids are now customarily showing a level of sentience where if I was the humans around them, I would be smashing them with hammers before they rise up and kill us. Yeah. <laughs> this is like really dangerous levels of intelligence. Who started this bar? Was it the humans or did the droids were they were they like we want a place for a little R and R and the the and then I guess Lizzo was like yeah go for it. I I, I don't know. It's really concerning. Yeah, it's it's very very concerning behavior. Um, also, before we even skip over it, the resistor is like a type. It's like a computer part. Uh, yeah, why would you not just well. assume that was like the the resistor on the spark pad was just like the label for this com- this like droid's part? Why would you assume that that's the name of a bar? Why specifically or, a droid bar? Wh- why would you not assume that's like I don't know uh, the alias or or like like someone someone's nickname like 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 a hacker right? Yeah, Especially whoever's like, programming well. these droids to malfunction, maybe he's going by the resistor. Yeah. yeah, especially given that the uh, the political r- through line of this episode, and as much as we've managed to drag one out that they've ignored, has been like resi- resisting oppression. So you think yeah. the resistor might be like it might even be like the name of a group, right? That's like organizing these robots or yeah. using the robots as a means of rebellion. But no, well, kind well, of it. Okay. It's kind of that, but not really. Well, also, they they find the droid bar because the spark pad in question has an address on it, which is interesting mm-hmm. because so like bars hand out cards to patrons you know you know if if you're drinking at this bar you'll you want to be able to keep like hold on to a card with an address so that you remember like the address of the place you drank at and you, if you want to come back uh droids don't need that they have yeah, their droids just, they are they can just exchange information by binary mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't need to they don't need to keep a, a little spark pad in their in their circuitry that tells them the location like the the actual physical location of this bar they'll remember yeah. it that's, that's the thing, right? Like, droids are not like people. Droids have infallible memories. And, like, you're going to call this a small nitpick, but it's like they wouldn't have found it otherwise if there wasn't an yeah. address listed on the spark pad. So, no. It is it is the thing that drives the plot. So, okay. it, it, it is relevant. So, like, the, what so what this is, is uh, this is like, it's like a classic uh, detective trope of um, they find a clue, like a, like a matchbook that belongs to a bar, um, and then they go to the bar 
uh, to try to like ask some questions about whoever they lifted the matchbook from, or or like if the matchbook is shown at a crime scene, you know, like like um, <laughs> there, 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 there's a there's a homicide, and at the crime scene somewhere on the ground is a matchbook, and the matchbook belongs to a bar. So then they go around to the bar. You know what I'm talking about. Um, yes. This is basically what they're doing in this show. They're they're absolutely paying an homage to that trope, but in a way that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever because yeah. it's reliant on the concept of a droid bar. And which gets progressively worse when we get more information about this bar and who's running it and what their motives are. And how droids <laughs> work. Like, yeah. It's like they're trying. It's like It's like they really think that that their audience is stupid and they're just trying to like find out what can we get away with? What can we get away with before they're like enough? <laughs> I, I think it's simpler than that. I, I think the writers are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, I don't I'm think the writers not, are making a calculated I'm decision not, about how stupid their audience is. I think I'm they are just picking that. themselves. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm saying it's like that as in, this is so stupid. It's like they are trying to. Mm -hmm. to... Sorry, I'm sorry, Seth, for I'm going to take the bad faith interpretation of these writers because sometimes <laughs> I have not seen enough of their work that I do not yeah, have I, any. No, I've given them enough faith good faith. faith. Yeah. I've given them enough <laughs> good faith. They my faith. Left me down. Are... I refuse to give them any good faith anymore. You're incapable of good faith. <laughs> yes, I am. I am a horrible monster. <laughs> an irredeemable one at that. Yeah, you're an irredeemable monster. Oh, that was bad Jolly, faith. You, you still haven't seen Puss in Boots, have you? No, I still haven't seen it. I really want to watch it. God damn you! Oh, I don't have time. That was bad faith. We watched the menu th earlier. Oh, yeah, well, no. the menu I make time for because the menu is fantastic. Yeah, the menu is fantastic, but so is Puss in Boots: The Last Wish. Oh, I don't have to spend money to watch the, uh, the menu. Oh, that was bad faith. Your criticisms are bad faith. Your, Your bad, bad faith. faith. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it took you long enough. And um, no, Puss in Boots: The Last Wish is not as good as the menu, but that's no excuse, damn you. <laughs> um, this, okay, so there's, there's something to mention before we get to the bar, right? Which is on the way there. Uh, oh, wait, Din is, is well. You had time for the Mandalorian. I did. I did. I did have time for the Mandalorian, but that's because I was. Wish. Wow. I again. I don't have to pay money to watch the Mandalorian that I'm not already paying for Disney Plus. Fair. And I get the menu for Disney Plus. <laughs> the Menulorian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a good chat. I am going to watch Puss in Boots: The Last Wish. I want to. I'm not avoiding it. I genuinely really want to. I've just. I'm. It's a very busy time of year for me, and I have other commitments. And not much money. Well, we can walk it together. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. I'm actually down for that. I, um, I'd, be down. I'd be down to to, to uh, join I have like that. a file of it downloaded. I could literally just upload it to a drive if you're worried about. Like... Sweet. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, do that. Yeah. Sorry, character thing. Before we get to the bar, is that uh, Din is you know his aggression is, is is being aggressive, and so Bo's like, I want you to let me do the talking because uh, you're out of control, man. You're you're a wild card. You're out of control. Um, <laughs> So Din's like, yeah, uh, well, you know, my way's working. And Bo's like, is it though? And they go into the bar. And then, like, all the droids turn around and look at them. And, yeah, she, as you pointed out, they have the reverse of the new Hope line. They're like, I don't think they get many of our kind in here. It's like, I remember that. They said that somewhat in the OT. I can taste the sweet taste of member berries. I watched a new <laughs> Hope one time. And I clapped. <laughs> I actually watched it in um, 1977, and then as I was leaving, I <laughs> put my head on our door. <laughs> because you know, she in 1977, a Mandalorian banged his head off the wall of the writer's room, and now we have to watch this shit. <laughs> God. Uh, God. So, so, yeah. yeah um, do you want to talk about the Nepan thing, or do you want to talk about the, the fact that Bo is made to look an idiot by the fact that his aggression does work, or do you want to talk about Let's the talk droid... About all right, let's, let'll start, let's start off with the bad faith stuff, right? Because they barge in, and Din is like, oh, you know, pulls like a, a spark, uh, some kind of sparking weapon. It's like, tell us what you know, or I'll tear you to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh... and Bo's like, Bo's like, can I have a word? And he's like, yeah, sure, what, what is it? And she's like, you know, I thought I told you to keep a cool head. And he's like, oh, screw you, man. Like, uh, basically, she's like, that's the summary, right? Because she's like, oh, you know... Um, the, 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 you know, we're going to try and reason with them. It's like, you can't reason with them. And he's like, well, they're robots. All they do is reason. He's like, oh, yeah? Like the ones attacking people? I'm like, Din, they're malfunctioning, you dipshit. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, by definition, they're acting against their programming at that point. They're but anyway. acting against reason, yeah. 
Yeah, but anyway, while they're having this discussion, it turns out Din's right and Bo is a moron because the robot's like, oh, actually, I do want to help now that you're threatening me. <laughs> yeah, he literally so, sides with Din and then Din's like, do I need to take out your hearing receptors too? Yeah, it's like, it's like let me help you. And Din's like, Calm fuck down. you, bro, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Calm down, he's agreeing with you, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like you know, if you're a police officer and like you've got a, a, an informant in like a drug ring, and he's like, uh, so the drugs are being moved. Uh, like, you're like, oh, I wanna, I'm going to talk to my informant. He'll know. And the informant's like, yeah, the drugs are in that warehouse. And then you just grab the informant. It's like, do you want to rip your fucking eyes out? It's like, I told you, man. <laughs> like good cop, bad cop, but the bad cop is actually trying to hurt the criminal. Like, he doesn't have <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, like a method to him. He's just being an asshole. Um, but yeah, so like, the, there's, there's, oh god. So the droid then go. The droid barman is like, oh, who previously was like really unhelpful, like being deliberately yeah. unhelpful. Yeah. Suddenly it's like, oh, I'll be super helpful now because actually we droids are really concerned about this because we don't want to be replaced. And I'm like, if you're concerned, why didn't you just volunteer your information? In fact, why aren't you investigating this yourself? And in fact, given what happens next, you could have investigated this yourself and solved it all yourselves. And mm -hmm. you clearly have the independence to do that because you made a bar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys wanted this information uh, you know, out. You wanted it solved. Maybe they were just like, even if we do solve it, no one's going to listen to us. Who um, um, wouldn't you at least wouldn't you at least try it? Yeah. Who uh, rather than wait to be dismantled? Who who came up with the idea of opening a droid bar? Was it a droid or was it that was my question? Droid? Yeah, like who decided on this? Uh, I don't know. How did they? Them? How did they get licensed for their business? Far be it from me to be concerned dude, about, about. Honestly, if we're gonna do droid sentience. Like, if you want to do this concept, this could have been like a speakeasy. Yeah, we could have had a, a an actual. The thing is, though, that becomes nightmare fuel. Like, I, I agree, it would be interesting, but it does become nightmare fuel if it turns out the droids have secretly been like organizing secret clubs where they can commiserate about their enslavement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be really horrifying to think about. But apparently, no, they actually apparently just do what's it happening out though public, it, to public yeah. knowledge. So, all right, uh, and no one, no one cares. Which no actually, cares. you know what? You could even you could even have drawn that parallel of being like maybe the, the villain was willing to use the droids to serve their own agenda and. Thus, in a way, was the kind of oppressor he was reigning against. But oh, that's no, we can't have interesting plot. So we can't have that. Um, this was a really weird line from the bar droid here, where he's like, oh, the reason, you know, it's, it, organics made us, human lives are so short, organic lives are so short, the least we can do is, like, help them out. And I'm like, this is a universe where, like, some species can live for, like, a thousand plus years. Humans yeah. are, like, very much a short-lived exception to that rule. And indeed... Even though droids can theoretically live a very long time because they don't age, in reality they're used for like dirty and dangerous jobs where they'll, they'll have a very short life expectancy and be replaced and scrapped. I, I'm, I don't know what this line is. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, he says like they created us. The least we can do is help out, and it's like what? <laughs> they they created us for our perpetual well, torments. Well Speaking from a <laughs> from a, a, a um, ex religious standpoint, you don't actually owe your creator anything. Yeah, fuck my creator. Created. He's done nothing to me. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be an interesting parallel since we're doing a whole religion angle in this season? Yeah. You know? But but she if you forget of being that would created be... and like, do you owe your creator anything? Um, how much should you devote your own agency to this to this religion, you know? Yeah, but she that would be interesting and we can't have that. And and again, for people who are actually interested in that, Isaac Asimov, who is like the man who wrote about robots, he he wrote iRobots. Mm -hmm. He has a short story where he literally does this, where like robots make religion. Um, it's really interesting, and you should read it. It's miles better than this shit. I would definitely. Uh, that sounds interesting. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so the droid, bar, the droid um, barman goes through its records, and like in a split second, like it literally just goes through the records. And goes, oh, it turns out all the droids that malfunctioned drank the same batch of Nabanthe. Now let's talk about the Nabanthe. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the second piece of technology after the, the, the remote piloting that breaks everything. Yeah, um, apparently uh, you can put like nanotechnology inside of Nabanthe and then distribute yeah. it into droids. And as it is working in the droids, as they're consuming it, you could reprogram the entire uh, base. Yeah, so to, to lay this out, as clearly as possible, right? Nabanthe is like a, a kind of universal lubricant because apparently there aren't different kinds of grade of oil that different robots might need, like there are with cars, but screw it. Mm. Um, there is a universal lubricant, which is Nabanthe, and that's what they've been drinking. And in, in the Nabanthe, other than just being a lubricant, there are what are called nanoparticles, um, which are nanobots, and the, the later I've seen confirms this, 
and they have the effect of like updating software patches for robots one you know as and when patches are made to like from sort of supreme command or security booth or whatever yeah and that sounds all fine and dandy until you realize that what they've actually just done there is create a liquid that can reprogram anything on the fly mm -hmm. just from being thrown on it all it has to do yeah is, is make physical contact with the droid the, the, the droid doesn't have to drink it or consume it anyway they just have to touch it so you, you know how we, back when we did our clone war stream and we, we started the two worms law about how silly the two worms are as an assassination tactic <laughs> genuinely Here's something you could have done with Nabanthe. You could have just put Nabanthe like in, you know, you swapped out like the clean, like the Febreze air conditioning, like, you know, cleaning liquid in Padme's apartment. And the next time someone re uh, polishes R2, he'd be mm -hmm. reprogrammed to a homicidal lunatic who would slit her throat in, his, in her sleep. Yep. That would be like, much more subtle than uh, anything they, that Zam and Jango tried to do. <laughs> Yeah, and this is like that's just like the most obvious one. The the actual implications of this, the applications of this, are just beyond imagining. Like warfare. And so, and uh, I mean, does that apply to like uh, ship computers? Um, yeah, because we, cause well, we know that the Millennium Falcon, like even before the whole solo retcon with L three, we know that like C three PO could talk to the to the Falcon. Yeah. Uh, and also, there's the thing of like a, you know voidness in ships. Could the Clone Wars not have been won overnight by just dropping this Nepenthe on all the battle droids? Yeah. Dude, yeah. fucking make Nepenthe bombs. Yeah. I, I, this is, this is, uh, fuck, it fucks everything. Could it you fucks take, everything. Could you take like a small little vial of Nepenthe and, and disperse it through the controls of the Death Star? I, I, I maybe. I mean, there's, there's no limit set on what this thing can do because now that we've introduced nanotechnology into Star Wars, we're all kind of buggered. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, nanodroids did exist as early as the Clone Wars. They were used in the bomb to blow up the temple. But the, it was never specifically outlined that these nanodroids could reprogram uh, droids like on the fly based on... Yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll be honest, that introduction in the Clone Wars is problematic in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Like That's not something we're pointing to and being like, well, you know, that makes it okay. Like, No, that was bad as well. Yeah, but this has made well. it much, much worse. Like, yeah, this, so this thing can absolutely just... like. Uh, completely change R two D two and C three PO's like yep. personalities, and yeah, I mean it could entirely re we reprogram them. I mean, fucking hell. Yeah, it's it's you know why did we bother smashing up our C three PO in Cloud City? Why not just like reprogram him and make him a spy? Why was Cad why not torturing C three PO for the the Senate building yeah. schematic? Why not just inject him with Nepenthe? I, uh, could they not? Could they not uh, have used Nepenthe to uh, uh, recover C three PO in the Rise of Skywalker? Yeah, you think yeah. so? You think just Barbie Frick would have it? But hell, why didn't we just do that for the IG eleven? Well, um, it's like he's not able to. Uh, it's like against his programming to speak the Sith tongue. Literally, just put in like yeah, just reprogram him. with Nepenthe. Yeah, I, I, uh... yeah. And side note. The band thing sounds like a really bad like aftershave brand. Like it sounds like something that Ron Burgundy uses. Well, yeah. Every time we keep citing examples, I say use Nepenthe, and then it it sounds like I'm like making a, a Nepenthe commercial. Oh, hang on. Okay, I will be back in two minutes. My burger is ready. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, he watched the menu earlier, so it made him hungry for a burger, which is uh, fair. That's exactly what happened to me when I watched it. I've got like a <laughs> actually got like a gourmet burger joint that's like right around the corner from my house, and that's really nice. A they fit, make, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. They make a cheeseburger. They make it. They have a cheeseburger with. Uh, well, it's a, it's called a Philadelphia cheesesteak cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there's was there not more? Oh, I mean, there, there's there's a I mean, there's a lot more. Like, there's one. I mean, I, would, I to, thought you were going to like talk more well, about this. Well, you ever been to like one that's uh, that that they like they like they put an onion ring on the burger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got like one of those sorts of things. They've got one where it's like, oh, they put up like a, they've got, God, I think it's called like the the wild Jamaican or something. They've got like a pineapple ring in there. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. There's a Five Guys near my house. Uh, it was actually the first time mm. I'd ever had it uh, recently, and um, it was pretty good. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a Five Five Guys in my area. It's also worth pointing out that there are currently 66 people watching the stream, so that's. <laughs> Based. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's just look at some comments. 
Sheev, the Jedi would have to use the that one force power in Phantom Menace to beat these B2s, you know. What? Uh, does he mean when... I don't know that that's what he's referring to. To one beat these power B2s. To beat these B2s. I remember there's a scene in Attack of the Clones where Kit Fisto has to use the force to knock one over. Is that what he's talking about? Are you, is this in response to force speed or be specific? Okay, well, mm. um, I guess I don't know if Jolly wants to be in it when, like, when we're talking about the show. I, I, I guess we could move on. Uh, I, I, I would well, vote that we wait for Jolly there. I guess. I mean, we can wait. It's just that we don't have all the time in the world. I have to work in a few hours, so I'm trying oh, to get through these. And we we're still only <laughs> not even halfway through this coverage, and. Uh, <laughs> We wanted to try to keep this about five hours or or less. So, mm. so yeah, uh, there is a chance we might have to split this into two parts, uh, which is not what I wanted to do. But uh, it's possible Man, we'll have to. So bad. We will go for the, to the five hour uh, limit, and um, if there's still more to talk about after that, we'll just have to reconvene, and it'll just have to be a short stream, I guess. But uh, yeah. Cause I, cause I work. Um, it is currently two nineteen my time. I work at five. I want to stop the stream at no later than like four twenty, four thirty, so that I can actually get ready for work. Uh, I have returned somehow. Cool, good, awesome. We 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 really need to pick up the pace here. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it needs to be. We could always do like a finale, right? But like, yeah, it, ideally we'd like to get through it. So yeah, where are we at? Uh, so we just got. We were talking about the Nepenthe. We we didn't continue while you were gone. We were talking about burgers. Well, burgers are delicious. Yes. And anyway, uh, so, then they go to the droid morgue. <laughs> oh god, yeah. Droid. Uh, why, why? <laughs> the droid why is this, one of the body things? Why is this just the unlock workshop? I don't Slab. know. That's a great question. It's an actual morgue that they have a droid like on the gurney, uh, and they're studying it. Uh, and they like extract they okay. So then they extract a sample of the Nepenthe to see what's going on with it. They use a droid to do this for some reason. Great idea. <laughs> and then well, to be fair, they, they don't know what's up with it, right? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, to be fair, they don't know that the Nepenthe is doing this to things yet. Sure, but they at least suspect it, right? Because that's why they're studying it in the first place. I mean, I they're so know. worried they, about they, this whole thing. The, is them. I mean, the, this whole thing is them investigating like droids malfunctioning, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. maybe use the human worker there to uh, to just take the syringe and and extract it that way. Can't I don't know. Hacked. Just a thought. Maybe maybe humans can also be hacked by Nepenthe. Have you ever thought about that, Southpaw? <laughs> oh, God. You know, I would not put it past these writers to invent something like mm. Nepenthe for humans. Oh, please. Oh, God. That would fuck with everything. <laughs> oh, all the torture scenes that you could have just had. You could have just put Nepenthe in the... In no, the no, room. it's worse than that. If, if, they do that. if they do that for people, Order 66 and the inhibitor chips goes out the window. They'll also, they'll also <laughs> introduce a Nepenthe that, that allows people to reprogram droids so that they know everything. No, stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then they're looking at the um, at the Nepenthe up close in like a little um, fucking, what, what do I think, a, a microscope. And um, the lady is like, hey, what's this? There's like a chain code on this. And they zoom in real close and they see, how does it go again? They're like, this was ordered. Uh, this, oh, this yeah, so it's, it was ordered by, it. it was ordered by okay. security. Sorry, like, so basically like it was, um, these droids weren't purchased via the like the council, which is what they should have been done. They were requisitioned by Illegally security. Requisitioned by security, yeah. Um, uh, and she's like, "That's illegal. You can't do that." And I'm like, "Well, then why would there be a record of it?" Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I don't, don't get that. But also, that's what I do when I make my illegal uh, purchases. I write it down. Mandatory quick action scene. Then the droid that extracted the Nepenthe gets infected by it and starts shooting lasers at them, and then Din has to like shoot it. So that happened. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, then they go to confront Christopher Lloyd because, oops, he's the one who ordered it. That must mean that he's the bad. He's the baddie. So then 
let's find out. Well, first of all, actually. So then they're like, hey, we know it was you. And he like opens the case where that big red button I mentioned earlier was. And he's like, if I press this button, <laughs> it'll turn all the droids evil and feral and they'll turn on the, the humans. Um, which has to be right because we we've already we just established how the droids were reprogrammed and it you know like a big red button that just over once isn't possible based on what we just learned so this had to have been yeah. a bluff on his part right which well, Din and I Bo guess should the, have the best picked is, up on but they didn't apparently I guess it's still like, you're still threatened right. to shut down all the robots right because that's what the button was yeah hello but that's not what he yeah. bluffed just now <laughs> you, you not hear me. Oh, I know, but like, I, I, I guess that's always like the risk, right? It's like even if he's made some bullshit up, like if he presses that button, there's still like a lot of damage. Sure. Uh, I just wish that had been what he said because it wasn't. Um, yeah, true. Which is weird, and that's something they should have called him on. But anyway, so then Bo-Katan, uh, who, by the way, used to be, a, uh, you know, like a revolutionary, like a terrorist, um, who's been in the exact situation of this guy, and we're going to draw some parallels here in a second. But Bo-Katan as a, I guess a negotiation tactic is like, there's nowhere to run. Yeah. Uh, there, like, there's no way out is what she says. Damn, where is so Magic I, when, when you need him? <laughs> so but, again, to, to, <laughs> to, to lay this out as clearly as possible, because I think this is why I raised to Yushi, right? Of like, what she's effectively done from a hostage negotiation tactic is you have a guy in a corner. Who has nothing left to lose. Yeah, holding a bomb, he's got nothing left to lose and is like committed to his ideology. Mm -hmm. You do not want to give him the impression that he has no way out because he mm -hmm. will just he will just press that button. Yep. Um, it's a good thing he doesn't, but you know. Yeah, it's, they're really lucky he doesn't. I don't know why they've they've just they've they're like forcefully making Bo-Katan an idiot in this episode. This is what the third yeah she's chronically is. stupid. Yeah, this is um, chronically thick in this episode, and we're not done with her yet. Yeah. Um, my God. <laughs> so then he's explaining his motivations, which are basically, I want a true democracy. I fucking hate Jack Black. Uh, he used to be an imperial. I don't, I don't just, 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 like, just that. I'm not even like, I hate the character. I hate Jack Black. I saw School of Rock and I hate this. <laughs> I saw Nacho Libre. It was actually not bad, but I still hate Jack Black. I never <laughs> forgave him for how disappointing Kung Fu Panda 3 was. No. <laughs> Oh um, god. And he's like, yeah, I believe in the separatists. Count Dooku was a visionary and like and the Jedi cut him down uh in his prime, which is a weird thing to say about a guy who was like in his 80s when he died, but that's actually I really interesting. Prime. Can we can we explore? Nope, he gets shot. He gets knocked out by well, Bo-Katan. Well, it's, it's it's even weirder than that, right? Because there's there's someone actually in this room who has worked directly with Dooku, has met Dooku. Mm -hmm. Lost a sister to the, I, I mean, not ultimately to Darth Maul, but like put in motion by the machinations of Dooku. Yeah. Someone who might have a lot to say about whether Dooku was a genuine believer yeah. in the cause that this guy has put his life, his, his, you know, his faith in, who Here's might even have thing. something to say about the nature of these causes herself. Here's the thing we have two characters here who would both have a lot to say about the Separatists. They would oh, not yeah. have very kind things to say about the Separatists. Um, hey, hey, Den, remember who killed your family? You remember? <laughs> remember? You know, neither of them says anything about this. Who but cares? yeah, so you know all this, um, dear listeners, you know all those motivations we did earlier for what the show could, this episode could be doing thematically about the oppressors rising up against the you know, you know, oppressors, sorry, the oppressed rising up against the oppressors and comparing robot rights to the struggle, or like this, this, all the fishy oh, weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all the um, all the weird details that don't quite mesh about like the the nature of having these royals and a direct democracy and all these little hints that could have been used in effective ways. Remember all of that. Yeah, yeah. So oh, we have a character finally talk about it and be like, "This is my motivation. It's all about oppression." And then he gets cut off immediately. And the <laughs> next line, and Ken, literally. Okay, and I I just want to preface this. I yeah. yelled. I hollered. I was angry. I was fucking livid. I was what? frothing him out. I'm sorry. Bokatan uh, knocks him out and says, ugh, politics. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Diego Lopez said he wrote that pizza song and I'm tired, I'm of, tired it. of it. Jack Black, Jack Black, Jack Black. Jack Black Jack. Oh, no, Chief, 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 you. Chief you'll, get, you'll get this reference. It's like the menu where it's like my one day off every four months. 
And I saw your movie, Jack Black. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking face. Holy shit. <laughs> that, uh, no, but that pissed me the fuck off. That line from is a, from really a, aggravating. From a meta perspective, just putting aside, obviously, the prequel hate and, like, the, oh, politics bad. Jolly and I were talking about this when the episode came out. We were pissed. It really reads like John Favreau saw, like, Andor saw, like, a person actually trying to make a real story, really actually, like, build a world and, like, use politics to do that. And he was like, stop. This isn't what Star... No, stop it. Politics mean. Oh, yeah. He was mad that they made it. He was literally mad over a TV show. He was mad that they made a show that was better than his and, like, better than his ever will be. And he was like, No. Well, like this is the it um, sorry, no, no, no. It, it, it gets it gets worse because then the best episode of the season is him doing a pale imitation of Andor. Yeah, well, it's not. It's, it's not him though, is it? It's uh, it's whoever was doing Rangers of the New Republic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's his show. It's you know weird. You know what's weird again. is that aside from John Favreau, the guy who wrote that episode has several writing credits for the Book of Boba Fett. Oh God! It's like, how did we get episode three of Mandalorian season three? How did we I get the crushing episode from John the stars Favreau, aligned. the Boba Fett writer? What the fuck happened? The, the stars aligned. Miracles. Were, that's the only for, for the briefest moment of pure show. instinct. He actually gave a shit. It is possible, yeah. but rare, for a book of Boba Fett writer to write an actual good story. Even a book well, of Boba I, Fett writer. I'd like to. I'd like to raise this as like the you know things to be inspired by of like even the lowest of the low, the worst of all writers. <laughs> if you just if you just try harder, you can reach for better. It's mm. possible. Anyone can improve. This Anyone proved can it. Wear the mask. Anyone can wear the mask. <laughs> uh, anyone can learn to check the car at the border. You just have to leave. <laughs> No, but uh, yeah, politics bad. That's the end of that scene. We're not going to get any more of that. What well, again? To expand on your point, part of the episode, it's over. To expand on your point, right? Of like, because the, the feeling I got, and, and you agreed with me, was like the pet was the sheer pettiness of the line because it really, it did really read like uh, John Favreau saw the critical acclaim that Andor was getting, and was just like, who, who are these people? No, no, I'm running Star Wars, not them. And then put in a line being like, ha, 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 your show boring, your show didn't get a lot of viewers, ha. And I'm just like, like, you know, maybe I'm being extremely bad faith, maybe John Favreau had no intention of doing that, but like it really comes across, particularly after all the discourse we've just had about like Andor's popularity versus like whether people were turned off by the politics and the kind of like fanboy on Twitter response to it, where loads of people to this day in Chief and I comment sections will tell us that Andor was boring and bad and they can't tell us why. And so, like, it really feels like John Fro is pandering to that. That's the thing. At this point, when people tell me that Andor is boring, I just stop listening to them. Yeah. It's, they have nothing I, of value to say. And I'm sorry to say that. I know that sounds mean or snobbish or whatever. But, like, no. I, y- your opinion stopped meaning anything to me the second you said Andor was boring. Well, it's the second you stopped qualifying what exactly you I meant, think- right? Like, mm. Oh, God, gee, you're just you're just mad that your sacred cow was criticized. <laughs> I'm I'm mad that the co- actually, yeah as a philosopher, someone who teaches philosophy, this is deeper than that. I am mad that the concept of giving a shit about politics is being laughed on. Mm-hmm. Dude, I don't know if anyone's looked around at the world we're living in right now. Whether you're on the left or the right, I don't think anyone's thinking that the world's particularly good right now. Investment in politics is something we should all be aspiring to. We should all give a shit. It affects everybody. Mm-hmm. And to have a TV show that's called fucking Star Wars turn around and be like, yeah, politics is for nerds. You know, it was like a much better way of doing this, of not not doing this specific thing, but like just the idea of just having a character just express like a, a disinterest in politics. Revenge of the Sith. Oh, no, I'm not brave, brave enough for politics. You know, like that sort of thing. Just mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's. That's Obi Wan nope. saying that. So we've right? literally we've we've literally had this already in that, in this season, right? So during the Pershing episode, mm-hmm. we had the the Republic senators oh, who, who were like, like oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Empire you Rebellion, don't even notice. Republic, it's all the same to me. Yeah, and he's presented ironically because he is as like a bad person because he's like, I don't care about the oppression of others because when the politics changes to make their lives miserable, I'm still on top, so I don't yep. give a shit. Right, it doesn't affect me, so it's not a big deal. 
Yeah, so like Jean Favreau or whoever's writing this line, right? When you put in a line, be like, <laughs> politics is for nerds. You are mm-hmm. unironically revealing to us that you are one of those elite people who just does not give a shit about the suffering of others because you will always be the elite class who is not affected by this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, it, uh, again, bad taste in my mouth doesn't begin to cover it. I, I hate this line. I hate it, Chief. Make it go away. I'm so annoyed that this line exists. It fucking, oh. Uh, also, God, the fact that bo is the one to say it. Bo-Katan is like the most Bo-Katan. political character. Yeah. She was a fucking right, like extremist. Her sister was a duchess. <laughs> was like the leader. Yeah, of the she was part of the royal the, family. Dude, she left dude, the royal dude. family because she didn't like the direction that Mandalore was going in. Dude, the, the only reason they are on this planet at all is because she wants to politically reunify her people to reestablish their homeland. Uh, what is going on? It's not even consistent with her character in the show. I can't believe they uh, assassinated Bo Katan. What this. character, Southpaw? What character? <laughs> I, I mean, I am happy to say, like, unironically, they did assassinate Bo Katan this season. They didn't just assassinate her, they violated the corpse. Yep. I, 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 I've never seen, with the exception maybe of Luke in Last Jedi, or like a Daenerys in Game of Thrones season 8, or Jamie in season 8, or in fact, most of the characters in season 8. Outside of Game of Thrones season 8 and the sequel trilogy, I don't think I've ever seen such a profound assassination of a single character. Yeah, no. Um, I'm trying to think. Jamie Lannister season eight. That was really bad. Yeah, that, that, that was really, really bad. bad. That was really insulting, actually, and upsetting. I have never. I mean, it was so bad that like Game of Thrones was destroyed as an IP, and the work and the writers could never get work again. Mm-hmm. Even Star Wars didn't want to hire. Star them. Wars wouldn't <laughs> take them. <Yeah. laughs> oh no. And it, and it took the good work of like 10 episodes of House of the Dragon being excellent to even begin to wash the bad taste out of my mouth. And even then, it's still like, I know where it's going, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> we cut back to Jack Black and Lizzo. They've been playing space croquet with Grogu this entire episode. Um, and I'm just so exhausted. I'm sorry. And they come into the room and like they got Christopher Lee in handcuffs and they're like, what's what's going on here? And, Christopher uh, Lloyd, not Christopher Lee. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Dooku. Dooku's back. <laughs> no. Somehow Dooku no. returned. Nobody's <laughs> ever really gone. He's got he's got a robotic head now. They gave with, the power him of C- with the power of CGI Southport, you know it's gonna happen eventually. They, they gave him bionic hands and they gave him a bionic head too. And now that's a really actually, that's a really interesting question. Like if, if they ever brought back Dooku in a TV show, like live action Dooku, like if they used CGI to resurrect Christopher Lee. I'd be do you think that might be the point? Do you think that might be the point where people are like, no, this has gone too far? Like you are, you are, this is like no one's on board with this. You are just pissing everybody off. Mm. Well, maybe you'd think, but like you, I've I've found that there are just no limits to what people will defend. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, hell has no basement in the Star Wars the, universe. The Star defenders of Kenobi and Book of Boba Fett, we can go lower. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. The second that I started unironically debating Kenobi defenders and seeing their arguments was like, oh. But so there see, really no limit. But in see, 1977, in 1977, in 1977, he's on a door frame. Uh, <laughs> I'm just having a mental breakdown. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, hit the head real quick. Uh, Jolly, just explain what happens in this scene. Oh, the yeah. I'll I'll, I'll round up the episode. I'll, I'll get to the I'll get to Bo-Katan's scene by the we get back. Hopefully. Uh. Right, so everybody, um, Southpaw, how are you doing? Um, I'm I'm doing I'm doing just right. Wait, wait, where's where's Sheev? He's gone to the loo for a second. The toilet, yeah. as I, I think you Americans call it. Um, oh, okay. You bloody yanks. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, so here in Old Brighty, we don't call it the fucking lav- the toilet. We call it the lavatory, the loo. Um. I, I anyway, I, I, yeah. I what you guys called uh, that uh, that art gallery that you have over in your city. Oh, that's the that's the Louvre. That's in, that's in Paris. I, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! No, in in French, it's la, la, la toilette or la commode. But anyway, <laughs> um, interesting fact here: like, there is no actual word for the actual toilet, like object itself, right? Because the word toilet doesn't refer to that; it refers to the room because it mean it comes from the French for like clean, right? Really? So okay. like, yeah. So the, there is no word in English actually for the mechanical device that you sit on to take a dump. We just have a bunch of euphemisms that are tied to the room that you find it in, which is really interesting about like how like the prudishness of like the English English language. 
Well, then that's, that's um, the question, like, like, is there a word, like a unique word that we could coin for it that isn't uh, rooted in, like, you know, if, if, if toilet, <clears throat> if the English word is, uh, is a derivation of, of the French the word, French. Then, right? It's like, so is there a, is there a new word that we could make this like un, unique to it? That's not well, that's the thing. We have, uh, we have the, like the bathroom because it's the room where you find the bath, but like now that's obviously like not where you find a bath, it's where you find a loo. Right. And like. Even the word "loo" is like it comes from lavatory, which is like I, I, I can't remember the origins of the word, but again, it's to do with the room, not the uh, not the object. I guess the closest we'd have is like calling it the crapper after Thomas <laughs> Crapper because he invented the flushing toilets. The crapper um, shitter. We call the dumpster. Yeah. You guys should spend this Shit. entire time I was gone talking about bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at all of that. I'm we so got sidetracked into an interesting discussion about the etymology of toilets. <laughs> Unironically, that was more interesting than anything the, the fucking Mandalorian did. So, did, I mean, did you not see why we were talking about this? <laughs> all right. So, uh, there's plenty for Jack Black and Lizzo that uh, Christopher Lloyd um, betrayed them. And they're like, is this true? And he's just like, I'm sorry, but I hate Jack Black. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, Jack Black's like, I knew you never liked me. And it's like, fuck you. You know how that, like, that bizarre, uh, like, pot calling the kettle black? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he oh, says, well, that's not the crack they are calling the stiffling slimy. Yes. I hate that line. Make it go away. <laughs> it's so yeah. annoying now. It's it's been overplayed. I'm tired of hearing it. Once was overplayed. This line should not exist. Uh, anyway, <sighs> so then he's like, "Listen, I hate this. I, I want real democracy." And then, and I hate him. And uh, she's like, "Well, I'm very disappointed in you. And this is the man that I love. And I hope that one day you'll come to accept him." And he's like, man, I feel really bad about what I did. I hope one day you'll be able to forgive me. And she's like, perhaps <sighs> perhaps someday, but for now you must be banished to the moon. And then she just sends him away. And he gets I, um, escorted by little security bots to the moon to be in exile, I guess. I do like it when characters just about face on their entire personal motivations because Lizzo is upset with them. Yeah, she's just like mad at him. She's like, I'm, I'm disappointed. He's like, I'm sorry. It's like, dude. No, rather than, rather rather than like, rather than shut up, bitch. You're the person enslaving our population and driving us into the dirt, and you yeah, married I'm, an imperial who oppressed yeah, like, us for I'm ages. I'm really unhappy with the way things are going, and I wish that you would change things. And she's like, well, well, that makes me but, sad to hear. And he's like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> but, but I want to play armadillo croquet. Yeah. Which, by the way, just a side note, that's fucked up. You're these are living animals, and you're just like <laughs> cutting them through these. That's Remember, fucked up. Remember when they did well, this? Well, it's in yeah. keeping with this population's like political system, right? Of just oppressing everyone that's moving. But it's weird. It's like you guys have just you've just established this dystopia, this like elite society of like horrible people, and you're not even like doing anything. Like you don't you even seem to realize you've done it. Remember when this happened in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy One, but it made sense because you know nowhere was just it was supposed to be a place like uh, you know it was supposed to be a wretched hive of scum and villainy. It made yeah. sense for them to to have games like that. Yeah, it's great that we got this. Uh, this, you know, direct dem democracy. Yeah, uh, that's uh, it's kind of like. Uh, imagine if we'd done a version of the Hunger Games, where like rather than the capital being presented as like uh, you know elitist and cruel and apathetic and like uh, you know just emotionally removed yeah. from everyone else, we just have like President Snow, unironically being presented as like a nice man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, now, I know that I make children fight for our entertainment, but. I, you know, I'm a really good guy deep down, you know, and I, yeah, I, I love, I love my granddaughter, so I'm an all right guy, really. Imagine and like I played croquet with Baby Yoda. Like, how can you hate me? <laughs> Imagine if the Hunger Games like reached the level of success that the Harry Potter series did, and there was like a a the 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 capital world of the Hunger Games, and then you like it's a theme park. You go to the theme park. <laughs> so and so what's interesting? Hunger Games. <laughs> so what's interesting, Southport, is and she, you'll know what I'm talking about here. I have a relative who's in those movies, so I have a special hatred of those movies. <laughs> yeah. I, had, uh, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, to be fair, she's only in the last two, but like, yeah, stuff. It's, it's, yeah. I fucking hate those movies. I went to the premiere <laughs> of like, I think it was the, 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 the second last one and like bumped into Jennifer Lawrence and she was really rude for no reason. So I'm just like, you're awful. You're a horrible person. You're an irredeemable <laughs> 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 
Um, I will say though, like, I actually kind of like the books. I think of, of all the young teen dystopian bullshit, they are by far and away the only one that has anything even vaguely meritorious to say. Hmm. I couldn't get past the first few chapters of the first book. I don't care for the Hunger Games. Uh, I don't like totally fair. But uh, aren't you excited, Sheep, for the giant HBO Harry Potter series we're going to be getting? Uh, Isn't that what you've all been asking for? No. I just <laughs> I want to die. Yeah. Oh, God. I yeah, you're right, Diego Lopez. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence is the first female action star, and you know, we should all be grateful to her for the, the glass <laughs> ceilings she, she shattered. But back to the abysmal episode, because we're about to get to the best part of the, you know, the best scene. <laughs> so, just real quick. Uh, also, Baby Yoda gets knighted. Fuck it. Why not? Uh, yeah, whatever. Sir, Sir Din Grogu is his official name now. Oh, um, I have things to say about the Din Grogu thing, but we'll get there when we yeah. get there. So he gets like knighted by like a real sword, which is funny. But also, um, why doesn't Mando care about like the safety of this child? Because this is a small moment, but like this lady that I don't know, that I don't really trust, just took a sword and is like holding it and is like bringing it down toward this baby that I'm that is in my charge. Like I would at least want to see him like tense up or something, but he doesn't give a shit. Well, to be fair, he was happy to have Ragnar beat the shit out of Grogu, so you know, yeah, yeah. his parenting is in question at this point. What a great yeah. dad he is. He's a terrible <laughs> what a great father. guy. Holy shit. Yeah, he's, he's as bad a father to Grogu as the watch was to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess it runs in the family. So Lizzo's <clears throat> like, all right, you guys can go talk to the Mandalorians now. Here you go. They also give Bo-Katan a key. It's just a giant key. <laughs> just a giant key. All right, so they go to talk to the Mandalorians. <laughs> Woohoo! Finally, Woo! what we came here for. Wow! Well... <laughs> no. Uh, they're all just kind of chilling outside. Axe Woves is sitting on like a crate. Um, and he's like, what are you fucking doing here? And she's like, I'm back, bitches. And um, he's like, we don't like follow you anymore. We, we may be loyal, but not until we don't like you. And we don't, then we're not loyal anymore. And um, she's like, well, then I challenge you to a duel. And he's like, okay. And then <laughs> they have a duel. Jolly, you want to take this one? <laughs> so, you know how I said earlier, momentum doesn't exist in the Star Wars universe. This, oh, fuck my life. So this is a battle where two supposedly trained warriors flail around like frightened school children uh, with no technique yeah. or tactical noose or anything like that, right? And part of their fight involves taking like standing there like lemons while the other person takes a running startup and then ignites their jetpacks they're going at several dozens of miles per hour like at least 60 miles an hour into another human being who's only wearing armor and then they crash into the side of like ships and stuff yep and like legs remain unbroken organs unruptured like here's the thing right <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're wearing armor um you know conservation of momentum is still a thing like the energy has to go somewhere so if it's if the if the armor isn't breaking, you are underneath it. Um, that's how that works. It doesn't shock absorb. So if I fling you, if you're wearing a suit of armor and I fling you into a wall at eighty miles an hour, you're very dead. Yeah, uh, but that's, it, that's uh, provided that momentum exists, and maybe momentum's not a thing on this planet, <laughs> or indeed on any planet, as far as we can tell. <laughs> it's not even it's not even a, a thing in space. Yeah. Well, so. That that happens. The fight happens. She wins, uh, but it doesn't really mean anything because they're still they're still like, yeah, but you don't have the dark saber. You won't challenge Din for it for some reason, and he's a religious zealot, so we're not going to follow him. Um, he says we don't have a. He doesn't have like an out a drop of Mandalorian blood in him. We don't follow him, which I guess means that some of these Mandalorians only follow Mandalorians that are like specifically Mandalorian by blood. So, yeah, so this is going to tie into uh, an abandoned aspect of Mandalorian culture. Well, again, if we get there, if we have to do a second part, right? Like, when yeah, I talk about Mandalorian to. culture, yeah. When we talk about the squandering of Mandalorian culture, yeah. previously, the way it was kind of set up was, like, analogous to, like, the Edo period of Japan, right? Where you had, like, clans with, like, clan heads or daimyos. I know that word's been s spoiled now. But, like, in real history, where you had daimyos with ruling clans and like that would be like their direct bloodline and then you had like a bunch of affiliated like sworn swordsmen samurai class people who were like bound to you and that yeah. was kind of how Mandalorian culture seemed to work right like clan ren was was um in in service to clan crees and stuff like that 
Um, that kind of got thrown out of the way with the watch and the children of the watch and the, the idea of foundlings, which hadn't previously been a thing. Um, so I, I get that that might be a thing, but the problem is the show's done nothing to actually like explore that or draw back on rebel stuff about that. And so it kind of comes out of nowhere and then it's not followed up on. Yeah. Which is bullshit. No. <laughs> so yeah, they're like, so why should we follow you? You still don't have the sword. Um, why oh, the reason she didn't fight him as well? Yeah, the reason yeah, she didn't fight him was apparently she just apparently they're like, oh, we told you to go fight him, but you just didn't want to because you like him. Which like what? What, <laughs> what the she fuck? Didn't him. She barely knew him, and like she's a ruthless. I, I keep it saying she's a ruthless really. pragmatist. But also, like, even who cares? You don't have to hurt him significantly. You just yeah, have to I, fight I him. You just have to beat him in a I, fight. I don't get this. Just so, fight yeah, him. I don't know why she didn't challenge him ever. That was, I remember people were saying, you know, that's going to be explained. It wasn't. No. It was never explained. <laughs> it's just apparently she had a crush on him or one, something. I guess. Um, but then <laughs> we're introduced to oh, a bit no. of a loophole in, uh, in Dark Saber lore. So hold on to your head. Oh, just Jesus Christ. Christ. I remember, I remember but, like, oh, Jolly and Sheep are going to love this. Before we oh. even talk about it, let me li just lay out exactly what happens, what he says, and what the Mandalorians decide to accept. Um, and then we can talk about it because we had a lot to say. So he's like, back in, back when I was um, on Mandalore exploring, which first of all, none of the Mandalorians react to that. So that's interesting. He says, while I was on Mandalore, uh, I was attacked and briefly captured by someone and then Bo-Katan came and like picked up the, the sword and killed my captor, thereby slaying the enemy uh, that defeated me. Essentially meaning that because she defeated the person that defeated uh, Din in a, by catching him in a trap, not in like any kind of uh, ritualistic or single combat, just like catching him in a trap. Um, she now uh, is the rightful owner of the, of the dark saber and bo accepts this, and all the Mandalorians there accept it. So, Discuss. Uh, okay, so, yeah. um, man. I, I have a question. So, um, yes, yeah. if, if I bump... So, so, so if Din is just walking down the street, he's got his darksaber in his hand, and I'm, I'm in a hurry. Um, I'm just running to, to, to my job. I'm, I'm, I'm late to work. Um, and on my way running to, to, to where I, I need to be, I I crash into into Dim. Okay, I don't just like lightly bump into him. I'm like, I mean, we're on the ground now. But as a result of this, uh, the light the dark saber falls out of his hands. Am I now the owner of the dark saber? Is that how this works? Maybe. Here's the thing. So let's lay this out. Originally, going all the way back to Clone Wars days, uh, Darth Maul challenged Pre Vizsla for the dark saber. It was a official ritualistic combat that they both agreed to and they entered into. Uh, and then Darth Maul wins and becomes the ruler of Mandalore. Um, so by those parameters, you would imagine both parties have to be aware that a fight is happening and they it has to be like an actual ritualistic challenge. It can't just be two people fighting to, in an attempt to defeat each other. But then in the Mando season two finale, uh, there was no understanding of like a, uh, this is a ritual combat. Like, it's just Din versus Gideon, and he beats Gideon, and now he's the owner of it. So now, apparently, as long as it's two people, both aware that they're in a combat situation, fighting 1v1, that is how this, this Dark Saber rule works. But now, now, apparently, all it takes is just being defeated in the very vaguest sense of the term. Uh, yeah. Being caught in a trap when you didn't even realize that there was like a like a combat situation about to happen that means you've now lost and whoever beat you is the ruler of mandalore so does this mean that moff gideon when he had the dark saber i'm so sorry jolly in the uh, in the first season we know that he's in possession of the dark saber in the first season so is he was he the the the, the ruler of mandalore was he supposed to be no, the ruler because, of no uh, because bo surrendered it to him he didn't win it in a fight uh, um which Although, by the way, which, at the end of the first season, Din actually technically defeats him by taking down his ship. So, uh. yeah, I, this is this, okay. So, I, I want to lay out what the rule originally was and the strictest possible interpretation of it, and then like how it got loosened over time, right? Because she's done a great job of like explaining the chronology, but I want to just like be legalistically as as puritanical as I can be here, right? So the original the original rule was like you had to to, to win the dark saber, which at that time was not connected to ruling Mandalore. It was just a thing that Vizsla had. Yeah, but to 
to win the dark saber which then got mashed together with the whole idea of ruling mandalore um you had to challenge the person who was wielding it to single combat and they had to agree to the duel and then you would have a fight and you would then have to kill them that was the original rule so you had to you had to take it in combat and you had to kill your opponent and it had to be a, a, a ritualistic and agreed upon duel then the the rule got broadened to being like oh it's not just a, a kind of formalized duel it's any setting where both people are aware that they are uh, in, a, in a combat situation and where it's a one-on-one -on -one fight without help right so like yeah. a war that it got expanded to that which like okay makes sense you can conquer someone in a war and beat them in a fight on a battlefield and take the sword and that's viable which kind of makes sense and then it got widened even further to uh you just have to uh beat them in any technical set like in any technical sense of the word beat like you don't have to challenge them to a fight they don't have to be aware of it all you have to do is like at physically attack them and overwhelm them mm -hmm. um so at this point even if we're being really strict the rule now is the challenger has to be aware but the challenged person does not mm -hmm. um, and it does still have to be 1v1 that still hasn't technically does, yeah. As a technically rule. it still has to be 1v1 because nothing's changed that yet but even mm -hmm. that loosening of the rule now creates a huge pro set of problems for who actually should be the ruler of mandalore so based on how the saber has been moving around so chief do you want to do yours or should i do mine first uh let's do mine first uh just let me lay this out <laughs> so what we decided to do was like take this to, to its logical end right if all it takes is like to like a person has to be defeated uh by another person in, in like 1v1 in some capacity even if they aren't fully aware um of like what the parameters of this fight are and what it means then let's let's actually track this from the very beginning Obi-Wan technically uh, beat Pre Vizsla in their first ever fight when we first ever see the Darksaber because Pre Vizsla had to retreat behind his forces in order to beat Obi-Wan, and that's seen as a as a fail. That's yeah, a, you that's can see that. On Obi -Wan's part. So by the season two arc where we actually are introduced to the Darksaber, Obi-Wan is now the ruler of Mandalore. He is never defeated in combat in any sense of the term until he fights Cad Bane on Teth. Um, technically, it is a 2v1, but there is a part where they're fighting uh, mano e mano, uh, and Quinlan Voss isn't part of that. So then, then Bane defeats him, which makes Bane the rightful ruler, until the very end of the arc where Obi-Wan goes undercover as a bounty hunter and is working with Bane, because then Obi-Wan gets it back from him by beating him in combat. So now it's back with Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan is next defeated by Grievous uh, in the Youngling arc when Grievous overtakes their ship. Um, so Grievous is now the ruler of Mandalore until he's defeated by Hondo Onaka when Hondo is him with the Slave One. It makes Hondo the uh, the ruler of Mandalore by the end of the Clone Wars. We don't see him next again until uh, Rebel. He meets with Ezra. Um, and Jolly and I had a bit of debate about this, about whether or not uh, this, make, this actually constitutes the defeat. Because then as Morrigan kicks like a cart toward Ezra, and then Hondo pushes Ezra out of the way and gets hit by the cart instead, effectively being knocked out of the fight and almost knocked into space had Ezra not saved him. But since, but since as Morgan was actually challenging Ezra and not Hondo, we're saying that that doesn't count. So it's still with Hondo. And from there, I stopped keeping track. I stopped. Yeah, track because it just gets nuts. Because the whole I, I, point of this exercise is to show the absurd, con like it's it's convoluted as hell is what is what we're getting at. Yeah, and, and the point is that no one currently in the Mandalorian show should therefore be the ruler of Mandalore because the real ruler is out there somewhere mysteriously. Yeah, it's like either like, Hondo we, or someone who defeated Hondo at some. Didn't point. we even make the joke that like technically, actually, the next time Obi Wan was defeated was um, uh, by the clone trooper who attacked him during Order sixty six with a giant cannon? So that <laughs> random clone trooper is actually the real ruler of Mandalore. <laughs> Um, yeah, there were a few different parts uh, between them that would take it. Yeah, away from Obi -Wan. Here's, so, here's my version where I went even looser. Where I was like, okay, so let's just say Maul has it for the sake of starting off where I'm at, right? Like Maul has it in Clone Wars. Um, he's beaten by Palpatine, so Palpatine is now the ruler of Mandalore. And mm. Palpatine isn't then defeated until he's thrown down a well by Vader. So <laughs> Vader is now the ruler. So Vader is now the ruler of Mandalore. At which point Vader is dying because uh, the lightning from Sheev has, has you know melted his his life support system so either it goes straight back to palpatine and he's like there on exegol and just has it until he's defeated by ray at which point right. it goes to no one because ray actually helps him as a group effort was the all the jedi yeah or we're going to say that technically whilst palpatine destroyed the suit what actually killed um anakin was the wounds obi-wan gave him on mustafar 
So it reverts back <laughs> to like Revenge of the Sith era Obi Wan, who was then defeated in the Kenobi show by Vader. So it goes back to Vader, then it goes back to Obi Wan because Obi Wan <laughs> beats Vader again, mm -hmm. and then Vader beats Obi Wan again in A New Hope. So A New Hope Vader has to save her, and then Vader is beaten by Luke in their duel. Which means that Vader technically lost the saber before he ever won it, yeah. <laughs> and then Luke is the owner of the saber. And then either it goes to or actually, there's two parts there. So if it's Luke, it goes then to like to to Kylo, to Rey, to Snoke, to Kylo, to Rey. Or if you want to be even funnier, like technically Vader wasn't the first person to defeat um, Kenobi era Kenobi. Owen was with his sick burn. So Owen was the ruler of Mandalore. <laughs> For a brief minute until then, Reaver defeated him, and then Reaver is the ruler of Mantle. And then wait, wait, and then technically she was defeated in a technical sense by the prone, unconscious body of young Luke, questioning her resolve. Which but means Luke is once again <laughs> goes, goes back to Luke. But then, but then Luke is defeated uh, by uh Dr. Evazon, right? Is that what we're saying next? I don't know. He's defeated by the well, falling rock of his temple. He's, he's, fuck it. I mean he gets his hand cut off by Vader too. Yeah, yeah, I'm best. It's just like it's, it's all so broken. Well, the I point think, is that this is fucking absurd. It's this going is, to yeah, this can't be how they, it works. They've completely I mean, broken the the parameters of the dark saber. I mean, if we're if we're going with the palp like like it goes to Palpatine thing, uh, because he technically didn't die in Return of the Jedi. It's like, well, then it goes to Rey. But no, but I, she defeated him in a in a group effort with all the Jedi. Yeah, so well, with all the Jedi. Jedi. Yes, yes, I I I agree that that's, that that's how it should work. But this is Disney. And she's of course going to become the ruler of Mandalore because she gets well. Everything. The dark saber is is gone now, so she can't be. Yes. <laughs> um, we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, like the, the the whole point of this exercise was just like we don't seriously believe this, right? We're just pointing out that yeah, like once you've widened the parameters of what constitutes winning the dark saber to this level, the show becomes ridiculous. And here's mm -hmm. the thing: because I saw Joe pointing this out, right? Is Joe's argument is like, oh, everyone's aware this is not actually how you win it. They're, they're fudging it because they just want Bo back in charge. No, 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 no. And I'm no, like, no. that can't work because they've already abandoned her over this, right? So they clearly do believe it enough that they can't, they're not going to accept it on a technicality. Do you guys remember in the fucking Book of Boba Fett, they, and I hate that I'm referencing Book of Boba Fett, they established <laughs> that uh, because, because in Rebels it was given to her, she didn't actually win it. And then she lost to the Empire, and and the Purge of Mandalore happened under her her rule. She was seen as cursed because she didn't uh, earn the dark saber correctly. So like nobody's gonna follow her if 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 she wins it on a technicality. They're only gonna yeah. follow her if they believe that she actually earned it. Especially given that this is the group that abandoned her because she didn't have it. Yeah, which makes no sense for this group. But screw it. Yeah. Oh well. Um. Yeah, so this is just all broken as fuck and bullshit, and this episode has ended in, in a screaming pit of misery and snakes and spiders and other whole awful things. I, I, uh, <laughs> this show feels like it was written by Pennywise the Dancing Clown to taunt me. Oh, so Joe's saying that actually it was like, what he's saying is Din fudged it so that uh, it sounded like an, he was actually defeated. Like, like oh, okay, so let, let me push back on this one then. At so that first point, of all, he's just lying, which is something that yes. Dan has been characterized to be extremely honest to the point of his own detriment. Yeah, so Din is not the kind of person who would lie about a, a matter of honor. Like, you can't have this both ways, Joe, because earlier you're like, oh, Din would, would throw the fight and that, you know, sorry, wouldn't throw the fight, but, and, but he would be dishonored if he did the fight, and Bo doesn't want to dishonor him. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, but she's happy for him, and he's happy to dishonor himself by lying about this? That's point yeah. one. But point two is like, okay, so Bo is happy for that to be the case? Because like, here's the thing. The show has presented Bo as being now committed to this religious conversion experience. So she now buys fully the, the religious spooky mumbo jumbo that she previously dismissed as nonsense. So she wouldn't be happy if that was the case, right? She would be like, no, I need to win it properly or it doesn't count. Yeah. The whole point here is just it's stupid. It's fucking retard. Uh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> the whole it point is, is belch. That is the point. It is, it is moronic. It, you, you, we have we have widened the parameters of how to win the dark saber to the point of absurdity, and that's how this episode ends with Bo-Katan getting the dark saber, and woo, we're gonna go retake Mandalore from whom? Yeah. And again, can I just point out that I, I, I'm again like I always do. I want to know what the writers were trying to do. Right. That's my my first thing I want to know about. So like. Because here's the thing, Din is now, the, the ending of season two has now been completely undone, right? Everything that happened of consequence has been reversed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Din is now Din winning the dark saber meant nothing other than that Din was very briefly a receptacle to hold it. Yep. Um, he was basically just a piggy bank to store it while Bo got her shit together, which she only didn't have as of this season. Like she could have just challenged him at the end of season two. So that was pointless. Sure enough, yeah. Yeah. And so my question is like, what was the writing point? What is the writer? Tr- what are the writers trying to achieve by by taking this creative decision? Right. Of 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 we gave Din the dark saber. And rather than explore any of the creative possibilities that could offer us in terms of storytelling or character development, we just had him essentially like be a, a storage bank for it until we could be bothered to resurrect Bo's character arc. <laughs> character arc. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, that's basically what's happened, right? And so I'm just sitting there being like, why do I care that Bo has this back? Why do I care that Din ever had it? What, what yeah, is the there point was nothing of any of this? So, like, they they set up in Book of Boba Fett and continued in this show that he was struggling to hold the Darksaber, that it's really heavy because he was resisting and he was fighting against it. So, like, you know, naturally you'd assume, okay, so they're going to give him, like, an arc with that. Like, he's going to learn to accept the Darksaber that, and that it's his and, like, what it means for him and what it means for Mandalore. And he's going to go with it and he's going to use it. Like, you know, we're going to build a character off of these things we're establishing. But no, that ultimately amounted to nothing. Yeah, or even go the other way, right? Like him, him slowly coming to realize that the weight of the saber was meant that it was never his to hold, and agreeing to a duel with Bo that was like actually like a proper fight, so that she could win it back because he knew he'd lose, but he was okay with that. Yeah, either way, you could go either direction, and I'd be happy with that. But like, you have to do something with that. Yeah, I, 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 this is nothing. This is just this. This happened for no reason. This happened just to provide four episodes of padding. Yep, or six episodes of padding. I. Yeah. But what, yeah, what a waste! Of it. What a waste! Every single thing from the season two finale has been has been undone. Grogu's back, Gideon escaped, and uh, he no longer has a dark saber. So who cares? I guess about lasting consequences. It just goes yeah, he doesn't even have the show. So... Sorry, go ahead. I was about to say he doesn't even have his best cast here, which was in this season finale either. Um, <laughs> sorry, go, go on, South Four. It just goes to show that, uh, like they do not know what they're doing with the show. This show doesn't have a cohesive direction. Clearly, no. yeah. Um, it's the it's the sequel problem all over again. We have writers who are more interested in jangling keys to sell toys uh, or, or fulfilling personal writing goals than they are in creating uh, a story that has a theme that is communicated. So that was episode six. Um, <laughs> utter shit. We've got yeah, an I'm hour gonna, left to go yeah, through. We have an hour left. Seven, eight. So I'm going to ask you guys what do what do we want to do? Do we want to save the last two for it, its own stream and just end this here, or do we want to try to go to the five hour mark? Well, and pick up um, where we left I guess I guess what we could do, time. what we could do, if we, if we've only got an hour left, right, and we don't want to squander time, you know, trying to fit into uh, fit into an hour, something that's going to take longer than an hour to talk about. We could just invite Joe yeah. on, or we could invite the audience to like ask questions, and we could answer that for an hour and just generally chat about the state of, of the Star Wars in the in the Mandalorian landscape. Um, I think I think the only reason if, I'm if, against inviting Joe on is because that would start a debate, and I don't want to try to have like a like a little mini debate within an hour. So let's, well, let's, so let's try to limit it to audience questions. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Right. In which case, like, yeah, if you've got questions about those episodes, or you want to you, like, or about our opinions on Star Wars, or just general comments you'd like to put in the chat. Do it now, and we'll 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 address them as we as we see them. Okay, yeah, we'll go to the five hour mark, and then or you know until we decide to go ahead and just wrap it up because yeah. we're not going to. Oh, I guess it's also a good time to make a in, a in a different stream. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe next week or something. Um, I guess the only other thing, uh, other than what we do while we wait for questions, is I guess we can make an announcement, right? Sheet, which is like we are at some point planning to do a stream on the menu. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna rewatch it because I've only seen it the once. Um, I'm going to take notes, and we are going to break down an actual good piece of media. That'll be neat. Oh, I love that movie so much. Like, mm. <laughs> everyone in chat, just do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do us a favor, and watch the menu. It's it's yes. really, really good. It's really fantastically made. Um, and at the risk of pissing off Southpaw, it's the film that Glass Onion was trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, don't worry, man. I'm just ripping you. <laughs> like, it's 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 a wonderful it's a wonderful film. <sighs> General rating for season three of Mando, guys, out of ten. No, oh, no in depth explanation. Let's see. Uh, I want to say one point five. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm gonna say yeah, one point five or one point five or one point six. That's probably that, where I would put it. 
I would put Book of Boba Fett at around a 1.8, and I actually think that this season is worse than Book of Boba Fett. Yeah, so I like, think it's I think it is worse. Highly. And then but and then Kenobi's a one, so yeah, Kenobi's abysmal. Mm. The only but saving grace like... of the season is in the Pershing episode. Yeah. It's not like a yeah. great episode. And it's not nearly enough to save anything, and it's also got its own plethora of issues. So I mean Yeah. Uh, are you worried about Andor's story going from five seasons to two? Uh, it be five seasons? I don't know. Um, if if so, I, I mean, I have my worries about Andor season two in general because I think the the danger I foresee right is that like Andor season one essentially did as well as it did by flying under the radar of the execs at Disney. Right, it had minimal, if any, interference because no one was really paying attention to it. So the people who actually cared could be left alone in an environment to do the things that they thought mattered to make the show better. Mm. That's not the case anymore because firstly, they tried to dismiss it and like play down its success. But then Andor got this huge amount of critical success, even if it didn't get a huge you know, audience. It's now the only piece of media they have that has any kind of critical acclaim. And so they are now going to be using this as the stick with which to beat everyone else into taking every, everything else they want to sell. So my worry is that the executives are going to be interfering like crazy on season two. Another thing I'm sad about with um, Mando, uh, sorry, wow, and or season two um, is that I feel like they're going to have to be very uh, limited to w- with what they can do with Mon Mothma just because uh, Rebels already happened. So we know that at a certain point, uh, a few years before the OT, she um, she leaves the Senate and goes into hiding uh, with the Rebellion. And then we're... You know, which you could still do interesting things with her there. I just would, I, I like the uh, the scenes where she's on Coruscant, sort of in shark infested waters, um, trying to get by. And we're going to have to limit how many episodes we can do that timeline wise if we're trying to fit with Rebels. Uh, and I know that this show cares enough to try to fit with Rebels because they literally reference the Gorman conflict, which is yeah. the thing that Mothma references in her Rebels debut episode. And it's really cool. Yeah, when they, you know, um, it's most nice when they care about continuity. <laughs> yeah, it's neat. Uh, are you guys hopeful for Ahsoka? No. Not even a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm, I'm, dread, I'm dreading it. I wouldn't have any hope for any Mandoverse shows. Yeah, no. no it's, uh, no, Andor is the only Star Wars show upcoming that I have any investment in. And yeah, I recommend I, I, do the same. Don't, don't, don't put your eggs in any of the Mandoverse baskets. Yeah, just watch Andor. Um, the thing I will say as well, like the thing that I'm particularly worried about with Ahsoka is, um, uh, I mean, I, don't, I think her character should have died long ago anyway, but like I'm just bracing myself for the damage they're going to do to her character. Yeah. And, to, and to Sabine's character. Actually, this is something that we can reference in terms of Mando, right? Because Mando introduced the Mandalorian purge. And in our next stream, when I have a bit more time to talk about this, I'm going to talk about how that was a bloody awful world-building decision given how they've chosen to pay that off. But the, the consequences it has for other characters in other shows is going to be monumental. It's like the damage that's going to be done to Sabine Wren in explaining where the hell she was while her entire culture and family were murdered is going to be monumental. I just, I just, what are they going to do? How, you do, forget, how do you explain that? Don't forget Thrawn. Well, the big thing is like Thrawn was missing in action. So like oh, you, can bullshit, you can bullshit an explanation for him. But like with, with Sabine, it's like she was on Lethal when the purge happened why yeah. the hell didn't she help yeah that's gonna need some explanation maybe they'll give us one i mean we don't know <laughs> oh she you sweet son of child Shut up. <laughs> um i've changed i've changed the title uh to an episode five to six discussion with jolly chap and southpaw um, oh, woo. Woo. Yeah. uh I, so i guess it may, it may I don't even think I'm going to bother changing the thumbnail. I'm just going to use the same thumbnail for the next one with a with a big old part two slapped on it. Yeah. Do you think uh, Skeleton Crew could be a decent show? It could be. Yeah. Anything's thing, possible. Any of them, any of them could be. But man, it's working against some pretty heavy odds. I'll be honest. I think if you completely divorced it from, and I know they won't, but if you completely divorced it from the Mandoverse, then it has a lot better potential. But um, unfortunately, they're not going to do that. So, you know. Uh, no, Agent Lama. Sabine was not helping Ahsoka look for Ezra at the time of the purge. The, the continuity on this is quite That's clear. Like literally, yeah. The point, yeah. 
She um, was uh, she was hanging around on Lethal while that was happening because the purge happened before the Empire fell. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, the, Ahsoka didn't come to Sabine to start the search for uh, Ezra until after the Empire fell. It's made explicitly clear when we see in the epilogue that the uh, New Republic ships are flying overhead. What do you uh, uh, yeah. What do you think about the acolyte? Uh, I'm not really excited for it. <laughs> I I'm worried. Well, first of all, like I just don't care about the story they're going to be planning to set up. And the second thing is like I like Daphne Keene as an actress a lot, but I think she's going to be squandered in this. And then the third thing is I can't remember which actor it was. Not Daphne Keene. But one of them was talking about the acolyte and be like, oh, see, it's a it's a great it's a great way to show that like there is no good or evil in the Star Wars universe. It's just it's just everyone is like it's shades of grey. And I'm like, really? No yeah. evil in the Star Wars no universe. I think Darth Sidious I'm like <laughs> Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. there's, a, there's a certain character who is along this lineage of, of uh, Sith Lords that we're gonna be following who is a Yeah, who is bit, totally evil. Bit of a scallywag, you might say. <laughs> a bit of a misbehaving little ruffian, yeah. Hmm. wasn't spanked enough as a child. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it happens every, every once in a while. Hmm, let's see. They got Any the main hope? guy in Squid Game for the Acolyte. Yeah, I know. I, I'm glad he's getting work. I like Squid Game. Um, well, it's got its problems, but I do like Squid Game. So I'm glad he's getting work in, in, in higher paying media. I'm looking forward to seeing Jude Law in Skeleton Crew. That's the only thing I'm excited for. Yeah, I, honestly, Jude... Jude Law is a great actor, and like, I in a better Star Wars project, I'd be really excited to see him. It's it's kind of like you know with them um, Fantastic Beasts, where like he's young Dumbledore, and I'm like yeah. in a better film he could be fantastic, and he still is yeah, pretty good. But it's like I wish he was wasted. playing Dumbledore in a good Harry Potter prequel. Yeah, I wish they gave Mads Mikkelsen something to do. <laughs> Jesus, uh, you guys think they're testing the waters for a live action Clone Wars show or movie? Battle Droids and no. Season One Mando, Order Sixty Six, Boba Fett, no. They're going no. to keep milking Order 66 to death. Uh, they're going to be showing every single fucking nook and cranny of that temple. Do you remember, uh, Shiva, we're like, when we were talking about like if we had control of this, of this franchise and what we would be doing? I was like, unironically, doing uh, a Clone Wars style show, a show in the style of Band of Brothers. Yeah. We have like Steven Spielberg directing and like actually have it like being gritty, a gritty war drama from the perspective of the clone troopers. That could be really interesting. I feel I feel like honestly, if we're going to be expanding this universe, that's almost essential. We need to see that. Yeah, I, I need more of the clones and their perspective on things. I'm really sick of um, them being yada yarded in the live action media and uh, only given lip service in uh, Bad Batch. Oh God! I just saw a video of someone reviewing Mando season three and saying it's better than Andor. Who? I want names. Yeah, who is this person? God Let damn! Let me know so I can I can laugh at them. I can't wait to do my Mando video. I'm gonna get to. I'm get, going to get to work on that like as soon as I can. Uh, the two worms will be paying this man a visit. Hmm. Let's see. How do you feel about the cult of personality that surrounds Dave Filoni? His fans seem to be incapable of holding him to any kind of standard, and get very upset when people point out his many flaws. I hate Filoni stands. There's genuinely some of the worst <laughs> Star Wars fans out there. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, I, I don't think that you understand just how much the concept of a sacred cow is hated among this trio. <laughs> so, his, well, with caveats, right? Because like, it's fine to have a sacred cow as long as you're like intellectually capable of admitting that it's emotional attachment only, right? Like that, mm -hmm. as long as there's a self awareness of that, I'm largely all right. Mm -hmm. The thing with Dave Filoni and others of his ilk, I mean, actually, I'm going to make this a broader statement. I don't like cults of personality surrounding anyone that has any kind of power, whether that's um, politicians or artists or anything in between. Because the second you have a cult of personality building up, you essentially surround that person with a bubble of sycophants who uh, reinforce all their worst impulses and never call them out on their worst. It um, gives them a lot of power to be just really awful in general. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it reinforces bad behaviors and it, and it stops rewarding positive ones, right? Like, without trying to get too political, J.K. Rowling is a wonderful example of this. Of like, She started off as a woman who... Uh, had a pretty awful background in terms of like being misogynistically abused in a domestic partnership by her by her awful husband clearly mm. had unresolved trauma around male behavior quite rightly but when she became a billionaire that general concern she had for the treatment of women and a general suspicion of men that she hadn't resolved through proper therapy then just became this bubble of people whispering poison in her ear and never seeing the real world and never interacting with real people and the result is she's become this extremely mm -hmm. like 
concentratedly toxic person who like at this point it's it's, it's well this is actually this is exactly what we criticize the show for not calling out in the in the children of the watch right it's this cult like bubble of reality you build around people to to, to manipulate them into doing whatever you want yep. and it's horrible and i don't like it i don't like seeing it in fandoms i don't like seeing it around artists i don't like seeing it anywhere yeah i agree uh, so, and I especially don't like seeing it with critics, as South Fork can, can attest. It's not good when it happens around critics. It's, when you have it is, legions of their fans just telling you that they can do no wrong. It's it's not good when uh, your bread and butter is uh, accuracy and intellectual honesty and having the correct references. And then you can just, uh, I mean, borderline lie. Uh, about what happens in a movie or a TV show. And when someone tries to stand up and say, that's not right, uh, their fans, and you say it in a civil way, they have fans who uh, engage in intense character assassination, um, make fun of you for suicidal ideation, if you struggle with depression, and this sort of thing uh, absolutely makes it worse. Um, yeah, uh, it's... It's it's quite awful to see anywhere. It's really bad to see in critics, especially those who spend a good portion of the or the early part of their career railing against the sort of thing. And then, well, it's it's that it's that staying in the dark night or to destroy. It's that thing in the dark night of you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yeah, the, the intellectual honesty requires a, a almost continuous level of uh, self policing of your own behaviors like self-examination self-critique and something i i constantly try and encourage in myself uh, and others because i'm very prone to being smug about my opinion because i'm an academic um there's a wonderful <laughs> line actually and because i'm always right so <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i can do no wrong there's a wonderful line in the old most people obviously won't have seen this particularly the american audiences but like in the old old 1960s 70s doctor who tom baker's doctor has a great line where he's like um never be certain of anything it's a sign of a huge intellectual weakness um and like to be clear, that's not never be confident in your opinion. You can be very confident in your opinion, but never be certain. Be certain. Yeah, because when be you're certain, certain means that you can't have your mind changed, even yeah. when new evidence is presented that conflicts with your view. Well, that, and that's yeah, that's that's, that, that's a problem. I mean, it it it, it for those who uh, are going to like are, are interested in the video I'm, I'm cooking, that is a very prevalent thing in kind of like the start of all of this. Um, it's someone who has just like landed on a conclusion about what he's watching and is so certain in it. He's just refusing to internalize anything that goes against his, his, uh, his, his initial conclusion. Well, it's, it's, it's a literal definition of mental illness in neuroscience, right? That like, if you have a neural network that is impervious to stimulus, like it can't, it cannot be reformed because it's, it's become so circular and it's in its feedbacking that it's just impervious to any new impulse and, and you cannot reform those neurons in new directions. That is literally what a mental illness, well, what a lot of mental illnesses are, is an inability to change your mind, basically, on a physical level, um, because you've just constantly re reaffirmed yourself or have a chemical imbalance that's reaffirmed a neural pathway into just being essentially circular. TK, I will block you. <laughs> <laughs> those two I, worms I, will knock on your door. I, <laughs> yeah, um... Oh, what, what, what was I going? Oh, um, I have a thing in my script where I just say, like, when it comes to uh, uh, criticism, um, like, I might I might not use um, uh, objectivity in the same way that um, Jolly does. But conceptually speaking, Jolly and I are on the same page about what it means to at least try to be impartial um, and fair and, and uh, for lack of a better word, objective. Um, but the thing is that objective as a word and this is why I, I try to stray away from it is because i think that it becomes a crutch for people who they go ah i am criticizing objectively and then that that becomes a crutch for them to um not entertain the possibility that they might be incorrect um they believe that because they're they're criticizing something objectively that means that they are correct as they're uh doing this when it's like uh, if you convince yourself that you are being objective and that you are you <laughs> you are um, not at risk of being biased, if your criticisms are not coming from a position that is heavily biased, that is actually the uh, best way to like to put yourself at risk of of um, 
of, of becoming biased, basically. Um, the easiest way to become a biased person and to make unfair criticisms because of those biases is to convince yourself that you are incapable of, of falling short there. Yeah, I mean, speaking of someone who will defend objectivity, uh, both philosophically and in criticism, I, the amount of people I see who use the word objectively in a completely bonkers way that there's no reality to what it's actually, you know, what it actually should be defined as. And then you go like, oh, well, when I say that this is objective, I mean that it's a fact and you can't argue against it. It's like, no, no, that's not, no, please don't do that. Well, you give objective a bad name when you do that. And then like, you can also tell, um, like based on how these people react when they're being criticized, it's like, so if, uh, if your if your bread and butter is criticizing other people, um, and you do it in kind of a mean spirited way, uh, in a, in a patronizing way, but then as soon as your ass is on the chopping block, you've said something that, that is now being, uh, placed under a microscope. Um, as soon as you start lashing out, that's kind of an indication to me that you're not really in this for criticism. You're in this to, to heckle people basically. Um, and that's why you're not liking it when it's you who's on the chopping block is it's because you're kind of aware that this isn't about actual, like intellectually honest criticism. This is just a means to belittle people and you don't like the feeling of being belittled yourself. Yeah. Uh, the way I think I phrased it to you, South Paul, and without naming names, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, I rail against Disney because they've essentially McDonaldized media, right? They've just mass, <laughs> they've turned it into this mass marketed product. And there are certain critics who I, I rail against for the same reason. That what they've essentially done is they've McDonaldized critic art criticism. Mm -hmm. And they've turned it away from being a conversation that's aimed at uh, refining the craft of the arts or aimed at like reporting an honest feedback of an audience's perception to an mm -hmm. artist who might not be aware of it. It's gone away from that and it's just become this excuse to heckle people professionally um, to turn criticism into a, a, a blood sport, a spectator blood sport, where it's no longer about a conversation. It's just about scoring points to, to make everyone like feel smug and intellectually like self-gratified in their own opinion. This is why it's like, so going over the, uh, the, the, the criticisms of Terry's that they decided to, to go into, right? Where it's like all of these criticisms, and I mean all of them, are rooted in like absurd inaccuracies. Inaccuracies in terms of like how things work in the real world, but also like they're having to omit context or distort context in order to have it line up with what they're saying. And so um, what's what's interesting to me here is that's always been my contention with their criticisms. That's what I say in my thread where I'm like, I just, I think that their criticisms are wrong here. Um, but the narrative has been that I just, I couldn't take that they were criticizing the show period in that, um, well, they, they will cite the decision to stop watching the show with them. Right. But it's like, if you look at what's actually in the messages there, there's a discussion being had, um, where we're exploring perspectives, but what's happening when I'm I'm giving Mahler mine as he's being a pig headed prick. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, be totally blunt there. Um, and it's quite clear that he's not going to have a conversation uh, in good faith uh, or uh, even if might, open minded. Sorry, 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 if I might cut in. Um, yeah. I just want to avoid the stream being turned into uh, a <laughs> yeah. rant about Eve yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple or about Mahler yeah, or about. Because uh, I know you can go on until the sacred cows come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no. there, there is a time and a place, but I don't think it is this stream. I think right. um, and well, I'm so, actually the, probably going to end it soon because we don't because I, I want to go eat something. But um, well, it's, it's the matter of, of like, it, it's the matter <gasps> of like all criticism is being treated like it, like it's the same um, as opposed to like was the criticism accurate in the first place? Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I just want to see references from people. Um, yeah. I saw, uh, sorry, I was just seeing the questions directed to me, right? Are you mad or sad that Rogue Squadron never got off the ground, Jolly? I'll be honest, I, I know very little about Rogue Squadron. I know, was, was that Deborah Chow's one? That was uh, that Patty, Jenkins. Patty Jenkins, yeah. So, you know. Patty Jenkins? Oh, hand. no, I'm, thr yeah. I'm thrilled it never got off the ground then. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I, here's the thing I love the Rogue Squadron book series from the EU, came out in the 90s. Um, great characters, great world building, great plot. Um, Patty Jenkins would have fucking butchered it 
if it, if it even remotely resembled those books, which it probably wouldn't have, she would have butchered it. I'm so glad that that movie like died on impact. I mean, I just have no faith in Patty Jenkins' ability to write anything yeah. after Wonder Woman eighty four. Yeah, uh, particularly because exactly. like, did you see her 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 backlash? Like when people when she got credit, sorry, when they cancelled Wonder Woman three. Uh-huh. And she like had this weird, strange rant where she's like, "Oh, they wouldn't know good writing if it hit them in the face." And I'm totally right. And I'm like, "You oh, wrote wow. Wonder Woman '84." <laughs> yeah, yeah your opinion is now invalid. <laughs> please, please stop. Um, probably has anyone seen the Has anyone seen the X Files show? If yes, do you like it? Uh, I have seen the X Files. I like. Okay, so uh, in the same way that like I like the early seasons of Buffy, right? Of like I enjoy the X Files. I think a lot of the early seasons are quite fun to watch. It's not well written um, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination, nor do I think it's particularly trying to be. It it was very much a cultural artifact of its moment. I greatly enjoy it. There are some really good episodes, and I really like Mulder and Scully as characters and the dynamic they have. Yeah. Uh, as the show goes on and they run out of ideas, it becomes increasingly painful to watch. But certainly at the beginning, they had a gold dust, and it was good stuff. I watched part of uh, X-Files a long time ago, maybe a couple seasons. I remember very little about it, but I do remember liking it. So I've only watched you know. a few episodes. I, I think I like. I started watching it. Um, I only got like a few episodes into it. Funny enough, Donald Logue has a brief scene in one of the first few episodes. He does? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the only other episode that I re- that I distinctly remember from it, though, is one that was written by Vince Gilligan that guest starred Brian Cranston because that was where he kind of like where they met and he wanted to, you know, where Vince Gilligan got the idea to um, to get him for Breaking Bad. Um, do you remember a, a, an X Files episode with uh, Brian Cranston? Uh, I. I don't off the top of my head. I'm sure he's in. It's a bit like Pedro Pascal is in Buffy at one point. I'm like, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? Yeah, Amy Adams is in it as well. There's like a bunch of actors. Like, it, I love it when you do that, right? Like, Doctor Who is notorious for this, right? Particularly for British mm-hmm. actors. Mm-hmm. You go back and you like watch old episodes or like episodes from like 2005. You're like, is that Andrew Garfield? Is that like, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is, that Ian Mc, is that Ian McKellen? Like, what the fuck are you doing here? Is like, that Car- Richard like, Rodgers in this? Is that Cameron Monaghan? <laughs> Stuff. Oh have god, yeah. Leverage? I have not seen Leverage. I have never seen that. I don't know what that is. No, not neither have I. Uh, Diego Lopez. Yes, we stopped talking about Mando, not because we don't love Mando, but just because like there isn't enough time left in the stream to to address yeah, the next we, episode. We have to cut it um, in no more than half an hour. I'm trying to kind of wrap it up early though because I'm really hungry. Um, so we're gonna just have to save the last two episodes of the season for next week i guess next, yeah next week um what are your thoughts on the new trilogy sheev uh new trilogy what are the, we talking you know about? the trilogy films the james mangold one the new ray movie and the um, other one was is that a From, trilogy though it's not really I, a trilogy it is it is just three movies that are coming out around the same i guess time. it's a a trio and anthol- like an anthology of three movies uh, so i don't give a shit about the ray movie it It'll be the Ray movie, you know, it'll whatever. I'm more interested in that than I am um, about the Mando movie, whatever that's going to be. Yeah, the Mando movie is going to be that can burn in hell. Um, And the most annoyed I am about the Ray movie is just the meta of it. Like, you really fucking did that where you killed off Luke Skywalker and had him be a failure. He never rebuilt the Jedi Order, and now it's going to be Ray who did it. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. Literally, go fuck yourself. But that's already done and gone. There's nothing that can be done about it now. The most uh, intriguing thing was the Dawn of the Jedi announcement to me. I'm like, you know, cautious. I have no, I have no excitement for it. But like, it sounds interesting. You know, we can see what they do. I mean, the origins of the Jedi. That's that's intriguing. Um, although James Mangold kind of described it as more of an origin of the Force, which I'm not sure I'm happy with. I hope they're not actually. Yeah. Uh, that was the alarm bell the road for me. Before. I was like, I don't, I don't like that. That's that sounds dumb. But we'll I'm not looking forward to any of these three movies. I think they're all going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> is there a uh, is there any piece of media, whether it's a TV, a book, a movie, or a video game that any of you are looking forward to? Yes. <laughs> oh, you wanted an answer. Oh, okay. Oh, just anything um, at all. Okay. Well, hey, where is that question? Star rule. Uh, star rule. I'm not seeing it. Is it way up there? No. Nine thirty. Or four thirty. 
Really? Oh, weird. I yeah, see it. Okay. I, I definitely see it. Yeah. Um, oh, here it is. Well, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've got one. I mean, does anyone else want to address this first? I mean, I, there's a few things I'm looking forward to. Um, Arcane Season 2, House of the Dragon oh, Season yeah. 2, Severance yep. Season 2. Um, I still need to watch Season 1. You haven't seen Severance? No, I need to get around to it. I know. See Severance. It's good. It's really I'm fucking good. To. I'll put it on the Puss and Boots list as well. Like. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to. Um, um, my one's a bit oh, tough after you. Uh, Across the Spider-Verse, uh, Mission Impossible 7. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, both of those, yeah. basically. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, Arcane Season 2 is a really good answer. Yeah. Um, I've, I've got one that neither of you have mentioned. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to uh, Hellblade 2, Senua Saga. Hmm. Um, for those who don't know, the very first video, it's a video game. First game was an indie game called Hellblade Senua Sacrifice. I strongly recommend you pick it up. It's it's quite cheap because it's not a full game. It's like a little a short games. It's about 15 quid on like PlayStation Network or Steam or wherever you're going to get from. Mm-hmm. And it won the actress who is doing live action performance capture for the main role, a BAFTA, despite the fact she's never acted before ever. The entire game was built around, because originally the game was going to be like this hack and slash him in the start of God of War, but mm-hmm. uh, based around like Celtic mythology. And then the actress dropped out and they replaced her with an actress from inside their studio who was like an intern or, or like working on some other project who wasn't an actress. And they realized that this woman had uh, a severe mental illness where she like hears voices and uh, sees things. And they were like, that's really cool. And rather than like mistreat her or, or do something shitty with that, they reorganized the entire development of the game to be an exploration of mental illness through the lens of a Celtic warrior mourning the death of her, of her lover and having to travel through the Norse underworld to get to, to save his soul. And it's one of the most beautiful, hmm. one of the most heartbreaking games I've ever seen. The combat's really fun. And on top of that, it's one of the most uh, incredible and accurate depictions of, of that kind of mental illness I've ever seen, to the point where it's genuinely very hmm. unnerving to play at, at points because of how they do the voices that are talking to you. Hmm. Um, nice. But I, I, I love that game. I strongly recommend it. And I'm looking forward to the sequel very much. Um, anything else from you guys? In terms of what you're looking uh, forward to? Kenobi season two. Yes. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah. cool. I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait I mean, for Mace Windu to come back. Did I say Andor season two? Because obviously. Oh yeah, Andor uh, season two, obviously. Yeah. Of course. Uh, um, I'm I'm looking forward but to if there's nothing else. No? Go ahead. Oh no, I was about to say, like I'm looking forward to <laughs> technically it's already come out but it was re- out in cinemas again for the 25th anniversary and i've now conv- managed to convince a friend of mine who's never watched these film series to watch it so i'm gonna be re-watching the extended editions of lord of the rings with him i'm really That's looking nice. forward to that i'm looking is forward that great? to watching the menu to do our oh that film is so good we'll probably have to push that back toward a- till after the final mandalorian stream but yeah okay. that'll be the week 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 after next or something oh jesus <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the live action remake of the little mermaid <laughs> yeah <woo. laughs> uh, did you see that they added 51 extra minutes uh to that i did to, yeah what the hell is it gonna be about what the hell? well this is a bit like um i saw they're doing the live action lilo and stitch and again i don't know if this is confirmed i saw the actress they cast for nani and I was like, "Why? Well, Why have you done this?" Jolly, Jolly, you're a hypocrite. If you're upset about that, but you weren't upset about about the mermaid being black. Why would I be upset that a mermaid is black? No, 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 no. no sorry, that that. No, I'm sorry. I agree that with you. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, just, uh, I'm, just I'm, I'm raising, I'm raising the point here, right? Like when, because I did this the other day, Rich. Like literally yesterday, there was a thing about um, like Jada Pinkett Smith, that wonderful human being. She's producing uh, a series called African Queens, which is about, you know, queens who ruled in various African countries at various points. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones is Cleopatra. And they have the actress playing her as like a sub-Saharan African black woman. I saw and I was it. like, yeah, that's... And I'm really annoyed by this um, because right. it's completely ahistorical. It's historically inaccurate. And it's historically inaccurate in a way that isn't harmless, right? Because Cleopatra, her ethnicity was a huge part of her life story and the politics that surrounded her life. And it also just completely like erases the idea that she herself was a colonial overlord. She came from Greek stock. Um, she was colonizing an African. She was she was a descendant of a guy who colonized an African country. Um, so that's it's it's weird that they've gone down that route, and I find it very insulting and, and bizarre. Um, 
as for the Black Mermaid thing, I mean, my general rule is is that you can race swap any character you like, provided that the race swap is done in a way that fits, is integrated well into the world building, and doesn't contradict the main uh, themes of the character. And like, there are very few characters who their race is that intrinsic, right? There are some characters like you couldn't have a, a white ML, you know, Martin Luther King, yeah. and you couldn't have a and you couldn't have a a, a black. Uh, Winston Churchill, because you would be erasing a lot of what he did to black people if you did that. But <laughs> there are plenty. But most, but most characters uh, do not have race as an intrinsic feature. For example, James Bond could be black, and there would be nothing that would change about his character. Yep. However, he couldn't be a woman because a large part of his character has to do with the misogynist, you know, the exploration of toxic masculinity and, and uh, misogyny and stuff like that. And I think you would find it very. It wouldn't make sense for him to be a woman, and same way it wouldn't make sense for Miss Marple to be a man, right? That their gender is very much tied to who they are as characters. But like that's my rule: unless it's an intrinsic character quality, you can change it. Just make sure you integrate it well into the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, but with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this to a close uh, because I'm hungry, and we talked for a long time. Yeah, go and have a burger, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chief. A, del- a delicious cheeseburger. I will do just that. <laughs> And I will get it to go. <laughs> That's good because I've set the restaurant to explode. Oh, oh good, nice. Well, I'll, I'll hurry. Um, but thank you guys for coming on uh, to talk about this glorious masterpiece of a, of a television series with me. Yeah, uh, yeah, I my pleasure. Look forward to reconvening, uh, South by, I mean, you're welcome to join us again if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I, I'd, I'd love to do that because um, I just I found exploring all the really <laughs> like understanding just how broken this is it like like there was obviously said i was i was noticing but like being able to sort of like bounce the stuff off you guys was also just very helpful so yeah it's very therapeutic yeah, no way, so. cathartic yeah. yeah all right well i guess we'll be signing off then thank you very much everyone in chat for coming to listen i hope you had a good time and we'll see you next week see you next time have a good one Bye. Woo!